everyone who is here present for this great event, the Second African Symposium on Big Data Analytics and Machine Intelligence, and the sixth TN International Thematic Workshop themed Data Science for Solution-Driven and Sustainable Response to Current Developing World Challenges. Uh, we want to introduce briefly our guests who are here, Dr. Yin Li, the chair of the Tuas Young Affiliate, uh, Professor Yin Li, the chair of the Tuas Young Affiliate Network, all the way from Beijing is here with us. And uh, the, the director of Comsat is also here with us all the way from um, Pakistan. Dr. Junaid Zaidi from the Comsat Secretariat. And uh, Dr. Ruth Lennon is also here with us, the ACM Women Chair in Europe. And all the other eminent personalities who are here. I want to take the opening address on behalf of the organizers. I welcome all speakers and participants to the second African Symposium and CSTN International Thematic Workshop. This is the second edition of Symposium on Big Data, Analytics, and Machine Intelligence in Africa. CEN had held series of thematic workshops in Argentina, Malaysia, South Africa, Nigeria, and Tunisia. The sixth one has to hold virtually because of the pandemic situation that has limited physical presence in events. The idea of this year's theme, data science for solution driven and sustainable response to current developing world challenges was inspired by the situation of COVID-19 pandemic that emerged in November 2019 and ravaged most countries of the world this year. This situation led to several scientists rising to combat the emerging pandemic with different research attempts ranging from the search for vaccines, ventilators, potent drugs, contact tracers, automatic predictors, among others. Data science has been found to play a prominent role in response to COVID from different perspectives, including modeling and forecasting the spread, predictive analytics in risk profiling, social network analysis for contact tracing, and machine learning for prediction, among others. This pandemic, along with lockdown measures, also came with other challenges that affected education, agri, and other areas, hence placing a contest on sustainable development. In response to this, this event emerged. A call came asking for submissions from people and uh, eventually it led us to an aggregated set of six teams in this symposium. They are namely data science for COVID response and impact, data science and sustainability issues, data science for health related applications, data analytics for solution oriented results, theoretical concepts of data science and other applications, and data science considering a multidisciplinary view. In this symposium, we have four keynote speakers, five plenary speakers, 11 invited, and then we have a session on SDG, making a total of 21 speakers and uh, senior speakers. We have six moderators of our workshop who are all TN members with 22 oral speakers and then 42 posters representing 30 countries of the world. The interactive workshops will address a way forward on young scientists interaction and collaboration and also advancing science for sustainability in the developing world. 
All these events support the goal of the Tuas Young Affiliate Network, TN, by gathering young scientists who will receive motivation by the talks of the established and eminent scientists. The strengths of these younger ones can be announced to address the challenges facing the developing world while increasing knowledge and building capacity. The planning came with a number of challenges as we have very few CYAN members in this research area. But immense thanks to our mother body that provided the opportunity to interact with a number of established scientists in this field who make part of the speakers at this symposium. We acknowledge the TUAS Executive Director, Professor Romain Murezi and Dr. Max Paoli, who will also be speaking in this event, for always being there for TIAN. Our appreciation goes to the following regional partners, TUAS of Saharan African Sareb, Latin America and the Caribbean, and Arab regional partners. Mr. Stanley Mafosa and Kolani Mfiza and all our speakers from all these regions. We also thank COMSAT, Commission on Science and Technology for Sustainable Development in the South from Pakistan, the Executive Director, Dr. Junaid Zaidi and Mr. Baba Sultan for their support. We appreciate the ACM Women Chair of Europe, Dr. Ruth Lek Lennon, for being an encouragement agreeing to speak and for supporting the Akaton event that will be going on concurrently with the symposium today. 13 participants registered for the Akaton event. We also appreciate the Nigerian Academy of Science, facilitated by the Executive Secretary, Mr. Odubanjo, for supporting this event, and Professor Ladipo for being here with us in spite of his tight schedule. We cannot but be grateful to all our distinguished speakers who agreed to join us as they contribute to building the developing world in spite of our challenges. Great thanks to the Vice Chancellor and Principal of University of Johannesburg, Professor Mawala, and all the other speakers. We will be mentioning you one by one by the time you start speaking. We really appreciate your um, you, the time you set apart to be, to be with us at this event, we are indeed uh, very grateful. I want to appreciate the Vice Chancellor of the Federal University of Technology, Akure, Professor Joseph Adiola Fuakwe, for his great support towards the success of this event, the Dean, and all the staff of the School of Computing. I also recognize the other tea and organizing chairs. Professor Emil Chimusa and Professor Franco Cabrerizo for their immense support. They have sacrificed the heavily for this event to be successful. I also want to thank the executive board members of the TWAS Young Affiliate Network, led by our able chair, Professor Yin Li, who is here present with us, who would also be uh, sharing some comments with us at this opening. I want to thank Professor Sokchin Chun, who will also be moderating in one of the workshop sessions. She's a, a co-chair and she has been very supportful. I want to also appreciate Professor Patricia Zankan from Brazil, who has also facilitate, facilitated the cooperation of the Brazilian Academy of Sciences and the speakers from the Latin American region. I'm grateful to Professor Yusuf, who was also very helpful for us last year, and some of the speakers facilitated by his institute, the Institute, his new Institute of Technology, are also here with us, Dr. Selma Tekil. She has been very supportful in the program committee, along with Dr. Mustafa Osuza. I'm also grateful to Professor Colette Dandara, who would also be partaking, be one of the moderators at the workshop section. My appreciation goes to Professor Jalila from Tunisia, who has also been a supportive friend in all our programs. I appreciate the program committee members for their great committed and unflinching support 
towards the success of this event. Thanks goes to uh, Professor Fred Adite, who is also a senior member from Ghana. I want to thank all the support, uh, support staff who have, also, who have also been very, very helpful. Dr. Sarumi, Dr. Gabriel, and all the others who have been very helpful for us, and Dr. Isinkaye. We appreciate the Directorate of the Computer Resource Center, FUTA, for facilitating technical support for the event. Thanks to all the participants in attendance. I hope we will see, seize the opportunity of the symposium and workshop to learn new things, initiate collaborations, and build friendships for career advancement. I therefore wish everyone an enriching scientific experience. Thank you all. Now we want to go. We want to go to the next item. We want to hear the remarks by Ati Yanchie, Professor Yin Lee. Welcome, Professor. Thank you, Bernali. I just want to let you know, you just delivered a wonderful, wonderful opening speech. Just very awesome. So congratulations. So respected uh, Dr. Zaidi, it's uh, very nice to meet you here virtually. Uh, respected uh, Dr. Lennon, thank you for your support uh, to this uh, uh, virtual workshop. It's uh, been delighted to meet you here. Pro virtually. Professor Yin Li? Yeah. Yes. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yes, I can now. Yeah, I'm speaking, yeah. So I just want to start by thanking all the organizing committee members who made great efforts for organizing this fantastic symposium at this difficult time of COVID-19. We had this symposium organized uh, uh, under the leadership of Banani last year, but this year things changed. So I'm delighted to see that under such a difficult circumstances, we are still able to organize a, a compile a group of uh, distinguished uh, speakers and uh, give speak speak uh, give speeches and exchange ideas online. So Bernali and uh, your colleague, you and your colleague did a great job. Thank you very much. I also want to mention uh, a few words on TN, the TWAS Young Affiliate Network. For those of you who are not very familiar with uh, this uh, organization. It is uh, an organization under the umbrella of uh, TOAS, who many of you are very familiar with that. Um, TOAS Young Affiliates are actually a group of outstanding young scientists from developing uh, countries covering all the uh, field of natural science and a little bit on the humanity science as well. Uh, back to 13 years ago, the TOAS Young Affiliate was selected a 25 person uh, overall, overall per, per year, I mean globally, but the little is done and nobody knows each other. So in 2016, many enthusiastic young scientists, when we were in Luanda, in Kigali, so we kicked off uh, this TN. So we try to build up a, a connection among those outstanding young scientists. At that time, we don't know each other neither. So we set up this organization, so we get uh, some funding from Lenovo, a personal computer company from China under the TWAS leadership. At that time was uh, Professor Chen Li Bai, who was the president of the Chinese Academy of Sciences, was also supported by Professor Hassan, who is now the president of TWAS and many TWAS colleagues. So we set up a strategic goal, say we try to know each other in the first year, and we try to do something in the second year, and we try to deliver something in the third year. So now the fourth year, we are now in the fourth year of uh, the TN, and we're very happy that we have uh, more than 100 to us young affiliates connected. And many of us uh, started to know each other just through this very important title, the, the TN International Semantic Workshop, where we are holding the sixth, the sixth TN workshop on artificial intelligence, uh, machine intelligence, uh, big data analytics, etc. So this uh, title, this uh, TN, International Semantic Workshop, is just great because we gather more than 30 uh, people, not only towards our affiliates, but also prominent scientists uh, along the globe 
So we know each other uh, on the science, also socially uh, to each other. So we, and we started to do some collaboration. I'm delighted to tell you the fact that over the last year, uh, about 20, more than 20, more than about 30 to us young affiliates from 20 countries distributing just everywhere in, in the world. They have just uh, published together 20, more than 20 research papers through this uh, collaboration. So the TITA is just a very excellent and even outstanding catalyst to catalyze uh, collaboration among TOAS young affiliates. So the president of TOAS, uh, Professor Muhammad Hassan, was delighted to know this progress. He said that this is just a remarkable, remarkable inter-regional and inter-country achievements made by TN. We are also very uh, delighted to, uh, to these achievements. And this is achieved by many efforts played by the TOAS Young Affiliates members and also the, the executive committee members, which uh, together with me are pushing the collaboration among the Young Affiliates. We're not only catalyzing the collaboration among Young Affiliates, we're also catalyzing uh, the interlinking and making a connection of the young affiliates with outstanding scientists uh, from different countries. So TILA has been proven to be an effective approach for catalyzing this. So although we are facing COVID-19, this uh, global challenge, we are also very happy that we could continue this dialogue online. So we also organized uh, mainly driven by Dr. Franco Cabri Rizzo, who paid uh, a great attention together with his colleagues and also Patricia Zenken and many Tuas Young Affiliates to organize a series of different uh, online symposium on the area of, for instance, groundwater, on the uh, phytochemistry, also on the mass science, and this is a big data. So and we have more uh, to, to come. So finally, I also want to comment on we, uh, as we are committed to international cooperation from different perspectives, but now we are also knowing that international cooperation are facing some challenges because we can only meet online, which uh, in some cases we feel a little bit uh, regrets because we want to meet in person, but this uh, uh, has been challenging and it will be for a while. So, uh, which means the traditional mode for international collaboration has encountered some challenges. Then what will flow? So people's flow are restricted. But data can flow, money can flow, information can flow. So with those things, we, can, we know that data science is really important to drive international collaboration uh, in the post-COVID era. So I say this is a great program designed by Polani and her colleagues. But I would add just one point, that data science is also critical, important, critically important for driving and catalyzing international cooperation in the post-COVID-19 uh, area, area. So with these words, I hope, the, uh, I, I trust that the symposium will have a great success. And I hope uh, the speakers, the uh, participants will gain a lot from, from those presentations. And let's continue our dialogue and to catalyze more cooperation. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lee, for your kind words. Uh, please, Ruth, is your... Thank your you very time. much, uh, Ebu Chie. We are very happy for that uh, inspirational um, address. Thank you. We want to listen to the remarks by the ACM Women Chair, Dr. Ruth Lennon from Ireland. Thank you, Prof. Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to the event. I think this is a fantastic opportunity. Um, I was delighted to hear the remarks of Professor Lee with regard to the success of the program, because I think that's really important. I think that we need to work together to perform networks. In COVID-19, we have all been given quite a shock and yes, it has risen that we have to look at our data a lot more. But it also gives us new opportunities to network. Perhaps we can attend events that we might not otherwise have been able, able to take time out of our busy schedules to attend. Brilliant events such as this one. 
we're giving ourselves the opportunity to network with new people, albeit not face to face, but we can still make those links at a time when things settle down, we can then go and meet in person. But for now, we can still establish those links. And events like this are so important to give the opportunities to new people, new researchers, young students coming through the network. Let's give them the chance to make these new connections. The ACMW Europe is a network of professional people in computing and engineering related technologies. In the ACMW, we focus on providing opportunities for women because we find that between 10 and 15% and rather often significantly lower than that of women get an opportunity to work in such areas. So we try to provide supports where we can. There are many events that we hold and even simple things, setting out a newsletter to give information about what events are going on. So for example, today's event was communicated throughout Europe simply by putting messages out on our Facebook pages, in our newsletter and so on. So people are becoming more aware of what's out there. What are the opportunities that arise? Let's establish a network amongst ourselves to see what happens, what jobs are out there, what other events are out there that we can point our students at. Maybe their research comes nicely in line with another student's research. Can we hook those students up together so that they can network and work together on something greater? Again, Professor Lee talked about some wonderful publications opportunities for the students. It's very hard to establish new opportunities for publications unless you can make those network connections. And the onus really is on us to try and provide the opportunities for the students. Now it's up to the students to take the opportunities when they arise, but there are still opportunities out there. Having a look at the programme for this event, we noticed that it covers a good range from everything from Lipica's sustainable agricultural practices right up to COVID. And I was delighted to see that there was actually some talks on post COVID because there will be an end to it. And we need to focus on how are we going to get to that end point and what are the positive things that we can take out of this? We can make new network connections we can use the data science. We can be more aware of what it is we're doing, but we also have to be a little bit careful about how we use that data and not allow any forms of disruption in the data or worse, corruption in the data. Whilst my talk might focus on that, which seems a rather negative thing, I would focus on instead the positivity of it. How can we share data and be safe with sharing our data? How can we use this in a good way to establish new fields of research? Because when we combine our data, when we think about what we've got, there's a lot to offer. As I say, I'm delighted to be here at this event because I think this event and many like it provide opportunities that might not have otherwise been exposed to students, to seasoned researchers and others. So let's take the opportunity, let's connect, let's listen to all the wonderful talks that are out there. So I'll finish up on that because I know we're running short on time and I don't want to spend too long on it, but well done everybody, well done to the team. Um, thank you for the, the great work of Professor Lee and everybody in Tawan, and uh, I, I look forward to the rest of the event. Thank you, Dr. Ruth Lennon. We need to be more aware and be careful of, of how we use data. Thank you very much. We go to the remarks by Executive Director of Comsat, Dr. SM Junaid Zaidi. Welcome. Thank you very much. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. And very good morning to you all in Africa and Latin America. And here, uh, good uh, afternoon to the people who are participating from Asia. Uh, I am very delighted to be here this morning and to see what uh, some people are doing in this uh, current area of uh, our technology. I would like to really appreciate the organizer for choosing this uh, topic. Uh, and I'm personally uh, grateful to Dr. Bulan Lee uh, for the executive member of Tian and also Professor Lin Ji regarding this uh, organization. And also I, I would like to thank ACM and uh, Ruth Paul uh, participating in this very event. 
I was just browsing uh, the program. It has been very nicely arranged. And I'm really in, uh, very surprised to see that how you managed to gather so many qualified and talented people. And uh, the people who would be participating in this workshop or this webinar, they will really be benefiting from the knowledge and expertise of the presenter. Uh, the keynote speak, uh, speakers are really top class and also the other presentations are very good. I would like to thank uh, Tuas, I would like to thank uh, TYAN, and I would like to thank other organizers for uh, taking this initiative. Taking the opportunity, let me just try to take this, uh, that ComSat uh, is based in Pakistan. There are 27 member countries uh, at the moment, uh, Asia, Africa, and Latin America, and we are working for sustainable development, mostly in the area of South. And uh, we are, our focus is uh, science and technology, and these new technologies which are coming up, big data and data analytics, we are working on that one. In Pakistan, where we are based, we have established a strong base of uh, data centers and also uh, the internet facilities, top class internet facilities are provided. Now, uh, with this COVID, which is coming up, uh, which has come up and which is also not leaving us at the moment, so we are providing telehealth facilities and we are also providing the education, tele-education, you can say from here. So this sort of platform has been provided by ComSet. And ComSet has got 24 centers of excellence and which are working in different areas. You will be very happy to know that we have established uh, a center, ComSet center of excellence uh, in uh, Indonesia. Uh, ITS, there is a university there. And in that we have established this center on uh, uh, artificial intelligence and robotics. Now, artificial intelligence and robotics can only be uh, made possible if we have got good system for big data or data analytics. And we are working here in Pakistan. We have established a university in Comset uh, University, and which are taking care of this data analytics. And they are establishing a different department of data analytics where the students from all the developing countries can take uh, benefit uh, in that very area. Uh, I, I would once again like to thank you and giving me this opportunity and I would like to listen uh, to, the, uh, to the speakers who are really there. And I have requested my other colleagues who are experts in this field and they would be participating with us. And I'm very happy to see in the morning 51 participants already there uh, which, which are registered on the internet. Thank you very much uh, Dr. Uh, Vlanli. It's very nice of you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor uh, Dave. We, we appreciate you, our Executive Director, for the speech. Uh, thank you for participating, for, for facilitating this event with us. We are really, really grateful. Thank, thank you, you, Hall. Uh, the session, the opening session has ended. Now we want to start this different sessions of the symposium. So we go to the first session now to be moderated by Dr. Semal Tekir from ISMI Institute of Technology. Thank you. Yeah, uh, greetings from ISMIR. Uh, nice to meet you and nice, nice to see you again. Uh, we are starting our uh, conference with a keynote presentation uh, the team for this session is Data Science for COVID Response and Impact. Uh, we are pleased to welcome Professor Olavande Daramola from South Africa. Uh, he's a computer scientist who is specialized in applied software engineering and artificial intelligence. Uh, he's interested in applying AI to software engineering. Uh, his research interests include um, semantic technologies like ontologies, uh, use of knowledge graphs in software systems uh, in real world domains. He's also an active researcher in AI, uh, big data analytics and machine intelligence. Uh, and uh, uh, he uh, currently uh, works on projects um, on explainable AI, uh, AI for healthcare and health data science. Uh, 
Uh, and yes, um, uh, his keynote presentation will be on AI and data science for COVID response in resource limited settings, affordances, possibilities, and challenges. Yes, we are pleased to welcome Professor Olavande Daramola again for his presentation. Thanks. Professor Olavande. Daramola. Okay, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, good morning, everyone. And yes. um, I really appreciate the privilege to be part of this symposium. My appreciation uh, goes first to Dr. Bolanle that contacted me. And then it's a pleasure for me today to also meet all the organizers of this, of this important workshop starting with Professor Lee, the head of TUAS, or, and all the other executives that I've spoken this morning. Um, this morning, I'll be giving a talk uh, titled AI and Data Science for COVID Response in Resource-Limited Settings, Affordances, Possibilities, and Challenges. By way of um, an outline, I will start by giving an overview of the affordances of AI and data science for COVID-19, the challenges that currently exist, the enablers in terms of possibilities for the future. I will also be focusing on some policy issues that are very, very important because without that, everything that is said would just be purely academic without really having any practical implication that can actually bring some of these things into reality. I will also give you an overview of a few of my ongoing projects that are related to this topic and then share some closing thoughts. Well, just to start by saying that um, I work for the Cape Peninsula University of Technology in South Africa is a university that uh, was started, or uh, yeah, established in 2005. However, that was due to the merger of two institutions that had been in existence for a very long time. Um, I think maybe close to 80 to 100 years. The student population is over 30,000. We have 70 academic programs and we have six faculties. I belong to the Faculty of Informatics and Design and of the Department of Information Technology where we train students uh, right from the diploma to the doctorate. And we do research in AI, software engineering, information systems, health informatics and computer networks. Now, getting into the topic. It's for COVID-19. Uh, Marcus and Silva in their paper in 2008 also drawn from bases already laid by other researchers, actually defined the concept of affordances as the possibilities for goal-oriented action afforded to specified user groups by technical objects. Now in the context of our discussion this morning, the technical objects will be AI and data science. And the specified, the specified user groups will be the different category of stakeholders that could actually benefit from what AI and data science has to offer. So in that context, we can actually look at AI and data science affording goal-oriented actions for patients, for healthcare workers, for healthcare systems by way of hospitals. Centers and also for government in terms of COVID-19 surveillance and response to pandemic. Also affording uh, benefits 
for the different ministries of health or departments of health that are taxed with formulating strategies and uh, programs for and also for scientists who are actually involved in the business of drug design you know of covid-19 so in essence really ai and data science have stakeholders that belong to this uh, that are actually related to what we are talking about now the organization for economic cooperation for development oecd actually profiled the different aspects of application of ai for covid-19 uh they talked about early warning ai being able to to actually provide early warning for detecting anomalies of existence of covid diagnoses based on medical imagery using computed computed tomography x-rays and all that and also symptom data and then also in terms of prevention prediction of who is likely to to be infected or looking at the prognosis or the maturity of infection a uh, covid infection in people particularly those with uh, pre-existing conditions surveillance in terms of monitoring and tracking persons that have been infected in real time maybe persons under quarantine ensuring that um, they don't infect other people and that they follow the schedule that has been prescribed for them in terms of staying at home and not moving around. Also in terms of tracking fake information and really with respect to COVID there were actually a lot of that and AI can actually help to track that. Also in terms of delivery, drones for materials, transport, robot for high exposure, tax at hospital to ensure that humans are not honestly exposed to infection of COVID. And also service automation, deploying, triaging, virtual assistants and chatbots. And there are, for all of these are actually examples of AI solutions that have been deployed in different places, you know, to realize some of these objectives. And also in terms of recovery, monitoring patients, monitoring this, the rate of spread, track economy recovery through satellite GPS and social media data. So all of these are possibilities that are afforded by AI and data science as far as COVID-19 is concerned. And really, since the advent of COVID, researchers have given a lot of attention, you know, to several of these aspects. For example, a search on, on PubMed, which is the top most um, index database for biomedical uh, research or biomedical publications. As at December 2nd, that was yesterday, there were 732 documents, you know, that focused publications by way of articles, peer reviewed papers that focus on artificial intelligence and COVID 19. Also, a search on Scopus also revealed. 112 documents. So that is to show that really a lot of attention has been given to the issue of AI and COVID-19. Now, looking at some of the research that has been done, uh, particularly of recent in terms of um, a very important finding that came out uh, reported by a paper by Hadley et al, 2020 in the Journal of Medical Internet Research. Uh, the authors actually identified 10 most recent applications of AI for COVID that is also likely to be relevant in the future. And looking at this, they actually found that application of AI for detection of sus suspected cases, large-scale screening, 
patient monitoring pneumonia screening are quite prevalent. A lot of efforts has actually been made in these areas. A lot of solutions already exist in these areas that have been reported. However, the aspect of using A and data science for prediction, particularly in the area of prognosis, maturity of diseases, you know, risk assessment is not as common. And then of course, modeling and simulation of the trend of development as far as COVID is concerned, and also robotics for medical quarantine. So these are aspects that are not as, are relatively few compared to the first category. And then there are also fields of application that are for now, that are largely non-existent or rare, not very common, like using AI for resource allocation and the use of intelligent internet of things for data and information gathering and integration and interaction with experimental therapies. That has to do with experiments that are currently going on to see whether certain drugs can be repurposed for the purpose of treating COVID-19. So these are aspects that we are likely to see more application of AI as we go into the future. However, all of these things are things that are largely taking place in the developed world. Most of these advanced approaches, application of AI methods are things that are happening currently in the developed countries. Not so much of that is happening in Sub-Saharan Africa, which because of so many issues that, that deals with resource limitation can be qualified as resource limited settings. Now, what are the attributes or properties of resource limited settings? These kind of settings are characterized by low resource hospitals in terms of poor and in inadequate healthcare facilities, high city infrastructure, um, even things as basic as constant electricity supply are absent in many of these places. And then of course, there's also the issue of shortage in terms of human resources, shortage of qualified medical personnel, uh, materials, human resources, healthcare workers. For example, um, Nigeria, for example, has a doctor to patient ratio of four to 10,000. Uh, whereas countries like, like the US has 26 to 10,000, UK has 28 to 10,000. And even looking at this four to 10,000, most of these doctors are largely concentrated in the urban areas or the well developed cities. We actually really find highly qualified doctors in the rural areas of Africa. So which it's a major resource limitation in terms of the quality of healthcare that people in rural areas can have access to. There are also issues of high cost of healthcare for common people because of high level of income disparity between the rich and the poor. There are people that are buoyant financially enough to access the best medical care anywhere in the world. At the same time, we have persons that could not even afford to buy simple drugs to actually take care of themselves. So these are all characteristics that we see in resource limited settings. Of course, there are also issues of underdevelopment, social economic challenges, poverty, lack of access to technology, financial resources, and so on and so forth. So all of this makes the desire to apply AI and data science for COVID-19 and general, and even for healthcare in general to be more difficult and more complex in resource limited settings. And so that imposes a lot of challenge, that impo I mean, that imposes a lot of challenges actually for researchers, because the implication is that whatever it is that is known to work elsewhere will not necessarily work in these settings. There will be need for some form of contextualization, adaptation, 
to ensure that these brilliant ideas, as far as the application of AI and data science for COVID-19 and healthcare in general is concerned, you know, to be actually be able to be to be made to work in these kind of settings. However, it's been established that indeed, despite these limitations, AI and data science can be used for prediction of outbreaks, even in resource limited settings. And when this is done, it can actually speed, it can actually bring about speedy and accurate identification of cases. It can help with COVID-19 screening, contact tracing and diagnosis. It can also help with patient monitoring and also drug development. So all these are possibilities actually that um, could be realized even in resource limited settings. So in essence, AI and data science can be a solution. In fact, could actually be the game changer as far as quality healthcare is concerned in resource limited settings. I mean, um, which actually describes a lot of countries and provinces and states and towns in sub-Saharan Africa. However, to move forward on this, we need to think about the challenges and actually to see how some of these challenges can be addressed. A major challenge for the application of data science and AI for COVID-19 and generally in healthcare in sub-Saharan Africa is the availability of usable data sets. There are just not enough usable data sets that can actually support AI operations. In fact, in most cases, this is likely non-existent. The data actually exists, but not in the form that they can be used. In a lot of hospitals, uh, things are scribbled on paper, kept in files and all of that. So there's actually a lot of challenge here. In, and another problem really is that most of those things written in files are not even legible. I mean, doctors are trained to actually write in a particular way so that prescriptions and their writings are not what just anybody can, can read. They use a lot of shorthand and all of, all of those, it's part of their training, just to ensure that you know, medical data is kept private and all of that. So we don't really have electronic medical records. So data are not really available in the form that it can be used uh, to support AI purposes. Also the quality of the data. In instances where even we have some form of electronic documentation, a lot of time this data is not complete. And the reason is because the data were not really curated for the purpose to support some advanced computational procedures. So data needs to be lived. So it, it really, I mean, a lot has to be done in terms of actually ensuring that there is sufficient data because I mean, big data is actually the science of data. So if really there is no sufficient data, then that is a huge, huge limitation that has to be addressed. Of course, there is also the need to also make plans for the uptake of application of AI for COVID and, and generally for healthcare. Currently, there are no regulations or guidelines that actually supports the use of AI for healthcare in most African countries. And many are not even thinking about it yet. So these are, these are bottlenecks or challenges that has to be addressed. There's also the culture, the work culture and the orientation of healthcare professionals is such that most of them are not really inclined to use technology to facilitate their operational procedures because a lot of time that was not part of their training. So there will, there will be a need for a lot of orientation to ensure that the healthcare workers are ready to actually integrate digital technology into the workflow during healthcare. Also, we have a lot of systems that exist in isolation, what we call health system silos, different kinds of 
healthcare solutions, even when some form of automation exists, and there is actually no platform for interoperability, where some of these systems can actually be integrated so that data can be transferred seamlessly from one platform to another. So all of these are things that makes the desire to actually have elaborate AI and data science methods applied in healthcare are very difficult in resource limited setting. And of course, the issue of infrastructure is also there in terms of having adequate ICT infrastructure, broadband, internet technology. Even when this is available, it's very, very expensive. So all of these are challenges that we actually need to think about before this vision can actually be realized. But in terms of enablers, which will be like the solution or the response to these challenges, there must be, for example, a plan and a strategy for data curation, deliberately collecting data, aggregating data, ensuring that the data has sufficient quality that can support computational procedures, creating data sets that could be the basis for an AI algorithm to do prediction, diagnosis, and all the other computational operations that are essential. Also, there is need for system integration, creating interoperable platforms. And a lot of decisions need to be made, you know, on that, for example, you want to avoid, for example, issues of vendor locking. When an hospital, for example, what kind of choices should I, I mean, what kind of, what choices can an hospital make to ensure that even if, a particular vendor ceases to be the one managing the system, they are not locked or perpetually at the expense of that particular vendor. So adoption of open source platforms, for example, could be the way to go, or ensuring that systems are built on open standards. So these are decisions that, you know, needs to be made if we are really going to be able to realize this. There's also the need for policy support policy framework for AI adoption, ethical framework, governance of AI in healthcare. In most countries, these are largely non-existent. I think the only country that I know in Africa that is giving some thoughts to this now is South Africa. For example, South Africa has an ethical framework for telemedicine, and they are currently thinking about also a framework for AI in healthcare and all that. But a lot of other African countries do not seem to actually be giving serious thoughts to this. And so it will be difficult really to do anything elaborate in terms of application of AI and data science for COVID-19 or even for healthcare in general. And then of course, very important is the need for quality training and education. Currently there's a shortage of skills, relevant skills in data science, in AI in Africa. And, and, and the time to actually address this is now. In fact, one could actually count the number of African universities in so I mean, Africa, number of universities in Sub-Saharan Africa that have a data science program. I'm looking at Nigeria and I'm not able to see so many. I'm not even aware if there is any um, university that has an undergraduate program in data science. So these are things to actually look at, and that applies to a lot of other countries. In South Africa here, it's actually better because people are actually thinking about that. And there are universities that are actually floating programs, masters, you know, bachelors in data science, in relevant areas, health informatics, bioinformatics and all that. So these are things that are needed because really, I mean, the, the challenges of our time is such that we should not just study computer science for the sake of it. We should not just study um, statistics for the sake of it, even mathematics for the sake of it. We should study all these subjects for the sake of solving practical problems that can actually uh, help us to have better nations, better environment and all that. Now, but, now, talking in terms of the need, but assuming that all these challenges are surmounted, just furthering my thoughts on the need for an ethical framework, 
is the fact that there is the need to give some thoughts to certain aspects because adopting AI either for COVID or for healthcare will come with some implications. And that is, and asking those questions uh, is what, I mean, having an ethical framework will actually help to think about some of these questions and try to answer them. For example, who takes, who should be, who should be made accountable for the result of an AI system? Who takes the liability or the credit for the performance of an AI system? Is it the doctor or is it the system? Or is it the designer or the, or the manufacturer of the system? So these are some of the aspects that an ethical framework will make very clear. Who takes responsibility? If things, if something goes well, do we say that the doctor has done well or is the AI system that has done well or is the manufacturer that has done well? So all of these aspects are things that having an ethical framework will actually help to clarify. What conditions should guide the use, the privacy and protection of personal info and the privacy and protection of personal information? What level of authorization or informed consent is necessary, for example, for an AI system to look at somebody's electronic medical records and on the basis of that, make a prediction or make, make a diagnosis or make a suggestion or give a suggestion to the doctor. In what state should this individual be such that getting that consent is compulsory compared to when it may not be necessary? For example, if somebody is under an emergency situation, somebody is involved in a car accident, for example, and an AI system is actually needed to get to know certain things about the individual, who gives the consent under that condition to say, whether that information should be used. Of course, we know that if that information is used in a timely manner, perhaps life can be saved. And if it is delayed, it could also lead to something that is not desirable. So all of these are things that an ethical framework will actually help to clarify. What is the degree of thought? What is the degree of trust that could be reposed in AI system? Under what condition should we consider results of an AI system as sacrosanct? something that is believable, credible, that should be used, under what condition should, should it be considered just supplementary or complementary to what an expert thing. So all of these are, are things that having an ethical framework will actually you know, help to clarify. And then of course, what are the social implications of the use of AI in healthcare? So all these questions need to be answered. There must be a framework that provides very clear guidelines on all of these issues before we can say that we can have full scale adoption and utilization of AI in healthcare in Sub-Saharan Africa. But for now, some of these policies, these actually are likely not existent in most countries. Unlike what you have in Europe, for example, I mean, in Europe now there are AI laws, there are countries that have also implemented, I mean, AI laws that actually provide a form of governance for the use of AI system. For example, you, you have the general data protection uh, regulation that actually stipulates that, uh, I mean, talking about trustworthy AI, what is expected of an AI system, under what condition, what, what is the, I mean, that specify how results of AI system should be presented and how it should be used. So these are things that are actually essential that we need to have. I have a few, um, projects that are related to this, which I would just like to talk about as I close. Uh, my research interests pertaining to these, I've looked at aspect of explainable AI for health care. I've also looked at semantic integration of health data sources and health information systems, which is actually talking about system integration. I'm also interested and I've done or oh, I'm actually doing something in the area of AI-based point of care diagnostics, okay? That considering the fact that, uh, for example, the observation in Sub-Saharan Africa and a lot of African countries is that areas where a lot of testings, COVID testing are taking place, recorded very high numbers. And some areas where no testing is taking place, result, I mean, recorded very low numbers or even no instance of COVID at all. But the real problem really is that there are actually no testing is taking place. So is it possible to create a platform that can make testing to be more accessible to more people, particularly those in the rural area? 
we've actually submitted a proposal, a research proposal for this. Now, talking about explainable AI is a branch of AI that seeks to generate explanation from an AI model. Explanation is the ability of the model to satisfy a user's need to understand the decision or the results that was produced and also to also understand how that result was generated. This is particularly important for healthcare, where credibility it's, it's of utmost importance. However, um, what we see as far as AI, particularly machine learning models are concerned is the fact that there is a kind of, um, there's an inverse proportionality in terms of accuracy and ability for explanation. The typical AI models that are very strong, that have stronger explanation capability are not the most accurate. And the most accurate are typically black boxes, as it were. So for example, when we look at, uh, I mean, rule-based systems, using classification rules, if then rules, very easy for anyone to understand, regression algorithm, decision trees, graphical models like Bayesian networks, um, Markham random fields that are based on probabilistic, um, that are based on probability, are actually easier to actually understand compared to support vector machines or assemble uh, methods like um, different combinations of random forest, boosted trees and so on. And of course, artificial neural networks and deep learning networks. So now these ones, so we see that as accuracy, because actually the, 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 the machine learning models that are very, very accurate are typically black boxes. They may generate very good results but the basis for those results are very difficult to understand or to explain. And so that is why there is need for explainable AI. How do we get to that point where we can actually have accurate results from AI system that can also be understood by persons that need to use those results? So the need for explainable AI, so if you look at what we have here, for example, we have an AI system that could be applied to different domains and all that, be it transportation, finance, security, legal uh, domain, medicine or military, and then produces results for the user. But the user is asking, why did you do that? Why not something else? Why do I, why do I get this result and not something else? When do you succeed? When do you fail? When can I trust you? How do I correct an error? All of these questions are necessary, not only for the user to be able to understand the basis for the result that has been generated. It also helps the system for the user, if it's knowledgeable enough to know how to optimize even the performance of that system. And that is what makes explainable AI to be a very odd topic that is actually very, very interesting because for now, really, in terms of performance, I think that based on what we can see and the particular performance of deep neural networks in some areas like computer vision and image recognition, the performance is exceptionally brilliant. So really in terms of performance, accuracy, we are at a point where we are actually very comfortable as long as data is available we can be sure that there are very powerful AI models that can give very good results. But having an explanation that justifies those results is what researchers are really keen about right now. And so on the basis of that, I have this uh, ongoing project, which is called Semantics for Explainable Decision Support Systems. And really, we're actually looking more at clinical decision support system, decision support systems that will be used in healthcare. And the idea really is to use semantics, semantic technology like ontologies, knowledge graph, even natural language uh, processing to actually aid machine learning algorithms that are used as basis for decision making in, uh, to provide decision support in healthcare.
So explainable AI is concerned with interpretability of AI system to ensure that AI system have carry to provide relevant information that can make humans to understand the basis and rationale for the result that they produce. The explainability of AI is crucial to make the addition to be comprehensible, interpretable, transparent, retraceable, and reproducible, which will provide basis for increased trust and reliability in their results. So far, existing methods of explainable AI that are designed to enable interpretability of intelligence system have been found to be deficient in terms of providing accurate explanation, a convincing basis for justification and consistency of explanation in different but similar scenarios. The research will investigate how the infusion of data semantics and semantic web approaches could help to alleviate the challenge of existing methods in the context of explainable decision support systems. And so that's what we are looking at. So the idea here is actually to see how some of these semantic web technologies, NLP, semantic web, uh, resource decision, framework, hard DLs, and all of that, web of data, linked open data, ontologies can actually be used to aid traditional machine learning models like deep neural networks, um, support vector machines, or whatever it is, the decision trees, random forest, just to ensure that we are able to generate explanations for the results that are produced. And um, in this research, we're actually asking a number of questions. For example, how can semantics and ontologies be used to enhance explainable systems? How can semantics and ontologies be used to facilitate neural symbolic integration for explainable AI systems? How can semantic knowledge infrastructures be developed in order to engender context aware and personalized recommendations? For explainable system. We are now in the days of what to call precision medicine, for example. How can we use semantics to actually facilitate that? And then how can semantic knowledge infrastructure be used to provide support for the development of explainable system? That is, in the process of even creating these explainable AI systems, can we actually use semantics to produce better systems? So these are things that we are looking at. It's an ongoing work. It's open for collaboration. And so I'm open to actually collaborate with uh, persons that are interested. But just to give a conceptual idea of what we are trying to do in this research, the idea really is a problem definition. So typically, we are looking at the domain of clinical decision support systems. And then we have this semantic infrastructure. It could be ontologies or semantic data labeling or knowledge graphs. And we want to use that. And then we have the symbolic learning framework. So we have the AI model, I mean, the machine learning models here, yeah? or even AI, typical AI models, case-based reasoning, you know, Bayesian net, whatever it is. But we want to use the semantic resources to facilitate explanation, such that at the end of the day, we have the result or the outcome, and then we also have explanation and the decision of the results. That's actually the idea of what we are trying to do in that research. And that has actually, uh, that's kind of laid a kind of foundation for two other projects that I'm currently involved in. This project, semantic integration of multiple ed data sources for treatment decision making called the same treat project is actually a funded project by the National Research Foundation of South Africa and also the Austrian uh, Research uh, Federation. So I have a partner from Austria that we are working on this together. So the Centric, the Centric project is an investigation of the semantic integration of multiple head data sources in order to improve the efficiency of treatment decision making for some selected diseases that are treated with gait impairment. So we're actually interested in diseases that by virtue of their chronic nature affect the gait, the posture of the patient. And this is relevant to Austria and South Africa. So essentially, for this research, we are looking at linked open data sources. This is semantic, uh, this is a semantic resource. We are looking at epidemiological data. We are looking at electronic health records. And we are looking at real-time gait analysis data. So all of these 
we want to combine together in order to actually make intelligent recommendations that could hate treatment of persons that have gait impairment, impairment we respect to some of the diseases in red that we have here. So HIV, tuberculosis, diabetes, dementia, Parkinson disease. Uh, these are diseases of the elderly, alhesia and all that. And the good thing about this really is that research has shown, for example, the link between this and COVID is the fact that research has shown really that COVID alone really kills. I mean, a lot of people that died of COVID did not really die just because of COVID. There were people that had underlying conditions, which are called comorbidities. So this is actually relevant because if you are actually able to tackle this, then that you actually help. I mean, if persons with underlying conditions of HIV or tuberculosis have COVID, this can actually help to actually ensure that they get better treatment. Also, there is also this, um, we have a proposal uh, submitted for this, AI-based framework for multimodal diagnostics and management of COVID-19 and associated comorbidities in resource-limited settings. Just for the purpose of time, what we are trying to do here is to create a multimodal framework. We know that for now, there are different modes of testing for COVID. That is what we call molecular-based uh, testing. That is the PCR-based test where samples are collected from the individual. There are also genetic-based testing that are done that could be used as a basis to actually dictate if somebody has COVID or I mean, likely to have COVID. And then radiological image-based diagnostics. Chest S3 scans can actually be used, you know, um, in terms of, uh, what to call COVID pneumonia. So all of these are different methods of testing for COVID. So the idea in this research that is proposed is to provide a platform for the triangulation of these various methods. And the idea really is that somebody somewhere may not have access to molecular-based testing. Somebody may not have access to genetics. Somebody may not have access to radiological, but whichever one that the person has access to, that could be a basis to actually provide a starting point to know whether this person has COVID or not. And where somebody has access to multiple methods of testing, this framework can actually help to compare the results to help the medical practitioner to make more informed decision. Maybe in terms of having better conviction that yes, this person is actually, uh, this person actually has a problem with COVID and all that. And then, of course, we want to do that in such a way that individuals, even those in the rural areas, can capture their own data. So maybe somebody can actually, uh, maybe has an S3 report, you can just take a photograph of it and send that image, you know, over the internet to a server that will be, you know, where it can be processed and all that. Or maybe he wants to actually fill a form online, just describing how he's feeling and what is happening to him or her. There's also case data capture. There are instances where healthcare water can actually call somebody and collect all the data, maybe via uh, through a telephone call and all that, and, and actually report that. Of course, so all these, when we have this data, that will be used to facilitate explainable decision support for patient triage. So we determine when somebody is at a level where it needs to be admitted or whether it's, it, can, it can just, uh, it can do self quarantine at home and all that disease diagnosis, contact tracing, post-treatment management. A lot of complications actually occur after people have been treated for COVID. So we also want to use this frame, framework to be able to track them, stay in contact with them, know exactly what is happening to them. And then of course, because we are looking at resource limited settings, communication should be, should, I mean, should take place, for example, in local language, language that the, the patient is actually comfortable with. And then of course, also providing accessible mode of communication, something that is cheap and cost effective maybe using telegram for example or sms or mobile phone so these are these are the things that we've put together in the formulation of the idea of this ai based multimodal framework and the idea of a framework here is that this is something that could be realized in multiple settings so for example depending on 
data that pertain to a particular setting, this particular framework can be customized. Actually, for this study, we're actually looking at South Africa and Nigeria. So the idea is actually to have an implementation that can be contextualized, okay? For the Nigerian situation and also for the South African situation using selected sites. Now, my closing thoughts, um, just to say that AI and data science for COVID and generally for healthcare has a lot of benefits in terms of improved healthcare services, accuracy, and, I mean, it can facilitate accuracy and prompt decision making. Also, it creates new opportunities. Um, human machine synergy for improved healthcare. So it's not just the humans taking the decision. Actually, it's been proved really that he, the human machine synergy is better than going the solo way. That is to say that frameworks or strategies that, you know, that harnesses what humans do best and what machines do best, bringing them together produce better results than go purely, going purely with human approach or going with purely machine approach. So that actually, so that platform or that point is actually created. And then of course, AI assisted telemedicine. With the advent of COVID, there has been, a, there has been an increase in the adoption of you know, telemedicine uh, based approaches for healthcare, where the doctor is not necessarily, is away from the patient and there's interaction, remote interaction, and yet the patient can be helped. So, AI can actually help to facilitate that. And also the concept of robotics can also help. There are also instances where uh, even when some form of interaction needs to take place, it need not be the human that is there, maybe to minimize the problem of infection and all of that. So robots can actually do that. And there's actually a lot of advancement along those lines that makes that to be something that is a possibility going into the future. Things to do in terms of obstacles, the obstacles are still there, usable data sets, we don't really have them. The culture needs to change. There is still the issue of skills shortage, which are things to actually address. And as far as government is concerned, all of these cannot be realized without support from government. Policy support, funding support, because research costs money. And of course, investment in critical infrastructure. So thank you so much for enduring me. I stop here. Thank you. Um, thank you for your insightful presentation, Professor. Uh, I guess we will get the questions in the QA break. Uh, you can put your questions to QA chatbot. Uh, I'm checking the chat bot. I see no questions. Maybe we can get questions in the QA break, Professor Daramola, if you are available. Yeah, sure. I okay. Uh, then we can uh, continue with the uh, next presentation. It's an invited session um, uh, that will be given by Dr. Utku Köse from Turkey, from Süleyman Demirel University. He's an associate professor in Süleyman Demirel University. Uh, his research interests include artificial intelligence, uh, AI safety, optimization, uh, machine ethics, and e-learning. And uh, Dr. Utku Köse will share with us uh, his views, his vision uh, on the role of data science after COVID-19. Okay, please welcome Dr. Utku Köse for his presentation, thanks. Thank you very much, uh, dear professor. Uh, I'd like to thank dear professor uh, Tekir uh, for her uh, kind invitation uh, and introduction for me. And I'd like to also uh, thanks, uh, the, send my thanks to everybody enrolling in uh, rising that great event of the African uh, Symposium of the Big Data Analytics and Machine Intelligence, and also as well as the TN International Thematic Workshop. I'd like to congratulate uh, everybody. So uh, let's move because of the limited time. Uh, I'd like to move a little um, faster, dear friends. 
Yes, I think you are now seeing my um, desktop. Uh, I will start my presentation. Yes, as uh, dear professor also uh, introduced my speech, uh, my speech is titled uh, as the data science for the world after COVID-19. Uh, I'm an associate professor from the Suleyman Demirel University of um, Turkey, located in the city of uh, Sparta. So uh, my presentation will include some uh, perspectives uh, regarding the, how the world will be like uh, after that's uh, everything that's uh, belonging uh, to the COVID-19 issue we will end it. Uh, so we will all see when it is it will be ended or it, it is uh, ending, uh, we will all see. But at least uh, according to the developments in terms of the data science, we can be giving some predictions uh, regarding to the world after the COVID-19 issue. So my presentation will be based on some uh, brief uh, essential information uh, about the data science and the ways uh, of the data science to be applied uh, in terms of the current developments, current real world uh, um, problems based applications, dear friends. And also I will be um, uh, explaining some important aspects of the COVID-19. Actually, uh, all of us uh, actually knows uh, uh, lots of things about that and uh, I will uh, forward my presentation regarding to the applications of possible applications of the data science and we already know some of uh, these applications for now and uh, I will forward my presentation about some predictive analysis uh, and discussions regarding to the world after COVID-19 and uh, by considering the especially uh, of course the applications by uh, data science. And also I will explain some open problems that you may be considering in your research works um, in further developments and projects, of course. And at the end of my presentation, I can take your questions or your questions are all welcome to the question and answers in the, in the chat box in, in the Zoom environment. Yes, uh, dear professor has introduced me uh, very kindly and uh, I would like to pass that slide. I just uh, recommend you to visit my academic profiles if you want to learn more about my research works and more about my papers or projects. So you are all welcome to visit my profiles as well as my personal web page. And you are all welcome to visit Turkey, uh, my hometown Afyon and also the city of Sparta. I'm currently living here and uh, there are lots of beautiful cities located in Turkey, as you know, and you are all welcome, dear friends. And the uh, Sparta city and uh, Afyon Karesar, it's my hometown Afyon, uh, is a very historical place, city and uh, starting point of the independence war of the, the Republic of Turkey, uh, as you know. And you are all welcome to visit that historical city uh, with a very big rocky castle inside in the middle of the city, as you can see. And also you are all welcome to visit uh, Sparta. It's very famous with its roses and also uh, the region of the lakes, uh, uh, which is shared by some cities, a few cities uh, around here. So you are all welcome to visit both cities. I would like to, to also give you a brief in, uh, information regarding my university and also departments. Uh, as you can see, there is the again the sign and logo of a rose over the. Uh, over the logo of the Suleyman Demirel University. Suleyman Demirel is uh, one of the former uh, presidents of the Republic of Turkey and he was born in Sparta, so his na name appears uh, over the, that public university. It's established in 1992 and it's known as a large academic institution in Turkey. We are famous with uh, especially agricultural research, medicine, engineering and also business science. And also you are all welcome to visit our departments of course, our department hosts three professors, two associate professors and seven assistant professors with three research assistants. We host uh, Bachelor of Science, Master of Science and PhD degrees. And uh, there are lots of international students coming from the, especially the Africa region, uh, for example. So uh, you are all welcome to visit our department and also our university. Yes, uh, let's start. So what is data science? That question uh, includes many different discussions uh, when we consider the current literature, dear friends, but we can just say briefly without uh, some detailed discussions and explanations from the literature, we can just say that it's a new form of statistics, uh, which is also associated with more alternatives for processing the data. 
when we uh, talk about the alternatives for the processing of the data, uh, we just visit some uh, more different alternative innovative ways to process data. For example, uh, uh, the statistics and computer science and uh, intense use of the mathematics and also, uh, of course, the scientific, theoretical and applied foundations regarding the information processing are very important for the data science. And data science, because of that, uh, provides some innovative solutions for dealing with the data, not but uh, by using a direct pure statistics, but using more analytics and detailed data processing efforts to provide better analysis of the data, which is increased day by day, time by time, as you know, and becomes a massive and big data, as you know. So uh, it also deals with the structured or unstructured data uh, coming from the digital environments, uh, as you know, and uh, that is done to understand and make predictions about the facts, events, or other things uh, associated with the real world problems. So because it's enrolled with uh, many of the different uh, fields, we can say that it's as accepted as a multidisciplinary field. And uh, when we di uh, dive into the deeper sides of the data science, we can say that it's, uh, of course, includes the pure analysis, uh, quantitative analysis and qualitative analysis coming from the statistical foundations. Uh, actually, the world, the real world, is uh, with the full of the mathematical uh, models and um, uh, and uh, uh, different uh, occurrences uh, which we can uh, make connections with the physics and explaining them in terms of the mathematical models. So the data science, the ways of the data science, of course, includes pure analysis coming from the mathematics and also statistical background. And also when we talk about the current developments, we can be saying that the visualization is very important in order to make the data, especially unstructured data, uh, understandable by the human side, for example. And also, of course, when we talk about the artificial intelligence, when we take a, a reference to the artificial intelligence and computational intelligence, we can say that there's a great uh, application side of the machine and deep learning as well as the intelligent optimizations, which is based on the mathematical modeling and uh, having great relations with the data science. And also by using some combinational uh, methods, uh, by uh, reaching to the hybrid methods, we just uh, benefit from the data science to run some effective hybrid methods for dealing with the real world problems and maybe uh, improving the current known uh, real world based solutions or the known findings, results, or just making some problems uh, solved with difficult uh, problems and complex problems, of course, solved by the, uh, by the effective and innovative uh, solution ways provided by data science. And also when we uh, consider especially COVID-19, we already know that there are great efforts uh, currently for developments uh, of the vaccines, for example, and uh, actually that's the uh, belonging to, to the information discovery and we all uh, being aware about the information discovery provided by the data mining, by the artificial intelligence, as you know. So the discovering uh, a predictive or descriptive data uh, and information by using innovative methods uh, is somehow a very effective way of the applying data science. And uh, when we uh, talk more about the current developments and application sites of the data science, we can say that it just uh, includes some efforts to be understanding things from data. The data is actually the uh, one of the most remarkable thing. Uh, it's the petroleum of the 21st century, as you know, uh, when we consider uh, in terms of the uh, digital environments and all applications surrounding our daily life. So we can say that the everything which tends to be understood uh, by analytical efforts uh, are associated with the efforts and applications uh, provided by the data science. Of course, you can be using somehow some intelligent systems or other different um, maybe mobile applications supported by image processing or other things like machine or deep learning based applications, as you can see from the explanations from the slide. But uh, eventually, actually, the all efforts belonging to the data sites and, of course, uh, efforts by the data uh, science, dear friends. 
and we all uh, use the mobile applications or telemedicine applications, for example, by considering the COVID-19 because it's requiring to somehow some remote uh, efforts and remote communication ways uh, to track the patients or make a, an accurate uh, the communication sessions uh, among people. So telemedicine applications are very important in terms of the data science. And of course, when we talk about the Internet of Things, uh, these things actually are uh, increasing day by day. Uh, so the future, depending on the smart cities or smart environments uh, covered by the Internet of Things applications. So uh, the data science has uh, really important, remarkable contributions in terms of IoT-based uh, applications. And uh, when we think about the data processing, we can just uh, think something like a system uh, which includes some inputs and outputs and some processing applications uh, in the middle of the input and output um, scenario. So we can say that data science includes all efforts by considering the view of the processing which is done over the input data to reach some output data. When we talk about the machine learning or deep learning, we can say that that's done somehow with uh, some training efforts, which is done with instant data, uh, maybe thinking about the online learning or reinforcement learning maybe, or somehow some samples from coming from the past uh, events, past scenarios. So after training our system, we just apply some testing phases to understood that if it is not uh, overfitting or uh, learned enough about the target problem, so we reach to the application side. So uh, when we talk about from the perspective of the machine learning or deep learning, things are just slightly changing to understood to all mechanisms from the perspective of the artificial intelligence. But when we talk about simply from the view of the data science, we can just say that that's all things are just processing the data, the input data to reach somehow the output data. But uh, that's a very simple way to, uh, to explain everything. Uh, of course, when you deep insight to the, to the applications of the data science, you can be saying that everything is very complex and uh, also there are lots of efforts to make the unstructured data, for example, to make uh, uh, them uh, very understandable to be applied actually to the processing sites, uh, to be reaching to the desired outcome uh, and outputs, for example. But uh, so some, somehow we should be starting from some uh, or uh, dealing with the starting points to deep insight. Uh, we should be ready to deep insight. So uh, that's all the essential information about how the data science is working in terms of the uh, data processing. And uh, when we talk about the COVID-19, we can say that it's a rapidly spreading virus type, as you know, and it's already become a threat for the humankind, animals, and uh, maybe the earth. Actually, the Earth is just uh, having some comfortable states because of the uh, humans are not everywhere, <laughs> and uh, the, uh, it's uh, the, that emergency state causes uh, malicious activities against the nature uh, to be limited or maybe in the causing it to be becoming delay. So uh, that may be an advantage for the nature, or maybe that's the, the actually the. The, the the feedback uh, rapid feedback by the nature because of the technological developments maybe but at least that's uh, the COVID-19 is a threat for the humankind and uh, some animals so it's uh, accepted as the pandemic as you know and uh, because of this it's uh, the way of the pan being pandem pandemic and also affecting the the massive of uh, the massively affecting to all people living in uh, different regions uh, around the world. So it's associated with the big data when we uh, consider its applications uh, from the view of the big data, for example. So uh, it's all associated with people's actions because it's rapidly spread uh, because of the people's actions. So we should be thinking that uh, the exact data processing is depending on the people actions, they are tracking them and also uh, ensuring a massively data tracking um, operations for uh, tracking the, the, the worldwide maybe health state uh, because it's associated with the health state massively. 
and also it needs urgent predictions as also dear professor uh, before my presentation has uh, indicated lots of things regarding the especially efforts by the artificial intelligence and also xai as you know so it's still unclear about the treatments and prevention ways there are many remarkable uh, steps uh, taken so far but but still there are unclear and open problems in terms of the covid-19 the mysterious regarding to that issue so all of these things uh, just explains that we should be having a great effort to be using digital tools to be using data science efforts uh, and of course the covid-19 has caused many different problems including economical problems and uh, the health-oriented problems and lots of unpredicted uh, costs and uh, lots of the urgent developments causing the economical states of the countries to be uh, become to to or decrease to critical levels, as you know. Uh, so because the uh, trading system and actually the face-to-face -face, um, the, uh, the flow of the people is not uh, like to be that uh, we experienced uh, around two years ago or maybe one year ago so because of that the, everything is just uh, coming from the economical state of course uh, is causing some lots of problems for the near future for today and for maybe the far future so because of that, the new rules and the new arrangements uh, are just called under the name of the new normals, new norms. So we should be thinking about the world after the COVID-19 with the efforts by the data processing, data science, actually. Uh, there are lots of discussions uh, which can be we can be talked about, but uh, when we uh, briefly uh, just want to briefly give some uh, some uh, direct uh, direct uh, discussions regarding that and some direct predictions about the near future, maybe we can be just talking about some uh, critical titles, uh, which is in, uh, including the uh, efforts by the data science to be shaping the world after the COVID-19. For example, uh, some of these titles are actually uh, experienced for now, uh, as you know. For example, remote solutions are very important and medical scientific research perspective is very important to be discussed. And also, especially communication ways, the, co the way of the communication and the way of the validation in terms of data we are using are very important. And of course, the cybersecurity is very important title to be considered when we talk about the even current digital equipments and devices, as you know. And the space-oriented works, because there are lots of efforts, as you know, uh, in uh, last a few days, a few weeks, a few months, as you know, there are many different uh, innovative efforts and works uh, to be um, to be flowing throughout the space, uh, to be searching for alternatives, maybe for the future of the uh, new generations but uh, that should be a, another uh, remarkable title uh, which is including the use of the data science for the world after the covid-19 and also of course we should be talking about the sustainability aspects uh, to be shaping the world after the covid-19 which is supported as the supported uh, sorry uh, by the data science actually so uh, when we talk about remote solutions, we can be saying that the data analytics is very critical. And uh, for the near future, even near future, for the remote jobs, that will be very critical, dear friends, because we are all now performing everything in remote mode, as you know, giving the lectures and giving, for example, such a keynote speech uh, I am doing for now, and uh, many things, meetings or other things, and uh, tasks related to jobs are being currently done uh, remotely. There are, uh, of course, uh, different hybrid methods or different solutions, uh, but uh, the future will be probably uh, based more uh, on the remote jobs. Actually, before the COVID-19, there are already uh, different types of jobs, uh, which is done remotely, as you know, especially for the internationally done jobs. Uh, there are lots of uh, efforts to be doing uh, such uh, jobs or running such jobs in terms of the tasks uh, which can be done remotely actually but after the COVID-19 the data science will be a requirement for the analyzing the remote jobs the performance of the 
uh, stuff maybe and the, the, the completing rates of the jobs and the giving a big perspective or wider perspective for the future analytics for how um, uh, for understanding how the, all the tasks are going and how the job the main job is um, going uh, through to the uh, to the output desired output for example so data analytics will be a very critical point for the remote jobs when we consider the data science and also of course there will be uh, because of the remote function there will be a massively done uh, variety of the jobs uh, internationally so massive data analyzed for indirect evaluations and contacts among the staff will be very critical when we think about the, the world after the COVID-19 and of course remote tracking with the data remote health tracking uh, in terms of the remote solutions will be very critical and remote public safety as we are doing with the GPS systems and the remote uh, communicative systems for example will be very critical in terms of data science and as you know, the distance education in terms of the electronic learning, e-learning will be a very critical in terms of the, as being the remote solutions and more data analytics perspectives will be critical to deal with the exact uh, tracking of the learners and also teachers over the remote e-learning platforms. So data science will uh, be having a great potential to be running maybe AI-based solutions or other massive big data oriented solutions to be remotely tracking the exact uh, educational uh, process uh, in order to meet with the educational outcomes when we consider the learner and the teacher side. And also IoT oriented solutions will be very critical in order to deal with all of these things because we will be reaching to smart environments uh, in order to make many things remotely in especially um, the metropolitan cities for example like the, considering the turkey maybe like the istanbul ankara or other cities there are already uh, different types of smart tools uh, which allows you to uh, perform some remote uh, tasks uh, during the daily life so these are just giving you advantage to use your time more efficiently and performing your uh, multitasks uh, uh, at the same time so iot oriented solutions will be very critical including with especially more data to analyze considering the massive data as you know and also when we talk about the medical scientific research massive and personal health research will be more critical for the data science as you can see for even for the current developments uh, the, uh, the humankind is doing for maybe at least one year uh, when you consider the, at least uh, the last one year dear friends and also uh, that's very critical thing that the more open access research and data will be visible because the journals and the academic um, institutions and all efforts are going towards the open access uh, strategy uh, nowadays so that will be very critical because everybody uh, requiring to be taken place in remotely will be requiring uh, the instant um, and rapid access to the data, to the research. So open access research will be more uh, appropriate for the future of the medical and scientific research, thanks to the data uh, science oriented efforts uh, requiring that, of course and also research with massive data and intense medical research on massive data and also of course the improved AI based solutions for to dealing with the context data will be among the all critical perspectives regarding to the world uh, in terms of the medical and scientific research done by data science after the COVID-19 issue and robotics based medical scientific research with more data of course will be critical and international carefully designed data, data repositories will be very critical as you know there are lots of different environments like uci or maybe kaggle are very important data repositories are very critical for dealing with the especially open access reaching data and performing the remote international projects and research efforts uh, so the uh, more numbers of the more number of the data repositories, uh, including especially big data oriented outcomes will be very common for the near future. And when we talk about the communication side, we can be say that the more social media environments will be visible, of course, <laughs> day by day, we are always uh, experiencing with the more developments rises of the 
different social media environments, as you know. So that will be a very common thing. Uh, it's already a common thing, but the future will be uh, coming with more things, especially associated with the remote advertisement, data-oriented A-trade, with the interaction uh, with the holograms or the uh, mixed reality things, maybe. And of course, the web uh, developments regarding the web and maybe for example, uh, the 6 g will be a very remarkable thing to process the big data rapidly uh, for uh, ensuring the many different um, advantages of the remote social media oriented interactions, including the uh, dealing with the advertisements, communicating each other and data oriented aid rate and maybe performing the research works, as I've said in the previous slide. So advanced communications technologies will be very critical at this point. Maybe AI-based communication technologies with data understanding capabilities will be very common things for the future. And advanced personal assistants are very critical because while going somewhere, walking to the somewhere or going through via a bus or train, we are just dealing with the personal assistants by uh, talking with them uh, in terms of the speech data or just using some uh, image oriented processing. We just deal with the uh, daily life problems, tasks. So advanced personal assistance will be very common things when we talk about the data uh, science oriented efforts. And of course, the feature will be uh, associated with the IoT oriented objects, including the devices, small, very small devices, maybe sensors, actuators, and including the bigger things like cars and also even smart buildings, for example. So the, all of these uh, things will be combined or covered by the ambient intelligence, which is somehow uh, uh, an advanced form of the, um, the IoT-based systems, which is including more intense use of the artificial intelligence and the ambient intelligence is actually the form of the the software-oriented conceptual perspective of such systems running over the hardware components. And the validation will be very critical. For now, even talking about the vaccines around the world, everybody is having angsties regarding if the vaccines will be uh, safe for in terms of the health state, our health state, and if we should be trusting to the to the um, health workers and uh, explanations done by the governments and also other uh, authorities, for example. So the validation is very critical. While working over the social media and dealing with the data over the web, we are all uh, having angsties regarding the validations uh, and validated uh, state of the data and information, as you know. So there is the more intense data validation works uh, for the uh, future, the world after the COVID-19, and the blockchain and also Tangle as an alternative, rapid alternative uh, for the blockchain, and uh, the many other uh, things, uh, more alternatives to come will be very critical for the future, and the centralized distributed solutions will be very critical. And of course, the human will be in control for the data validation at this point. Maybe the human will be controlled for the uh, validating their capabilities for the data validation, maybe coming on reaching to a paradox <laughs> eventually, uh, maybe. And the ethical data validation will, will be very critical because ethics is increasing uh, its value day by day because of the malicious use of the data, uh, as you know, and the more intense use of the intelligence systems, the ethical data validation is increasing its uh, importance uh, in time. And the validation will, with the synthetic data will be a, another alternative because when we sometimes cannot find the appropriate data to be dealing with the target problem, we require some synthetic data to be used. So the creation of the synthetic data and using that for the validation steps will be very critical when we talk about the validation of the feature of the data for the features of the data science after the COVID-19. And the tracking food, raw materials and resources uh, will be very critical in terms of the validation because uh, the problems, current problems will, causing, will be causing the problems in terms of the reaching to the required food amounts. And of course, as the humankind, we are already, we have been already uh, giving uh, important uh, side effects to the earth in terms of the resources by uh, making uh, advanced use of the technologies and making use of technology for 
uh, eliminating the nature and uh, making something for only us, not for the uh, nature, not for the animals, not for other things, other living organisms, but uh, only using uh, everything for only us. So maybe uh, when I uh, talk uh, like about that in the starting of my presentation, maybe the COVID-19 is somehow some uh, some uh, results of that all of these problems. So. Uh, the validation for all of these resources will be another critical problem and uh, open way for the future developments. And of course, the machine-oriented massive data validation will be another critical contribution done by the artificial intelligence. And in terms of cybersecurity, that will be very critical because the features will be full of the common uh, objects. Uh, Sorry? For disturbing, but we are already behind schedule. Uh, okay. Can I uh, to conclude your presentation in a few minutes, please. Yeah, sure, sure. Don't worry, dear professor. Sure, of course. In uh, around two or three minutes, yes. Yes, uh, when we talk about cybersecurity, the intense cybersecurity solutions will be very critical for the future and uh, for real smart objects that will be a very critical thing to be dealing with the data uh, science-oriented solutions of the world after the COVID-19, dear friends. There are many developments regarding the quantum-based solutions, as you know, so that will be very critical, not only for the data processing, maybe for also cryptography, which will be used for the ensuring the cybersecurity for the future tools of the future. So data processing efforts uh, will be more intensely used for the hardware side, not only software side, but the more intense will be uh, forwarded to the hardware side uh, from uh, taking from the software side, for example. So cybersecurity for intelligence systems and the adversarial data, which is for manipulating the machine and deep learning systems will be very critical when we talking about the data science and the features with the full of the intelligence systems. And also space works as very critical, more communication satellites will be uh, rising, flowing over the earth, uh, over the atmosphere, and also more different purpose satellites will be visible, like the doing by the Elon Musk, for example, and more data-oriented search for remote planets, galaxies are already done and will be doing uh, for, uh, thanks to the efforts by the data science. And uh, another planet for colonies or future life will be a very common thing to be do for the future. And predictive works for more understanding deeper sides of the space, space uh, sorry, and the developments for data processing device for space research will be very common thing. And sustainability uh, as the final uh, title will be very critical because the tracking of the vital sources and optimum use of energy and clean energy solutions with data understanding will be very critical. And sustainable data will be a very critical thing, very uh, critical thing for the future, dear friends. I would like to finish my words with giving some open problem suggestions. Just ensure about the cybersecurity when we talk about the data science, the world after the COVID-19. And you can be considering predictive descriptive solutions and AGI super intelligence by the artificial intelligence were very critical. I have not talked about them because they are out of slightly out of my current presentation. But uh, some of my friends uh, listening to my webinars are already being aware of these concepts. And real-time solutions are very critical. Data process, privacy, sensitive data are very critical. And also consider big but true data for the future of the data processing after the COVID-19 issue. And the ethical issues and structured data or working and drug discovery are very important uh, because the future will be very critical for dealing with the uh, many uh, different massive health problems to become because we are using the technology maliciously sometimes and this causing the side effects maybe for nature so we should be all being aware for that yes thank you very much dear friends i hope that's not be, have become a fast presentation but you are all welcome to ask your questions of course and of, co of course you are all free to send your uh, questions to my and um, of course to my email accounts dear friends so thank you very much for listening to me okay we thank you for your nice presentation um okay uh, questions will be taken in the qa break uh, after okay. bolana's presentation uh, if you permit uh, if you are available we can get the questions in the qa break okay. 
Thank okay, you very then, much, dear Professor. We thank you. Okay, then we are moving to the third presentation uh, uh, in this session. Uh, the presentation will be given by Dr. Bolanle Ojakov. Okay, she is an associate professor uh, in the Department of Information Systems of the Federal University of Technology, Akure. Uh, she's also working on um, artificial intelligence, big data, and analytics. And she's currently focusing on data science and its applications to issues in developing economies. And finally, she is currently an executive board member of the TUAS Young Affiliates Network. And uh, her interesting presentation is on agricultural aspects. The talk's title is Data Science for COVID Impact on Agriculture and agro elite in Selected West African Countries. Okay, please welcome uh, Olane for your presentation. Yes, thank you, um, Dr. Sema. Thank you for the nice introduction. Um, I want to appreciate everyone for being here. And the title of my presentation has been shown. I also want you to know that I have a short time so that we don't go too far beyond schedule. So I wouldn't uh, take too long on this presentation. Um, what uh, necessitated this research was um, the impact of COVID on some of our, of our parts of the developing world. During the, law, during the COVID crisis, said the different governments were making different attempts to ensure that um, COVID doesn't spread as much as possible. So different measures were being put in place and uh, including the lockdown, where people had to stay indoors you know, in, in order to limit contact with uh, either those who were already infected and the potential infected persons. And uh, when this happened, I started thinking this impact might have some negative, I mean, this uh, lockdown might have some negative impact on, on people around, especially in the developing world and in countries like has Nigeria and some neighboring countries that might not have prepared enough for the pandemic. So especially in relation to um, solving uh, the important area of agriculture where people have to eat, even though they have to stay indoors, how do they find food to eat? Uh, currently, then, and uh, in some months to come. So that was what actually ne necessitated this um, research. And um, the background is about uh, telling us about the, the, the pandemic, and it, it happened uh, it, uh, around March, so the, the study started then, and uh, we had to look into how we can measure the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, especially at the core period when there was lockdown. So we all know what the lockdown is about and a strategy with very serious impact on farming activities. The farmers could not go to their farms and people who were the marketers could not move the farm products from the farms to the um, to, to the various places where they have to be sold, and uh, we 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 are also aware that the primary employment of people in this part of the world is small scale farming, and uh, is one of the most fragile and vulnerable regions to epidemic. So this study was carried out in some countries um, with an online survey and a few, a few uh, physical qu uh, questionnaires were distributed to, to some in some locations. And uh, we know that the peculiarities of this region makes it important to study the effect of this pandemic. And the essence of doing this is to raise awareness as well as assess the disruption issues that farmers and farming systems have. 
as a result of the lockdown. So the we had 33, 84 respondents in hall, and uh, we identified that the most common business respondents, uh, most common businesses in this region are poultry, agri-retail, professional services. We had people who were specialists and equipment dealers. So we had some re research questions. The major ones are to measure farmers' perception of the impact of COVID and lockdown on the farm and business revenue. Then the preparedness of farmers for the lockdown on their farm or business revenue. And then the impact of the effectiveness of the COVID-19 lockdown. So we had a, a survey that was sent online and uh, we have some close-ended questions and uh, some that had to do with rating. For instance, the impact of COVID-19 and lockdown policies. So it was on a Likert scale. Then we also had some close-ended questions uh, and uh, we, we are yet to um, complete the analysis on the close-ended questions. So here we intend to um, make use of um, natural language processing techniques to be able to cluster the responses because they, they, they are free responses that people made on suggestions that could be relevant to the government in making policies that can be used to respond to future pandemics. So we intend to make use of uh, clustering techniques, maybe like K-means clustering techniques to do that, so that this could be used or made to make recommendations on policies that could help in responding to pandemics in the future. For this analysis, we, we, we use the chi-square and Cochramantel Heinzel um, statistical analysis techniques. So the results show that uh, more than 85% of the respondents in each country were negatively or very negatively affected by the COVID-19 and lockdown policies, irrespective of the country. So uh, very negatively affected respondents, relatively more common, uh, more, more in Nigeria than in Ghana. And then 12% of the re respondents who are about 50 years in Nigeria experienced either positive or very positive impact. So that is to show that uh, um, maybe the, the, the aged people didn't, uh, were not really affected negatively as such with the lockdown poly, uh, policies. Similarly, about 10% about of respondents below 30 in Benin and 5% uh, be, be between the age of 41 and 50 years in Ghana were positively or very positively impacted. So this is also a kind of ironic, uh, ironic result. That is to show that why the, the pandemic and the lockdown affected some people negatively, there were some that were also impacted positively. And this is something that it's also uh, interesting to look at um, in the future. And then uh, none of the respondents older than 50 years were either positively or very positively impacted in the six countries, you know, in the, in the countries except in Nigeria. And then we also see that the, the, uh, the text, uh, text of association shows that there is no relationship between the ages of respondents and the impact of COVID and lockdown policies on respondents, farm or business revenue. Then female respondents were neither positively nor very positively impacted by COVID in two of the countries. In Ghana, more than half of the respondents claimed that the current COVID-19 was not well prepared for in their farm locations. Similarly, more respondents in Nigeria also claimed uh, the same too. So that is to show generally that COVID, the COVID crisis was, was not as well prepared for in the farming sector. We also found no relationship between the impact of COVID-19 and lockdown policies on the respondents' farm or business revenue. And either of the respondents' preparedness for current COVID-19 crisis and the status of lockdown in Benin. Also, the same in Ghana, there was no relationship found between the impact of COVID-19 and lockdown policies on the business and respondents' preparedness for current COVID-19 crisis. 
So no relationship between the policies and the, their preparedness. There, was, there is a relationship between the impact of COVID-19 and lockdown policies on respondents' farm or business revenue and the status of lockdown in Ghana and respondents' preparedness for current COVID, COVID crisis in Nigeria. Then on the revenue, the, 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 the Kai test, test was employed to in, investigate whether there was a relationship between the age, gender, farm location of respondents and the, their status and preparedness. So the test shows that there is no re relationship between ages of respondents and the impact of COVID and lockdown policies on their farm or business revenue in all the countries. That is to say that the ages of the respondents and the opinions of all respondents in all the countries on the impact of COVID are independent of one another. So there is no relationship also between age and the impact. Similarly, there is no relationship between country where farm of each of the respondents is located and their views on the impact of COVID and lockdown policies. So that is to say that the countries of respondents are independent of the opinions of the respondents on the impact of COVID-19. Also, the impact of COVID-19 and lockdown policies on respondents' farm or business is independent on the status of lockdown at respondents' location. The, there is no relationship between the gender and the impact of COVID and lockdown policies on the, the farm or business. There is no also relationship between country and their views. Also, the impact of COVID and lockdown policies on the, the farm is independent of the status of lockdown at respondents' location. So uh, we want to conclude that the, this study at, at then was the first to address COVID-19 impact on farmers in West Africa based on information provided directly by the farmers themselves. A lot of the studies we saw were just, were based on reviews um, and the uh, news and so on. But this study, address the impact that uh, collecting data directly from the farmers. And our findings show that COVID-19 and the lockdown policies had a negative impact on most of the respondents' farm or business revenue. The impact is independent of either the ages or gender of respondents and the effectiveness of lockdown in Nigeria. The same thing in Ghana, the impact and COVID-19 and lockdown policies on farm or business revenue is independent of the ages and gender and the effectiveness of lockdown. So that is to say that irrespective, on a general note, if irrespective of the age and gender, the impact was uh, relatively, relatively same on all the farmers. Also the status of lockdown and the level of preparedness of farmers to undo the situation with the current COVID-19 crisis in their farm is independent in the countries. And then we also discovered that the impact of COVID-19 and lockdown policies on respondents' farm or business mostly depends on the level of preparedness to undo the situation. And uh, we can actually say that since it is based on the level of preparedness, those who had, who had enough preparation or who, who probably projected the preparation into their farming activities wouldn't have been affected as such with the shock. So, also, so it is important for the government to make uh, policies that can help people to deal with the suddenness of pandemics so that when such happens in the future, the crisis would not affect the economy as such. There are some other embedded uh, analysis in the study, like we, we also had the question, we had the respondents what would be what what would be the situation? What do they think or envisage would be the situation if the pandemic had, uh, had the lockdown had lasted for another few weeks? And this also could we could we will bring um, some deductions from from this that could also help to deal with uh, similar pandemics in the future. I want to acknowledge the the co-authors of this paper, Dr. Markinde from the Department of Statistics in Futa here. Dr. K.V. Salako from Benin, Dr. Azite, they are also TIA members, Dr. Azite from Ghana, Dr. Fayeun from Futa, and Mr. Babalola from uh, 
Puta, and then all the other students who assisted in the data collection. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much for your nice work and nice presentation. Uh, I've been informed that there will be no QA session. And can I request from you to type the answers to the questions in the QA checkbox, please? Okay, you can check the questions on the chat bot and uh, put your answers uh, there. Then um, we can continue with oral presentations. Um, and the first presentation will be given by uh, Dr. Valere Salako from Benin. Uh, the talk is uh, on the reliability of predictions on COVID-19 dynamics, a systematic and critical review of modeling techniques. Uh, Dr. Valere Salako, you are here, right? Yes. Um... Okay. Uh, then uh, we, wel we welcome you for your presentation. Thanks. Thank you very much. Can you allow me to share to share my? Can you please allow yes, me to you share can. my? Uh, I'm not having the. It's not giving me the hand. Oh, you still, you should allow me. Can you share now? No, no, still is. You should, you yes. should now. Yes. Can you see? Yes, we see. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. So thank you once again for, for giving me the floor and I'm happy to deliver this, this presentation on the reliability of prediction on COVID-19 dynamic, which is basically a systematic and a critical review that we, that we recently performed by, by a team of, 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 of four researchers, as you can see on the, on the first slide. So as you currently know, currently uh, stick on COVID-19 this morning, we, we still have about uh, 65 million of cases and more than 1 million and 500 deaths, making COVID-19 a, a global issue. And one of the points is that there has been a on a precedented surge in publication related to COVID-19, as you can see on this figure for the, for the last three months, since the beginning of the, since the first case has been identified in, in Wuhan city, for the, for the first three months, we have found more than 1,500 publications only on, on COVID-19. And in a magazine published by Science, there was also a virologist that, that has called for this, showing how scientists are, are increasingly overwhelming by the by publications on, I mean, on, on COVID-19. And when you also try to Google COVID-19 in, in Google Scholar, in, in less than 10 seconds, you have more than eight, more than 80,000 results on COVID-19, showing how much Scientists are, are working, showing how much uh, how much information are making available on on COVID nineteen, actually on different on different subjects. But one of the one of the issues that that have been widely studied is the modeling of the of of, of the COVID nineteen dynamics, and one of the issues that has also attracted people is how accurate or how reliable are the predictions and the modeling made by, uh, by, these, by these studies. So in, in this study, we aim to, to summarize 
the, the modeling technique that has been used to predict COVID-19. We, we also aim to assess the reliability of these predictions. We want to know how reliable these predictions were and to discuss the extent to which studies accurately predict the COVID-19 cases and whether there are some differences among the modeling techniques that, that have been used. So we, we use the, the prefer reported item for systematic and, and meta-analysis framework. And the period that we consider was from January 1st to October. And the keyword that we used to, to search for, for the article and preprints were, as you can see here, coronavirus, COVID-19, corona, corona disease, SARS of 2 which were combined with these techniques, with these, more, with these keywords, model and modeling, predicting and predictions. And this is the flow chart of how the, the paper were identified screen and the total number of studies that were finally included in, in our review. So for each paper that we, that we selected, we, we recorded the country where the the, the, the country on which the study was focused, the publication status, whether this, the, the paper, whether the document was published or not, the time period covered by the data, the, the topic addressed by, by the articles, the, the modern techniques that were used, the values that were predicted or for the cumulative number of reported cases, but also for the cumulative number of deaths and the date at which the predicted value will be observed. That is when this prediction was made for and what, are the, what, uh, what is the actual value observed at this date to, to check whether the value predicted was actually observed or not. And we also recorded the uncertainty parameter, namely the, the confidence interval for statistical method or the credibility interval when the, the paper used by Asian method. So the main result that we found first was that most of the papers were from, the paper were mainly from, from Asia, as, as you can see here, about a half of, of, of them, around half of them, and followed by, by Europe, but few, came from Africa and, and, uh, and Oceania. And probably because the, the pandemic started in, in Asia and uh, uh, especially in China where many publications were, were found. And the topic that were, that were addressed were mainly to model the dynamic of the transmission of the disease with predictions. Some made the predictions, but some only focused on the, on the dynamic of the, of the dynamic of the disease without making actually a prediction. Other study focus on the impact of the control measure uh, like was presented by, by, by Dr. Bonale. I mean, uh, how the, what's the impact of the lockdown? What's the impact of, of school closure and, and so? And other study focus on the estimation of key, of key epidemiological parameters. And for the control measure that were assessed, they, they were mainly quarantine, lockdown, social distancing, and few really address the, the, the use of the, of the face mask and, and workplace distancing. When it comes to the, to the modern techniques that were used, the paper mainly use compartmental model, whereby individuals are, are, are put in different categories. And it is assumed that individuals within those categories have similar characteristics. And following the compartmental model, we have the statistical model that, that we also actually use. And few study use artificial base, artificial and artificial intelligence based model, only six, only six percent. And some use, but, but very few of them use. Uh, agent-based model, where the the modeling is based is based on individual characteristic, 
And this may be because a uh, few strategies this method because certainly the the parameterization of this model is is more complicated and in time consuming. And my explain why very few study use this this techniques. Okay, here what we because this is one of the main results. Here what we look at is the study makes some predictions at a given time. So we went to that time and we check what is the cumulative number of cases that we observed at that time. And we check if these predictions is within the confidence interval or the credibility interval provided by the papers. I mean, if the value that we actually observe fall within this credibility interval, then it's, it shows that, okay, the prediction was correct and the prediction was reliable. But if the value that we observe at that date is out of the, of the confidence interval or the credibility interval, then the prediction was not correct. And what we found is that uh, first, there were few studies that, that report credibility, uh, I mean, confidence interval and credibility interval, making, making very difficult to assess the, the reliability of all those papers. But for the 15 studies that for which we, we, we found the, this data, these informations, we found that 60% of them predicted reliably the cumulative number of cases, while 40% did, did not do so. And when we look at the difference between the, the type of the, the modern techniques that were used, as you can see here, we mainly look at the statistical method and the compartmental model. And these were the method for which we, we, we found the, the, the data. I mean, out of, the, out of 11 predictions that we found for statistical method, seven were correct. While for compartmental model, two out of three were, were correct, showing, showing to some extent that the prediction were, were somehow correct. So what may explain why some deviation were, were observed, why some, some prediction were not, I mean, correct enough. The first thing could be the appropriateness of the modern techniques. I, I mean, compartmental model can be simple or even more complicated. And some studies have shown that the prediction using more complex model may not be actually uh, reliable. So depending on the complexity of the compartmental model that were used, the predict, I mean, it may affect the, the reliability of the prediction. But the problem was that we did not have enough data to make this, to make this comparison within our, our, our data set. The second point is that most of the, the infected disease system are fundamentally individual, fundamentally individual based stochastic process. While most of the method that we found in, the, in, the, in, the, in our review were mainly deterministic. So we are modeling a stochastic problem using a deterministic models. And this may also lead to, to wronger pre prediction. A problem was, is also about the quality of the data. It's often said that garbage in, garbage out. So first, at the early stage of the, of, of the pandemic, because there are limited data, the prediction might not be, I mean, the prediction might not be good. And it's true that we did not report this, this study, but we found that the wider the time you consider for, for your modeling, the more reliable, I mean, the, the prediction is. I mean, confirming that the, the amount of the data that you, that you have determine also the reliability of the, of, of the prediction you, you mean. And another interesting point is the, is the assumptions. Most of the model are based on strong assumptions. And sometimes the assumption may not be true for the population under study. For instance, population characteristics such as age distribution, the proportion of older adults, the, uh, the risk factor in the populations, those assumptions taken from other countries may not be applicable to the, I mean, to, to a focus countries. And 
in, in most of the in most of the studies parameters were were parameters for china were considered i mean in the assumption to for for, for instance modeling in europe and in asia and in africa and so and so forth and also one last point is that even if we found that some prediction were not correct i mean the actual values that we observe were not in the confidence interval or the credibility interval it might not mean that the prediction were wrong because you know prediction were of prediction are often made to guide policy makers and so if this result came out and the policy maker I mean, take some decision for, for, for instance, restricting a uh, resisting government I mean, wearing masks, this intervention may have impact on the prediction. And then the prediction made at that time may not be true or, or might not be realized because of this measure that has been taken in the in in, in, in the meantime. So this will be the, the main point of, of these studies. We, we are finalizing the, the manuscript and this will be get submitted very soon. So this is the some of the reference that we use. Thanks you for your kind attentions and comment and question are welcome. Uh, thank you for your nice presentation, uh, Professor Salako. Then, uh, we are moving to the next speaker to meet the time. Our next speaker is Professor Tülay Yıldırım from Yıldız Technical University, Department of Electronics and Communications Engineering, Istanbul, Turkey. And she will talk about data privacy issues arising with COVID-19. Okay, please welcome uh, Professor Tülay Yıldırım. Yeah. Hello, thank you very much. Uh, I hope you are here. You hear me very well. Uh, yeah. I would like to share my screen as well, firstly. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm hoping that you see my screen. Yeah. No problem. Okay. Okay. Uh, First of all, I would like to thank all the people, all the organizers, uh, and uh, I would like to congratulate them for this very nice event and very important event. And hello from Turkey to everyone. I would like to talk to you about some uh, privacy issues arising with COVID-19 data, and I would like to give some uh, applications from our studies about this uh, subject. So, uh, dear participants, as all you know, you know, the COVID-19 virus, which uh, was first announced uh, about last year, this time in China, then it spread it to uh, the whole world in a very short time. And it's explained as a new coronavirus and the, uh, by the World Health Organization on February. It's been almost nine months and uh, uh, all over the world, there is a very big data uh, flow uh, throughout the world. Uh, since, uh, you know, the February, the whole world is actually fighting with this virus uh, because it often uh, causes serious complications uh, with acute respiratory problems and causes death. According to uh, whose situation report, as of yesterday, uh, it's almost you know, one and a, uh, 500 million uh, confirmed death cases uh, were documented via case reporting forms received from uh, 113 countries. It's, it's, it's very, very important thing. So uh, countries are developing uh, various strategies against the epidemic threat now. The main ones are to increase social distance. They are putting some social distance rules and uh, hygiene rules. And also uh, countries are trying uh, to develop web-based or mobile applications to reduce the spread and economic damage of the epidemic by using technology. Uh, there are also studies on the course of the epidemic and human behavior by uh, following social media flow, flow, flows. Uh, if you look at the relationship between COVID-19 and technology, we can see that uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, data today. So uh, 
if we take a closer look at this relationship, we will see that technology is in full cooperation with healthcare professionals now. The world is struggling against the epidemic and its uh, effects by using big data and related technology effectively. Uh, with the rapid advancement of technology, large amounts of collective data provides uh, many advantages in different areas of our daily life. Uh, current uh, technologic advances in biomedical and health research also dramatically increase, uh, increase digital data production, enabling large amounts of data in a variety of disciplines, uh, ranging uh, from finance to medicine, which all of them are related to COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So this turning rising in the rapidity of the data gathering process and large amounts of data from distributed data sources enable scientific innovation exclusively in healthcare. Uh, the kinds of data uh, used in healthcare range uh, range from biosignals signals to medical imaging and laboratory tests to mixed data, sometimes some uh, patient records and some transactions about uh, patients. Big data in the field of health can improve the clinical decision-making process and patient care, of course, uh, as well as increase the statistical power of clinical research studies by obtaining more accurate results and strong prediction models. And of course, the uh, with the touch of artificial intelligence, we can now uh, we can now uh, use of radiology images for early diagnosis studies. And uh, now artificial intelligence fits the literature day by day. Uh, but what happens? Uh, and yes, someone is watching us with these kind of tracking applications as well, uh, especially. This, this is uh, very meaningful on the pandemic days because people uh, usually only focus on uh, uh, how to get rid of the, you know, the effects of the pandemic, how to uh, solve this problem, how to make people more healthier in a very short time. So uh, the data uh, is just flowing around of the world, but uh, people is not uh, thinking about the data privacy. So the uh, with increasing number of uh, data produced daily with health sensors, medical imaging data, laboratory test data, electronic or analog patient records, clinical and pharmaceutical invoices, and so on. Uh, these all are pose a big threat to control of privacy risk. Uh, we have also actually uh, estimated data amount, uh, which is expected to be in the range of yottabytes. Uh, also, we can uh, we just said that you know the, all the countries are developing various strategies against the, against the speed of epidemic trade. Uh, the main ones are to develop web-based or mobile applications to reduce this spread and also to reduce the economic damage of the epidemic by uh, just using the COVID-19 data sets uh, coming from all these kind of sources from the uh, different parts of the world. It's seen that the existing applications developed within the framework of these expectations contain uh, absolute location information, relative location information, and also some characteristic data defining people. So this means privacy trouble for people, and usually uh, people uh, is not aware of this as well. Uh, what else? Uh, this, of course, this increasing threat has forced the countries to take some actions about data protections. So countries have published, uh, some of the countries have published their own policies about data protections. Uh, most known is the GDPR uh, in Europe, General Data Protection Rules, uh, Regulation Rules. And in the USA, uh, there's HRPAA and uh, we have KVKK in Turkey about data protection. But on the other hand, uh, thanks to the technology, uh, actually the technology is supposed to protect data privacy as well. We can uh, use some privacy preserving technologies, especially with artificial intelligence applications. 
we have personal data against uh, unauthorized access and we can use, uh, we, we, sh we must uh, store this personal data securely by building confidentiality, data integrity, availability and accountability. So uh, for this, machine learning and cryptography uh, come together to provide privacy. Uh, the technology uh, just in this time presents some solutions with promising privacy preserving technologies such as differential privacy, federated learning and homomorphic encryption. If we just want to give a very short uh, explanation about uh, these important privacy preserving technologies, we can say that differential privacy is a strict mathematical definition of privacy which shares information about data set publicly by defining the patterns of groups while keeping individual data in the uh, data set. Uh, the inspiration of differential privacy is that one, uh, one cannot tell whether if any individual data is placed the original data set or not. So uh, the, the behavior of algorithm hardly changes in case an individual is replaced in the data set. So this can be achieved by using randomized mechanisms. And homomorphic encryption also uh, enables performing computation on encrypted data without decrypting it. And it's an approach used competing on outsourced storage, which allows processing data in the cloud uh, environment. And while differential privacy adds randomness in the data to prevent the anonymization strategies from succeeding, homomorphic encryption adds a security layer by providing machine learning algorithms to run on data without decrypting it. The notion of uh, federated learning was uh, proposed by Google to build secure machine learning models running on distributed data. And the data to be trained doesn't aggregate, but the model is sent to the data owner. After the training completes, the updated weights are sent back to be averaged the final model. Uh, thanks to this approach, the data remains at the original owner in a secure and trusted way without a compromise in model performance. So uh, finally, I would just like to give you uh, a few uh, studies of our own studies on privacy issues. Actually, we are using differential privacy uh, on diagnosis of COVID-19 radiology imaging at the uh, moment. So these are our uh, preliminary results and two of them is uh, published and one of them is, uh, is in the press at the moment. And I would like to thank my uh, colleagues, uh, Dr. Zümrüt Müktola and Nariya Yücü Kızrak uh, for this work as well. And uh, we are, uh, we have some uh, preliminary results, but uh, I just want to say that if you use some privacy preserving method methods, uh, you are losing some of the accuracies. So what we want to do in the future, we want to improve the uh, privacy preserving technologies uh, without losing accuracy. So uh, we are working on this at the moment. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, thank you uh, for having me here. If you have any questions, please just uh, write. I would like to answer later on. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for your presentation and sharing with us your research. Uh, then uh, our next speaker is um, Professor Ola Tubosun Ola Bode from Department of Information Systems, Federal University of Technology, Akure, Nigeria. Uh, and the title of the topic is Ensemble Machine Learning Classification Algorithms for Diagnosis and Prediction of COVID-19 Severity Level. Professor Ola Tubosun Ola Bode, please. Uh, we are not hearing you right now. What did you say? Now it works. Thank you. What did you say? Hello? Yeah, we hear you. Yeah, what did you say? Like, I didn't hear you. Excuse me? 
Can you hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hey, you are not responding now. What did this I should do? I should do my presentation. Yeah, please. Huh? Oh, okay, okay. Let me try and share my slide. Okay. Can you share your screen and start your presentation, please? Thank you. I can't share it. Professor I cannot Tule, share. Stop sharing. Professor Tule, stop sharing. Okay. Are we there? Yeah, it works. Hmm? Okay. Okay, good morning, the organizers, uh, co presenters. Um, the audience. Um, we are going to present a paper, a proposal paper. It's actually a proposal sent for um, an award. So, and uh, it was jointly written by my humble self, uh, Dr. Akinede, um, Rachel Akintola, um, Dr. Beniza. Dr. Afeni and uh, Dr. Abiodun. It was John Day written for uh, an, an award. And the paper or the research work is titled Assembled Machine Learning Classification Algorithm for Diagnosis and Prediction of COVID-19 Severity Level. Um, you see, in recent times, you know, this COVID-19 is a pandemic disease that has been ravaging the entire country for a while now, and uh, we've not gotten a precise solutions to how to solve it or how to manage it. Though many countries have devised so many methods of to at least curb it to a level, some engage in social distancing, some engage in the lockdown, some engage in, uh, in um, use of face masks, some engage in the early detection and treatment, but with all this, we still have cases of uh, infections and the mortality rate is so high, particularly in the European countries. So on this note, we have decided to see that um, we develop a machine learning tool that can ease diagnosis with minimal cost. Though there are so many methods people have been using to do diagnosis, but uh, some of these methods are quite expensive and some of them are not reachable, particularly in the developing countries. In Nigeria, for example, to diagnose uh, somebody presenting with, AIDS, uh, with uh, COVID-19, uh, it may take uh, some hours to like three days before we can confidently say that this person is COVID patient or not. So this is why we have decided to use the machine learning which will give a better prediction and a faster uh, diagnosis. Um, I will run the summary of the work is actually presented in the abstracts. I will try to read that. That uh, coronavirus, a family of virus that can cause illness such as uh, common colds, severe acute respiratory syndrome, SARS, and the Middle East Registration Syndrome, that's mass. A disease has um, caused high mortality in recent time. So, and the, and the, and at present, the main method of diagnosis is by the use of what is called the real-time reverse trans transcription polymerase chain reaction, RRT-PCR, polymerase chain reaction. Uh, actually, the alternative to this uh, PROC is the use of chest image. Uh, researchers found that the lungs of patients with HIV, uh, with like the grand class of opacity hazy uh, darkness spots that can differentiate COVID-19 infected patients from non-COVID-19 infected patients. So some of the objective of the research work is to identify, collect, and clean data or valid and useful information from 
the medical officer's COVID patient case notes and the chest x-rays, and then to identify the vital signs and critical clinical features of patients presenting with COVID-19 from x-ray images. And then to create a database repository using the MySQL. So other objective is to develop now a robust uh, bootstrapping and aggregate assembled machine learning system that will comprise of multi-layer perceptron, uh, the logistic regression support vector machine, evolutionary network and naive base model as a base for the uh, COVID-19 victim diagnosis and also the determine the severity level using the X-ray images uh, to determine its reliability. I mean, to determine its reliability, the intelligent system will be benchmarked with uh, data sets of chest X-ray images from, from two sources. The first one is the GitHub repository, and then locally source X-ray images from some selected isolation centers. So to now establish the accuracy, the efficiency of the system, we are going to look at the accuracy, we are going to look at the reliability, efficiency, oh, that's and the F1 score of the proposed systems. So, to briefly look at the, the paper or the thing and the, some of the symptoms. Hello? 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 Continue, Prof. We are hearing you. Okay, uh, professor had some problem, I think, maybe with the connection. Um, okay, maybe we can uh, wait for a minute, a few minutes. Yeah. Dr. Sema? Yeah, uh, Bolan. Can, can we move to the next session? Okay. Mm -hmm. We will. Okay, then we are continuing with the uh, next talk. Um, the talk will be given by Mrs. Yanu Pelumi Adegun from Federal University of Technology, Akure, as well. And uh, the title of the topic uh, Modeling and Predicting the Spread of COVID 19. A continental review and analysis. Okay, please uh, welcome uh, Mrs. Adegun. Uh, if you are here, can you share your screen and start your talk, please? Okay, you have 10 minutes for your talk. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am Yano Adegun. I'm a PhD student in the Department of Computer Science at the Federal University of Technology, Akure. 
and also a lecturer at the Rufus Giwa Polytechnic of One Nigeria. I will be speaking on modeling and predicting the spread of COVID-19, a continental review and analysis. Uh, this work is um, a joint effort of about eight researchers, which uh, has been submitted as a book chapter. And uh, the researchers, the other researchers are listed in the introduction page. Um, so the introduction, the outbreak of COVID-19 infectious disease, which started in Wuhan, China in late night, 2019, has been declared as a pandemic by WHO due to its global spread on 11th March year 2020. And as of 1st December 2020, reports from the WHO shows that there are 63,360,234 confirmed cases of infected people and 1,475,825 death cases all over the world. And as a result of the huge amount of data generated um, as a result of the pandemic, there's a need to process and analyze this data to get useful information. And uh, currently there are several efforts ongoing by researchers, institutions, industries, policymakers, and various organizations to curb uh, the spread of this disease. And uh, one of the major efforts that has been in place is the use of predictive modeling for uh, predicting uh, the spread pattern of COVID-19. And uh, the, one of the uh, majorly used predictive modeling techniques is what we call the statistical models or compartmental models, which includes the SEIR model and all its variants, which are proven to be very useful in epidemiological data analysis and forecasting future infectious disease outbreaks. And uh, we have uh, very few who have used machine learning models and their uh, variants. And some of the concerns that have been raised by researchers about these compartmental models includes uh, the, that these compartmental models are designed for inference about the relationship between variables and which often leads to very low predictive accuracy. And we can also see that statistical and compartmental models are mathematics um, in intensive while machine models have the ability to find out hidden pattern in data with a very strong predictive ability. Uh, here is a graph showing uh, the number of confirmed cases as of April 2019, uh, April 29, 2020, when this uh, review was carried out. And then um, a most uh, recent, a recent graph showing uh, the current situation all over the world. The objective of this work is to review and analyze past studies conducted across the world as it relates to modeling the spread of COVID-19 and to also present findings and inferences from the review and suggest ways to improve on the current modeling techniques. This review focuses on works done in about six continents, including Asia, North America, South America, Europe, and Australia. Although there, we were supposed to include Antarctica as part of the continents uh, in the review, but at the time of the review, there were no cases in Antarctica. A total of 69 articles were reviewed with 34.8% in Asia, 28.2% in um, Europe. Then we have North America, South America, Africa, Australia, and then we had some um, studies covering uh, multiple continents. Analysis of the modeling types were uh, pre are presented and also the uh, research work reveals that the trend of research focuses on Asia and Europe, followed by North America and very few contributions from Africa and Australia. And I will present uh, just a summary of reports from each of the continents because of uh, the limited time I have, it's almost difficult to um, give a full report of all our findings during the time of review, but I'll just summarize them and just present some things we're able to infer from the report from, uh, we got from the studies in various continents. In Asia, 
which includes China, India, Japan, Malaysia, and Philippines. We had some models which were used, including the SEIR model, space time cube model, Moran index model, deep learning models, and some other models. And what we can infer from these studies is that combining artificial intelligence, which includes machine learning and other advanced learning models, combining these models with compartmental models will lead to a better prediction of the spread of COVID-19. And also forecasting well, will improve when we have reliable data and when we train a model uh, in a longer time, when we have a longer training time for our predictive models. And uh, it was also observed that in India, the lockdown and social distancing were found to be effective in preventing the spread of COVID-19. And one of the limitations identified from some of the studies conducted in Asia is that there was, a, there, uh, there was delay in reporting of cases and in, inadequacy of data, which led to, uh, which affected the overall results of uh, the studies that were conducted. I go on to our uh, reports from Asia, which includes Italy, Belgium, Spain, France, Germany, United Kingdom, and Ukraine. We have the models that were used, which includes generalized linear model, Gauss error function, Monte Carlo simulation, SERG model, solvable delay model, Arima model, artificial neural networks. And some of the findings and inferences from the studies is that strict control and containment measures can, by the government can effectively limit the spread of the virus to nearby area. And then uh, collection of epidemiological data and predicting epidemic trends is very important for the development and measurement of public intervention strategies. And some of the models used in the studies conducted in Europe lacks enough data that were required for prediction. And also some of the studies conducted used uh, Chinese, or let me say Asian-based data for their prediction. And we feel it would be better to use um, um, data that is country-based, like for Europe using a Chinese data, we might not uh, get the uh, correct situation for that particular continent. And I, I moved to uh, the report from North America, including Canada, United States, Mexico, Honduras, Ecuador, and Costa Rica. The models used are listed there. Some of them include GIS-based spatial model, logistic models, SCIR model, Bayesian logistic growth model, and others. And the findings from these studies, uh, some of the findings from the studies include uh, that Active social distancing would help in maintaining the health system capacity. And also COVID-19 outbreak is controllable in the future if there is comprehensive and stringent control measures taken. Then in some of the models that made use of uh, logistic models and their, and their variants, we discovered that logistic models are proven to be very effective in prediction, like one of the studies that took place in uh, Honduras. I go to the reports from South America, including Peru, Brazil, and Chile. I have the models used here, uh, cubic adjustments model, predictive variation, non-linear model, and others. And one of the major findings from South America is that, the, in fact, this is even applicable to almost all the continents. The observed values, uh, predict prediction values, greatly differ from the predicted ones. That is, uh, the whatever is being done during uh, prediction, during modeling, is quite different from what we have in existence. For instance, in Peru, the number of cases was expected to peak at around 13,000 affected pe uh, people around April 2020, with uh, 612 total number of deaths. But as of the time of this review, around 29th April 2020, the number of cases was already much more than was predicted, which was up to 31,190, which was two times the predicted peak. So, and also one of the findings, one of the inferences made is that early relaxation of the ongoing isolation measures would lead to increase in millions of infections in a very short period of time. 
And uh, the second to the last here is a report from Africa. We have some um, models that were used. And the findings is that very few studies, as at the time of this review, were carried out in Africa. We only had very few from Nigeria, South Africa, Ghana, Senegal, and uh, Rwanda. And uh, one of the uh, inferences made is that a combination of uh, the containment measures and mitigation measures have resulted in a slowdown in the spread of the severity of COVID-19, particularly in South Africa. And it has been claimed that the virus will spread more slowly in Africa due to the warm climatic condition. Finally, uh, I go to the continental report for Australia. Yeah. Can okay. you just... Okay, I'll just I will just wrap up with this table. We have I, I have a table showing uh, the uh, the percentage of the summary of the model distribution. We have that uh, one thing we can infer here is that most of the articles used are compartmental epidemiological models, the SIR and its families, while very few use the time series based models and other advanced uh, learning models like deep learning and others. So in conclusion, uh, the the current, uh, there's a need to explore more intelligent techniques that has the ability to learn from the current COVID-19 data for a more, more accurate prediction globally. And then there's a need to generate more reliable and quality data to get more uh, accurate predictions. And then people should use uh, data that are more relevant to their countries or continents during the research so that we can get more accurate research and then time series modeling, deep learning models, and other machine learning models should be considered for future and more accurate predictions. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, sharing with us your research. Okay, I'm changing my, uh, the, my schedule actually, uh, and uh, the next talk, the final talk, uh, when I check the schedule, uh, will be given by Mr. Uh, Sobefun, from Federal University of Technology as well. And uh, he will talk about uh, the modeling of complex growth processes in application to the COVID-19 pandemic. Okay. Uh, then he already shared with us the screen. Okay. Uh, please try to complete uh, your talk in 10 minutes. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Okay, hello everyone. Yeah. Uh, my name is Oliwa Shek um, I'm glad to be here today. Okay, I'll be talking on the N logistic sigmoid modeling for complex growth processes in application to the COVID 19 pandemic. And so, my outline for this talk so first starts with the background story, then we'll move forward to the um, N, -logist N logistic sigmoid function pipeline, then the logistic curve metrics, and then application to the COVID 19 pandemic before we conclude this talk. Okay, and so first we start with some background story about growth processes. Um, the logistic function has been applied to model a whole wide range of growth processes in the world, such as population, epidemics, and so on and so forth. But some background first, exponential growth. What does exponential growth tell us about growth? It tells us that growth is unrestricted, infinite in two dimensions. And when I say two dimension, um, you can refer to that as the input and outputs, or the x-axis and the y-axis. And so enters logistic growth, the traditional logistic growth as we know it. Traditional logistic growth tells us that growth is actually restricted in only one dimension. And it leaves the, the other dimension, which is the input, or which we can also call time, it leaves it un, as unrestricted. And this particular trend has continued um, to a lot of recent works that have applied the logistic function for modeling um, a, a whole wide range of processes such as COVID-19. So we identified three limitations. And, and the first thing, the first and the key main idea there is that the logistic growth does not reflect reality if the, the X axis, the input axis, is actually um, left unrestricted, un unrestricted. And the second limitation there is that because of this um, um, infinite um, sense, a lot of authors have actually proposed other models and the other logistic models, we have the Richard models, we have the hyperbolastic models. And the, the, main, the main idea behind these models is that the logistic function cannot model asymmetric growth. But how true is this? Well, the third limitation we actually um, discovered is that instead of having one, one logistic growth, we could actually have multiple logistic growth. And this idea can be traced as far back as 1927. 
to um, to read and pill. Yeah. Okay. So um, in reality, what really happens? What is the real um, real state of things that um, as regards logistic growth? The real state of things in reality is that nothing is infinite. Everything has a time cycle, and so growth actually should be restricted in two dimensions: the input and the output. And the scientific basis for this can be found in um, Berenice 2011, uh, which said logistic function can actually describe uh, a whole lot of natural occurring processes. So in this work, we set out to do three things, retain the simplicity of the original logistic function definition, um, provide a more unified definition, and then um, improve the, the modeling power of the logistic function. And so in this talk, I'll present the logistic function definition. Then we'll move forward to two characteristic metrics of the logistic curve that can actually give us robust free time projected measures on the, the state of a good process. The interesting thing about this is that a lot of works actually use some usual production number. Some actually use the logistic function to estimate the end of the COVID-19 pandemic. But we, on the contrary, we beg to differ that prediction is a risky business. And so instead of um, actually engaging in this, we can actually use this, um, the, this particular function to actually monitor what is actually happening on the two-dimensional axis. And so, at the end of the day, we apply this to the COVID-19 pandemic. Yeah, okay. And so I will illustrate the end logistics segment definition because the definition is actually lengthy. And so the 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 the, the, the end logistics segment function pipeline is actually a neural network. On the left, um, the, we have a single input, single output form, and on the right, we have the multiple input, multi, multiple input, multiple output form. Now, the single input, single output form is the is the core actually because that is what is inside the multiple multiple input, multiple output form. And so we, we provide definitions that you can see here for the inputs, the, for the, the relation between the input and outputs, the derivative. And we also give um, definitions, more unified definitions for the partial derivatives for each layer, the logistic layer and the weighted layer. I'll go back to actually describe what is actually going on here. For the early logistic point pipeline, we actually have two layers, two hidden layers, no matter how, depending on how we call it. So the first one is the weighted input layer. Then the second one is the unweighted um, logistic layer. For the single input, single output network, which will be applying to the COVID-19 pandemic um, in this work, we're actually using only the, the logistic layer instead of the, the more advanced uh, multiple input, multiple output network. So as I said earlier, we, uh, in our definition, we provided um, partial derivatives for each of the layers. And these partial derivatives are actually useful because when we are performing data pitting or whether we call it regression, um, the optimization algorithm for that is actually key in searching for parameters. And most of the time, they actually need this, um, these gradients to actually perform um, learning and optimization. Okay, so logistic curve metrics. And so what do we actually mean about this logistic curve metrics? Well, what we're actually trying to um, infer here is that for a, for a growth process that is being modeled, we can actually monitor what is going on along the two-dimensional two axis, along the x-axis and along the y-axis. And along the y-axis, we have the y variable to inflection ratio as a metric. And the y there can mean infections, it can mean population, it can mean deaths. But that is the actual phenomenon we're actually modeling. And it's useful for indicating the rate of incident increase or decrease at a particular point in time. If it's 0 0.5, then we know that at a particular point in time, we've actually reached a peak point. If it's less than 0 0.5, then we know that the, the phenomena we are modeling is still increasing. If it's greater than 0 0.5, we know that this phenomena that we're actually modeling is as I actually started reducing. And in the same way, we have the X variable to inflection ratio, which is the XIR. And so we we um, we we signify two different um, growth processes: the growing process and the decaying process. And so either of them, this is actually XIR is used for indicating how far at a particular point we are from the reflection point. And one thing I have not stated earlier before is that the logistic function is just a story of inflection point limits, and we can also look at this inflection point as minimum uh, minimum limits and actually maximum limits. And so. We apply this, um, having defined this, we apply it to um, the COVID-19 pandemic and we actually um, look at our results. Okay, and so our data source was from the World Health Organization and the last time it was updated um, um, according to our, our own local data that we actually downloaded was the 30th in November 2020. And so this modeling is correct to 30th in November 2020. We want to find out what is actually happening at this particular point in time. And so we developed a optimization workflow in MATLAB and the first thing, the first procedure was find the inflection point. After finding the inflection point, pass it as the initial guess to a convex optimization server, which can be a non-linear least square solution, and then apply um, bootstrap method to find the 95% combinance intervals on the, on the on the logistic curve matrix. And so um, our model applied to the world. This, this was our results. 
Um, looking at this, um, looking at the, at the figures here, on the left, we have the infections for the COVID-19, the, the total cumulative COVID-19 um, infections in the world to date. And on the right, we have the total deaths of COVID-19 infections to date. And from what we can see here, you can easily observe that we, have a, we, have, we actually have a very perfect fit. And, but what can we actually understand from what is happening? Now, instead of making predictions on whether um, the COVID-19 pandemic is getting to an end, we can actually monitor what is actually happening, as I said earlier, on the, on the two-dimensional axis, the y-axis and the x-axis. And here, the x-axis for the infections is actually the time, the time to infection ratio. Why the y -R is the infections to infection ratio. And here, uh, for the deaths, is the death to infection ratio. Now, looking at these two metrics, we see that we actually have almost similar um, uh, similar rooms, 0 0.53, 0 0.54, 1.09, and 0 0.97. So what does it really mean? Now, for the infections to infection ratio being 0 0.53, we can easily infer from this point that at this particular point, the, the total number of inf infections um, in the world has actually started decreasing at the 30th of November um, 2020. And from the XIR, we have 1.09. Um, it's actually greater than one. And so at this point, we know that we are actually entering a post-peak period for this current stage, it doesn't tell us whether probably um, the COVID-19 pandemic has gotten to an end. But for this particular point of inflection, we've actually entered a post-peak period. And the same thing can also apply to the death, to the, to the death data. And so with this particular um, um, astonishing result, we actually decided to extend this to see whether we can actually um, get similar um, level of, um, of fit with, uh, with country monitors. And so we applied, we selected a, um, a range of countries um, along different continents. And so we first start with Europe. So this yeah. is the um, fit for the United Kingdom. It yeah. will, Excuse France. me, can you try to uh, finalize uh, yeah. short please? Turkey, um, Russia, China, Japan, South Korea, India, Israel, UAE, so on and so USA, this is for USA, Canada, Australia, Cuba, Mexico, um, Brazil, and in Africa, we have Nigeria, Ghana, Egypt, um, South Africa, Zimbabwe, and last, Kenya. And so um, the goodness of it, you can see um, from, the, from the figures, all, all gave us um, around the range of 99.99%. So that's to show that and we had a very perfect fit. And we actually also use this to actually monitor what is actually happening using the YR and the XIR. And so conclusions, we've actually presented an extended definition for the logistic model. And we've actually shown that it can actually be used used to model um, a rich range of uh, complex growth um, processes in the world. And our, in the application to the COVID-19 pandemic, our, our fit was in the range of 99.99%. And I, I guess this, this is probably the state of the art results um, in, the, in this particular domain. And so we strongly believe the end of this sigmoid function uh, can actually increase the value of the logistic sigmoid as an indispensable modeling tool in many areas of biomedical research, epidemiology, and other scientific and engineering disciplines. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. Yeah, we thank you a lot for your presentation on sharing with us your work. Uh, I may have missed an update in the schedule. Uh, now um, I see uh, Dr. Oladipo uh, from the Laboratory of Molecular Biology, Immunology and Bioinformatics. Uh, Department of Microbiology at the Lekin University uh, in Nigeria. And uh, Dr. Oladipo will uh, talk about uh, vaccine against COVID-19. Sorry for missing that. And if you are available, uh, can we uh, uh, hear your talk? Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, very great. Uh, I'm so grateful for giving me the privilege to make this presentation and I'll try to make it as fast as possible. Uh, how about discussing on the exploration of SOFI's uh, glycoprotein to design multiple peptide vaccine against uh, COVID-19? This work is an ongoing project and there is a, a brief introduction about uh, COVID-19, how it came up in December 2019. And the first case was announced on 27 of February, 2020. 
and by March 11, it was classified as pandemic by WHO. And presently, we have more than 45 million cases worldwide and 1.19 million fatality rates. Uh, this is just a global epidemiology of uh, COVID-19 in the part of the world. Then there comes, there should be a solution, and solution is into perspective. It's either we have drugs or we have vaccines. And Dr. Fauci once said that there is a global need for a vaccine, and the wide geographic diversity of pandemic require more than one effective vaccine approach. Collaboration will be essential, and the full development of partridge and effective vaccine of SARS-CoV-2 will require that industry, government, academic collaborate in office in the way and adding to their strength. Based on this, we try to work out and so that vaccination is the most effective approach towards prevention of infectious disease. And the pandemic have set up an unprecedented risk to develop a community vaccine to match and in the history of vaccine research. So what we did was that st studies have shown that the spike-like protein are more important protein for a subunit vaccine. Now, currently we have more than 100 can be vaccine development worldwide. And there are some factors that do affect vaccine, either race, ethnicity, geographic, et cetera, are uh, been shown to affect vaccine responsiveness. So one of the things that prompt our research group into this research is that rotavirus vaccine efficacy is considerably lower in Africa as compared to Europe and North America, and has been attributed to post-genomic, particularly mutation in genes involved in the immune response and to the receptors and ligand. We can see this data was generated through a friend of mine to Okon, uh, seeing the distribution of SARS-CoV-2 lineage in Africa country. And studies have shown that we have different lineages of uh, COVID, uh, SARS-CoV-2 circulating worldwide, whereby we are now concentrating on developing a vaccine of African sequence origin. And throughout the study period, then we work on Nigeria, Senegal, Republic of Congo, South Africa, Gambia, Egypt, Ghana, and Tunisia. So, and we use the reference as sequence of one isolate as our reference for annotation of the uh, sequences that we got. And from there, this is just a graphical representation of what we do. We retrieve, we annotate, we test for uh, antigenicity. Uh, then later we move on to epitope prediction. We construct multiple tope and we do in silico uh, cloning. But throughout the process, we're able to get uh, 1,416 B cells. Uh, 224 CTL and 460 TFR cells. And the FMF vaccine was constructed uh, with adjunct, adjuvant added to it. And the vaccine was non allergic but antigenic. This is just the, chemi uh, the structure, the tetra structure of the vaccine construct. And this is that the disulfide engineering that was done. And we have the B cell epitope of the final vaccine construct. And we tried to do the molecular docking for TLR. We ju I just selected some TLRs. For this presentation purpose, this is for TL2, we have for 3 3 we have for TRN9, and all the, the vaccine construct binded to these uh, two like receptors. Then we did in sequel cloning into a vector for the expression. And immune simulation also was done to see how our vaccine will produce antibodies when given to people. And we have a fantastic result from it. This is the IgG and IgM in the different classes of IgG. We have the production of T lymphocytes in terms of days, and we have a T heparin lymphocytes that we also produce, seeing the active one that were more than the resting and duplicating one. Then we have the natural killer cells, and we know natural killer cells are necessary for killing of viruses in our immune cells. They were also produced in respective number of days. Then for the expression system, knowing the nature of our, our country. We partner with JetScript in US where the protein expression and scaling up was done. And we tried to get animal trial proven to ethical approval. And these are the pieces of where we are. And currently we've gotten the ethical approval for the animal trial in which the animal trial will commence for any now. This is one of the um, publications that was published. We have other two that have been accepted awaiting publications. And this is just a prototype the, the, the mechanism or action of the prototype of the vaccine we are talking about are uh, it's been taken over acting the presenting cells, move on to B cells and to secrete the antibodies and move on to TFR cells, having cytotoxic and destroying cells infected by the virus. 
And this work is a combination of work from people from Ladoka University of Technology, Olusha Gwagagu, we have University of Loring, Quantum University, Precious Corners University of Ibadan, uh, University of Lagos, and Elix Virgin Consort. Uh, these are the team members, the students that are doing work in the lab uh, at Ogumosho at Elix Virgin Consort. Then we have the key members because the, the team is interdisciplinary and interinstitution uh, team members of different disciplines coming together. Uh, we have one of the vaccine tracker that track our vaccine candidates. As I'm talking now, this vaccine candidate I'm presenting now is part of the WHO, is on the WHO draft list for vaccine candidates. Yeah, we have a Nigerian, we are from Nigeria, and I think another one is from Senegal, from Africa. This is one of the representatives of the Nigeria Partner Development Center that this came from Abuja, from our state capital, to meet us in the lab and see actually what we are doing and see how far they can collaborate with us. Thank you for listening. Thanks a lot for your work and presentation. Uh, I think this is the end of the first session um, in the uh, conference. Uh, thanks uh, for all the participants, for your contribution, for your uh, participation. Maybe I can return to you, Bolanne, for the next session. Okay, thanks a lot again. Yes. Thank you. Um, I, I'm trying to check if we still have uh, some uh, five minutes. I'm, I'm trying to check if we still have some five minutes to, um, instead of the question and answer, to allow Professor Olabode to round up uh, because he had network issue the other time. Is he around here? Are you hearing me, please? Hello, is anyone hearing me? Yes, we yes, can hear, you. hear you. Okay, yes, I want to ask Professor Labode who he had a break because of network issue the other time. If he is around to round up in three minutes to round up his talk, is he around? Okay, maybe he's not here. He's here, okay. I think he can come up now. Prof, are you here? Is it? Okay, I'm around. Can you round up your talk in three minutes? Okay, Thank you. let me just. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, what I was trying to say is that we are trying to use um, the, the, mach the assembled machine learning approach to diagnose uh, the COVID. So we have used about five learning algorithms. We have used a uh, support vector machines. We have used them. Um, um, the convolutional network. We have used the um, naive base, you know, and we have used the bagging technique of uh, the assembly technique of uh, bagging and aggregation. So we have proposed two sources of data: one from the one from the uh, GitHub, and the one to be locally sourced from uh, three different translation centers. So. The are you with me now? Huh? Yeah. Yes, we are. Yes, I want to share my my slides, but I don't. I'm not. Just a minute. Okay, so the architecture of uh, what we intend to do is can be described here. We have one, two, three, five algorithms to be combined uh, by using the backing and the voting system. So each of these algorithm will be used uh, will be used to train using the two sources of data, and then the result will go to the backing and the aggregation. 
So the results after presentation, after prediction and uh, classification will be presented here. And uh, we have uh, decided to use the X-ray, the X-ray imaging because of some of the characteristics that are present in the X-ray. You know, the previous method that have been used is so expensive and it's not easy to come by. But with X-ray, you know, most of the hospitals they have X-rays and can really be, you know, obtained by patients within few minutes. And if you're able to capture this digitally, you can put it in the systems for analysis. Some of the characteristics that are present in the X-ray that can help in the classifications include what I listed here from A to uh, H. That is the presence of glass, grand glass of the, uh, opacity, the presence of uh, consolidation, consolidation, the number of lobes affected, you know, and et cetera. These are some of the characteristics when you analyze can help us to diagnose whether a patient, a patient is uh, actually COVID patients or not. And then with this, we can also classify uh, the severity level of the COVID patient, whether it is mild, it is uh, severe, it is very severe. So that, you know, every level of severity has its own uh, therapy treatments. So if it's still mild, it can sometimes Without treatments, the email can go, but it is very severe. Then one will have to apply the very vigorous uh, therapy. So these are the things we have in mind to do. You know, it's actually a proposed work. Uh, I have uh, the expected result is that at the end of the day, we're going to, you know, come up with an enhanced uh, assembled machine learning systems that encompasses all the algorithm that are stated below to determine the severity level of COVID patients. Thank you very much. Hello, thank you. Thank you, Prof, for the, uh, completing your presentation. Um, the, those who have questions can still use a QH chat box to ask their questions and the, the speakers will respond to them. Uh, because of our time, we won't be able to do any networking uh, or the, neither would we be able to do the break now. We go straight away to the plenary session one because many of us, our speakers are time conscious and uh, they, they are already waiting. We have this plenary session is a special one because we have all professors here presenting at this session. So those of us who are here, we should uh, sit tight and be ready to um, listen to um, top eminent scientists who want to offer us some important theoretical concepts of data science and other applications. We have three of them in, that, in, in this session. Professor Carlos Suhelu from the Department of the Computacion in uh, Mexico. Uh, our, our professor is an eminent uh, distinguished scientist in the area of evolutionary multi-objective optimization. So he wants to speak with us from his wealth of experience in this field of computing. Over to you, Professor Carlos Sohelo, while we wait for the other professors in the session. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna share my screen. Yes, you can. Let me see. Can you see my screen there? Yes. Okay. Then I'm ready to, to start. Well, uh, First of all, thank you for the uh, invitation. It's a pleasure for me to give this talk on, on an area in which I have been working for about 26 years, and it's called evolutionary multi-objective optimization. So I I'm gonna give you first a very short introduction to what EMO is. Uh, basically, uh, we have to understand first the difference between traditional uh, global optimization and multi-objective optimization. In multi-objective optimization, the aim 
is to solve problems that have two or more objectives, but that they are defined in such a way that at least some of these objectives are conflicting with each other. So for example, I, I would like to design a bridge. I want the bridge to be as safe as possible, but at the same time, I would like the bridge to be as inexpensive as possible. Normally, uh, if you want the bridge to be safer, you have to reinforce the structure, which means you have to spend more money. And vice versa, if you want to uh, save some money, you have to make a lighter structure. So this is a good example of a, of a multi-objective problem, which is defined this way. This is the, uh, the traditional uh, formal definition. We have K objectives where K is greater or equal than two that we aim to optimize simultaneously. And we wanna find a, a, a vector of decision variable that satisfy a, a number of constraints. We may have inequality and equality constraints. And basically the, the main problem here, the main difficulty has to do with the conflict. Since we have conflicting objectives, this makes this problem ill-defined. This is, it becomes really interesting. So the first issue in multi-objective optimization is how to define optimality. Optimality in the traditional way is, is kind of intuitive, is straightforward, but in multi-objective optimization, there are several definitions of optimality. The most commonly used refers to finding the best possible trade-offs. This notion was originally proposed by a professor at the University of Oxford, Francis Isidro Edgeworth, in his book entitled Mathematical Psychics in 1881. However, it was uh, the Italian economist Wilfredo Pareto in 1896 who generalized this notion in a book called Cours d'Economie Politique, published in French, which at that time was the language of science. So, uh, and he called it Ophelinity, is pretty much the same definition given by Edgeworth. However, uh, Pareto was not aware of the work that had been done before by uh, Edgeworth. The notion is, is very simple to define. If we assume that all the objectives need to be minimized, and this is always possible because if some of them have to be minimized and others have to be maximized, it's always possible to do a transformation. So if all of them are, are, are to be minimized, the definition of Pareto optimality says that a vector of decision variables that is feasible, that means it satisfies all the constraints of the problem, is considered Pareto optimal if these two conditions hold, that there is no other feasible solution such that is less equal in every objective and strictly less in at least one. There are variations of this definition. For example, if I uh, remove the second condition, I only require the, the less equal. This is called weak optimality and generates more solutions than Pareto optimality. If I do the opposite, I, I remove the first and I only keep the second, the strict uh, less, then this is called a strong optimality and generates less solutions than Pareto optimality. So this definition, basically what it says is that a solution is considered to be Pareto optimal if I cannot generate a solution that improves any of the objectives without worsening another one. So these solutions, since we get a set, uh, constitute what we call the Pareto optimal set. We will get a set because of the conflicting objectives. And the vectors contained in this set are said to be non-dominated, but because of tradition, most people call them non-dominated solutions, which is mathematically is not correct, but everybody uses the term. And the image, that means the objective function values that correspond to the contents of the Pareto optimal set is called the Pareto front. Of course, uh, evolutionary algorithms or meta heuristics were not the first option to solve multi-objective optimization problems since these problems are very old. So multi-objective optimization as a research area started at around 1970 uh, in uh, operations research as a branch of mathematical programming. Of course, there are different types of multi-objective optimization problems. 
Uh, in this talk, I am referring mostly to nonlinear multi-objective optimization, but there is also linear multi-objective and there is also combinatorial multi-objective optimization. In mathematical programming for nonlinear multi-objective optimization, there are a number of techniques. I will say about 30 families. It's not really algorithms, it's families of algorithms. And these algorithms are very efficient. They're very fast. However, they have several limitations. The main ones are that they normally generate a single element of the Pareto optimal set for each, each execution. And if you execute the algorithm several times, starting from different starting points, there is no guarantee that at the end you will find a different solution. So this may require many different restarts of these algorithms. Also, these algorithms are very sensitive to the shape and the continuity of the Pareto front. For example, they don't work in many cases when the front, the Pareto front is disconnected or is non-convex, when it's concave. The idea of using uh, techniques based on the emulation of the mechanism of natural selections to solve problems is, is very old. Uh, some people trace it back to the 1930s, some people like David Fogel. But it was really in the 1960s when the three main evolutionary algorithms were developed. Genetic algorithms were introduced by John Holland in 1962. Evolution strategies were introduced by Ingo uh, Rehenberg and Hans Paul Schoeffel in 19. 65, an evolutionary programming was introduced by Lawrence Fogel between 1960 and 1966. Today, we all, we call them collectively evolutionary algorithms. These are stochastic search techniques that try to simulate the process of natural evolution by imposing a selection of solutions based on fitness values. That's the main idea in, with this algorithm. Evolutionary algorithms seem particularly suitable for solving multi-objective optimization problems, mainly because of two reasons. The first is they can deal sim simultaneously with several solutions, with a set of solutions. This is called the population of the evolutionary algorithm. So this allows us, in case we can properly manipulate the population, to generate several members of or elements of the Pareto optimal set in a single run, instead of having to perform several restarts as it is required with mathematical programming techniques. Additionally, evolutionary algorithms are less sensitive to the shape or continuity of the Pareto front. They don't require information such as the derivative of the objectives and the constraints. So they are more general in a sense. That doesn't mean they are always effective, of course. They also have limitations. The main limitation has to do with computational cost because uh, they require a sampling of the search space. And this sampling requires evaluating a certain number of solutions, which in some applications may be unaffordable, may be too costly to do. So, uh, considering multi-objective evolutionary algorithms, I'm going to show a very simple taxonomy starting from the old days. The old days is from the, the origins of multi-objective evolutionary algorithms. They started in 1985 to the early 90s. This is uh, the naive uh, era of uh, multi-objective optimization using evolutionary algorithms. We, so there were the non-knowns. These are non elitist non-Pareto-based uh, methods. That means they do not incorporate the notion of Pareto optimality in the selection mechanism, and they don't retain the non-dominant solutions generated at each generation, at each iteration. Uh, they don't keep these solutions, which theoretically is a problem because they don't, they cannot really guarantee performance. So these are normally very simple algorithms like lexicographic ordering in which we uh, optimize one objective at a time or linear aggregating functions in which we add all the uh, objectives into a single value. So we transform a vector optimization problem into uh, a scalar optimization problem. Vega was actually the first a multi-objective evolutionary algorithm originally uh, introduced in 1984 in the PhD thesis of David Schaefer and published in 1985. I'm not going to get into details on how it works, but it's a very, uh, very simple approach that splits the population into subpopulations. 
And there are others like the epsilon constraint and the so-called target vector approaches, which can be seen as non-linear aggregating functions. And but you need to define goals for each of the objectives. That means you need to have an idea of what values are you trying to, to obtain for each objective. Then from the early 90s to the mid 90s is when real research in this field started. Uh, these are the so-called non-elitist Pareto-based methods. These methods already incorporate the notion of Pareto optimality in their selection mechanism. However, they still don't use in a generalized way the notion of elitism, of retaining non-dominated solutions. So we have pure Pareto ranking. This is an idea that was introduced by David Goldberg in his famous book on genetic algorithms from 1989. It's basically a procedure for ranking or sorting the population based on Pareto optimality, such that solutions that are Pareto optimal get the best possible fitness and all the other solutions will get uh, an inferior fitness value, which is proportional to their level of dominance. The more solutions that dominate them, the lower their fitness value. That's really the idea of Pareto ranking, which has been adopted in different forms in the old days by algorithms like MOGA, proposed by Carlos Fonseca and Peter Fleming, NSGA, proposed by Kalja Moidev in 1994, MPGA, proposed by Jeffrey Hoare. And there was also an MPGA2, but MPGA2 is, is a small and simple variation of MPGA1. Then we have what I call the contemporary approaches. These are more elaborate algorithms. Uh, some of these algorithms were the outcome of a PhD thesis. Uh, for example, the case of the strength Pareto evolutionary algorithm that was introduced by Eckhart Sitzler in 1998, although the journal version was published in 1999. Um, there was a, a SPA2, but this version is also uh, some sort of upgrade to the original version because the original one had some problems. Then very famous, the NSGA2 introduced originally in the year 2000 in a conference, but uh, the most uh, cited reference is the journal version published in 2002. And there are of course many others, including some algorithms that we have developed in my research group, like the microgenetic algorithm for uh, multi-objective optimization and the, uh, the, uh, the second version, which is fully self-adapted. That means no parameters are required. The recent approaches, these are approaches that belong to a third wave of algorithms in which uh, there are other alternatives to perform selection, not only Pareto optimality. So these are very interesting algorithms and, and many people are using them today. So we have, for example, Moia D, which is based on decomposition. Uh, decomposition uh, consists in transforming a multi-objective optimization problem into several single objective optimization problems that are solved simultaneously. Then we have a family called indicator-based approaches in which instead of using Pareto optimality, we use a performance indicator to, to perform selection. There are algorithms such as SMS, MOA, HIP, and many others, IBEA, IBEA, many other algorithms based on this idea. And then we have NSGA3 and its many variants. NSGA3 is really based on reference vectors, so it can be seen like decomposition. It's not really a new family of algorithms. So in general, modern multi-objective evolutionary algorithms consist of two basic components. A selection mechanism that is not based on fitness, but it incorporates Pareto optimality. Some of these algorithms, they do use uh, fitness values, but the fitness is computed based on Pareto optimality. The second component is not, you cannot find it in traditional evolutionary algorithms. This is a very interesting component. It's called the density estimator and is responsible for maintaining diversity in the population, which keeps the, uh, the algorithm from converging to a single solution. Uh, today, we can identify three main families or types of multi-objective evolutionary algorithms that people are still using. So the first is the oldest one, the Pareto-based multi-objective evolutionary algorithms in which selection is based on Pareto optimality. 
Most of them adopt something that is called non-dominated sorting. This is the ranking procedure to select solutions. And there is a wide variety of density estimators. I will show you on a slide later on. Uh, but uh, these are some of the names of the techniques that have been used. The main limitation of Pareto-based multi-objective evolutionary algorithms has to do with the scalability in, in objective function space. That means as you increase the number of objectives, these algorithms become less reliable. Why? Because uh, in these cases, Pareto optimality is not good enough to identify solutions. Because as you increase the number of objectives, if you don't increase exponentially the population size, then first the population is not large enough to sample the search space and, and generate a sufficient number of non-dominant solutions, but also most of the solutions will be non-dominant because the, the uh, Pareto optimality relation is too orthogonal. Uh, it is possible, of course, to change the density estimator and most of these algorithms still work, but not that many people like to do that. Second family, the composition base, I already mentioned. In this case, you transform a multi-objective problem into several single objective optimization problems, which are optimized simultaneously by using uh, neighborhood search. That means uh, some individuals are exploring not only their own uh, single ob objective optimization, but also looking at the neighbors that surround them when doing the optimization. So these algorithms are very efficient. Unlike Pareto-based approaches, these algorithms are scalable. They can be used with more objectives. However, they still require a larger population size. Although in this case, the increase in size is not exponential, it's normally linear, uh, but it may be required to have a considerably large population size, not thousands, but perhaps hundreds of solutions, depending on how many objectives you have. And they have other limitations. Uh, it was found relatively recently that one of the limitations they have is the shape of the Pareto flow, that uh, they don't work with certain shapes. Finally, we have the indicator base. This is a very interesting family. In this case, the idea, as I said before, is to use a performance indicator to select solutions instead of using Pareto optimality or instead of using decomposition. However, some indicator-based algorithms use decomposition as well. The problem here is, this is a very intriguing, very interesting idea, but the problem is we only know one performance indicator which is fully Pareto compliant. And it is very expensive, it's called the hyperbole. There are other performance indicators that are what we call weakly Pareto compliant, but, um, for some reason, researchers don't seem to like them too much. In practice, they are not that bad. Most of them work reasonably well, but they are not very popular. For density estimators, as I mentioned before, there have been many different proposals. These are the, the most commonly adopted today, going from fitness sharing, which is one of the oldest. This is a scalable, same as clustering. Other approaches are not scalable. For example, the adaptive grids, which is some sort of geographical map in which you locate solutions. A crowding also is not scalable. Performance indicators are scalable. Uh, parallel coordinates, this is one we proposed some years ago in 2016. This one is scalable. And this, uh, I always like to, to show this, this graph uh, that shows the number of publications per year in the field. This tells you about the growth of the field. So you can see that it started in 1984 with the PhD thesis of David Schaefer. Uh, I got my PhD in 96. And at that time, uh, very few people were doing emo. We actually knew each other, like for example, Carlos Fonseca, Jeffrey Horn, very few people. However, in, in, very, uh, in a very short time, like uh, for example, by the year 2009, 2010, you can see a very, very large number of publications per year. Actually, we have reached more than 1,000 publications a year. When I got my PhD, my thesis was probably number five in the field, but today there are more than 300, probably more than 400 PhD theses on EMO that we, that we know of, there may be no more. 
In the in recent years, some people sometimes ask me if there has been a decrease in the number of publications on emo because the bars are getting smaller, but there is no decrease. It's a decrease in my time, the time available for me to update this, this graph, but uh, there is still a lot of interest. So very quickly, I will go through a few applications not specific to big data. These are applications in general that can give you a broader idea of the, the many uses of IMO. IMO has been used for uh, also for big data and, and for other applications related to uh, modeling diseases and so on, but these are more general. So the first is a, a proposal to assist architects in the design of a particular space. So the idea here is to learn heuristic rules uh, on building a special uh, design by using uh, a data mining on results generated by a multi-objective evolutionary algorithm. It's a very interesting uh, proposal in which the human benefits from the solutions generated by an evolutionary algorithm to try to learn a little bit about the best design practices for optimizing certain um, objectives. In this case, for example, the uh, structural or thermal performance of the specific architectural space. This was done in the Netherlands. The second one, uh, it's uh, also very interesting uh, application in medicine. Uh, these guys in, in UK, they use multi a multi-objective meta heuristic to optimize the intensity modulated radiation therapy for cancer treatment. So in this case, the idea is to uh, uh, find a set of dose distributions that depending on the prescription and the preferences given by the physician uh, can be selected as the preferred treatment for a patient. So these treatments have to be very specific. And in this case, they are using multi-objective optimization to help the physician to find the best possible treatment. Uh, the, uh, the next one, is one in software engineering. This is for a company that develops software. And in this case, Moia D, uh, an algorithm that I already described, uh, uh, is extended uh, to solve software project portfolio optimization problems. In this case, the company has a set of projects. They don't know on which ones they, it is worth investing money because they have a limited budget. And the idea is to use the uh, multi-objective evolutionary algorithm to decide which are the projects in, in which is worth investing to maximize a uh, return with limited resources. And of course, these are problems in which there are many, many constraints like uh, related to marketing, to uh, distribution channels and so on. This was done in China. And the last one, uh, uh, this one is from India. Uh, it's an application of another meta heuristic. It's not an evolutionary algorithm, the multi objective and colony optimization for solving gas transportation problems. In this case, the idea is to minimize fuel consumption and, and maximize in throughput. That means the efficiency in transporting gas. So, in this case, they, they propose this approach for optimizing the operation of a, a pipeline. Uh, network and and it's also this is a real world application it's also a, another very interesting application in all these cases you can see the objectives are really conflicting because improving one normally worsens uh, the other one so in terms of research what we do in this area besides developing algorithms which is what we do in my research group is uh, we're interested, for example, in uh, hybrids between multi-objective evolutionary algorithms and mathematical primary techniques, for example, gradient-based methods, but it could be also direct search methods. We have a lot of interest on surrogate and parallel uh, implementation techniques to deal with very expensive objective functions, for example, those found in uh, some applications in bioinformatics, in aeronautical engineering, and so on. There are, of course, people developing many applications in different fields, and there are many other research topics. I won't get into them because they are a bit uh, more specific, more specialized. Uh, some of the challenges uh, involve, for example, solving problems, having a very large number of decision variables. For example, what if we have 10,000 decision variables? Can we solve a problem like that? Uh, also, for example, 
combining different operators and algorithmic components, selection, uh, crossover, mutation, and so on, to produce tailored multi-objective evolutionary algorithms that are highly competitive for a particular application. Of course, for us to be able to produce something like this, it's necessary to do uh, a lot of, uh, uh, to perform lots of experiments combining these components. So this may require a lot of computational resources, but there are already approaches like this. There is one called Borg, developed by a guy at Cornell. And, and there are many other questions, for example, related to density estimators in high dimensional objective uh, search space, objective function spaces. What happens uh, regarding diversity? We have 10 objectives. So if you are interested in this topic, you are welcome to visit the EMOR repository, which very quickly I will show you. It contains more than 12,000 uh, bibliographic ref references, including more than 300 PhD theses and more than 6,000 journal papers. You can also find public domain software in different programming languages in C, C++, Java, Python, MATLAB, and so on. And even some platform, like there, there is one called PlatEMO that contains more than 100 multi-objective evolutionary algorithms already implemented, and you can get it for free. So that's all from my side. And if we still have time, I'm open for any questions. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Professor Carlos. So hello for that very comprehensive uh, and educative lecture. I have asked uh, the participants if there's anyone who has a question to raise his or her hand so that you'll be able to answer them. Does anyone have a question for Prof? He has uh, actually dissected <laughs> most <laughs> the objective optimization. <laughs> yeah, somebody asked about my slides. Uh, actually, I sent you already my slides, so you are free to share them. If Yes, okay. getting my we'll, slides, we'll, or they we'll can send me that. an email as well. I All will right. uh, type my email. Okay, sir. Thank you very much, Prof. Thank you. So we want to listen to the next speaker in the person of Professor Fernando Buak from the uh, Computer Engineering Program in the School of Engineering of University of Pernambuco in Brazil. Prof Professor Fernando is uh, a Brazilian, but with many, several international affiliations. He's uh, a vast man in, in his field of artificial intelligence. And uh, this afternoon, he will be speaking to us on curbing the data volume and combinatorial complexity on gene regulatory networks with SWARM intelligence. Let's uh, listen to Prof. Welcome on board. Thank you. Hi, Bolandi. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a real pleasure to, to be with you all here. And also uh, after a, a, a magnificent talk from Carlos, uh, I feel humble, but let's see what I can add. Uh, so let me share the screen here. Uh, can you see my screen now? Yes, we can. Uh, but, but the presentation, the slides? Yes, we can see the slide. All right. So let me start with the title. When you, Bolandi, uh, invited me, I, I paid attention to the topic of, of the, the, the workshop. And then I, I, I thought of what could I add in terms of uh, uh, give an example of how uh, uh, computational intelligence could be effective on, on uh, problems that matter. So. I don't know how familiar uh, the audience is with gene regulatory networks and also with swarm intelligence, but the idea here is to show how this very complex problem 
can be solved in a in a, a, a non exact manner by means of using swarm intelligence. Uh, okay, so let me move on. So the agenda is the following. Basically, we have three parts. I'll try to be uh, very compact in terms of uh, uh, packing three heavy topics like GRN, swarm intelligence, especially the, the fish school search, which, which is the algorithm we created and later on was modified uh, and be part of PALAS. So that's the la latter part of my presentation, is to explain how this mixed FSS was seminal for the, the, the uh, uh, solution of GRN in a much faster way. Okay, but before that, I would like to uh, act, uh, make some uh, uh, acknowledgements here to the, the, the very uh, uh, fine invitation I received from you uh, in Akuri, from the, the TWOS uh, Young Affiliate Network. I would like to thank the current fellowship I hold from FACEP, which is the State Foundation. Uh, here in Brazil, and and uh, Alexander von Humboldt, also my universities, as uh, Bolanli mentioned, I have some uh, affiliations with Exeter, Johannesburg, uh, Münster, and Texas A&M. But I'm based in Pernambuco, uh, that's my main university. Well, uh, I come from Recife, and the reason I mention this is because uh, I, I already told that to Bolani. I am open to collaborations. And I would like to show just for a second what Recife uh, uh, is uh, about. Uh, so we are by the, the sea uh, line, and we have beautiful beaches. Recife is called the Venice of the North. And... The only problem is that it's so beautiful that some sharks now are very fond of uh, gathering here. Uh, so the beach on the right hand side uh, is full of sharks. But luckily enough, Recife in Portuguese means reef. So we have a very good understanding. They be, uh, the sharks become on one uh, uh, side of the, 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 the reefs and then the, the, the swimmers on the other one. Anyway. Uh, another interesting thing about Recife and Akuri in Nigeria is that although now we are very ap apart, uh, uh, almost 5,000 kilometers, in the past, uh, in the Jurassic period, we were together. So the, our dinosaurs, they probably could walk from Akuri to Recife in a couple of hours. So that's just to show that we have other links that than we imagine. Uh, um, before the, the the beginning as well, I would like to just mention very briefly that uh, in our group we tend to use uh, meteoristics, uh, we use computational semiotics, and we are uh, using those uh, techniques to solve uh, uh, problems in medicine, in health, in logistics, which is. Uh, health, by the way, is one of the topics of your workshop. Our uh, research group group is called SIR. We uh, we have lots of connections, and uh, Nigeria could be the next uh, uh, link we add to this network. So, but let me talk very briefly about uh, gene regulatory networks. I don't know uh, how familiar you are, but if you take problems such as uh, the airplanes taking uh, off and landing in, in one particular moment. So this animation is just uh, uh, a period of six hours and every dot is, uh, is a, a plane taking off in the US. Of course, this is an animated and uh, a fast forward version. But the reason I'm showing you this is that we live in a very complex world these days and it's uh, uh, for for the the uh, the lay person complexity may only lay uh, on the real world and the the visible one. Uh, however, uh, the problem that uh, Carlos mentioned about the curse of dimensionality is really uh, 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 real and and hard to come because uh, as 
uh, uh, the elements of the system grow, it becomes more difficult for you to make predictions or uh, optimizations, etc. So the direct impact of that is that computational costs should be tamed. Um, this gentleman here, it's called Hermes Trimagistro, was a, a, a philosopher in the Middle Ages. He had a very interesting uh, uh, thought that what happens in the macro world uh, happens in the micro world. So with this, I very uh, quickly would like to draw complexity from the visible world, like the universe, to brains and cells, okay? And this uh, brings us to another implication that scalability also must be uh, considered in this level of granularity. I don't know if you are familiar with a cell, but this is a, a nice illustration of uh, uh, Encyclopedia Britannica. Uh, a cell that seems uh, a very tiny uh, element uh, is really complex. This is just for you to see the, 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 the organs inside the cell. They are very many and they have various uh, signaling mechanisms. Uh, of course, it is nice as scientists for us to understand these processes, but the reason for that is because we may uh, uh, help to improve uh, 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 health of people if we know how these processes work. Obviously, uh, the outside of the nucleus, the nucleus is the inner, inner part of the cell, is basically to support the function of the nucleus. Okay, so here you, you have a, a, a perspective of the nucleus. All right, so you have all the, the, the chromosomes inside the nucleus, etc. But the, the, the main point of the nucleus is not necessarily to store the, the chromosome. Inside the nucleus, there is a, another structure called the nucleolus, which is responsible for the synthesis of proteins and peptides and many other compounds. So basically, within the nucleus of a cell, there is a structure that is very much works like a factory producing uh, uh, enzymes and, and all sorts of things uh, on demand. Of course, the recipes, if you like, are stored in the chromosomes. But the problem is we don't know what triggers these processes because all sorts of things emerge from here. Uh, for example, you can uh, 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 create an enzyme to fight something, for example, COVID or a virus or whatever. But the network that creates this is a sequence of event in time and space uh, that uh, it's hard to track. And, uh, if we master this, for example, we could have in the future cure for cancer and uh, big things like that. All right. So if you would like to see more, uh, I separated here some uh, links for you to follow. But bef uh, that's the first part. The second part is just to talk a little bit about swarm intelligence. Uh, Carlos mentioned uh, a particular uh, set of uh, families uh, regarding uh, 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 problems that have multiple objectives. Here, I will be more humble and I will just deal with one objective, which is the inference of the, the network that controls the process. But for that, I have to explain for those of you, I don't know how familiar you are with these techniques, and I, I will use the FSS family fish school search, which is the algorithm we created in our lab uh, about 10 years ago, that has some features that are very useful for the problem I described. So that's the first paper. It came out in uh, uh, SMC 2008, okay? Uh, and basically FSS was invented not only to be another member of the family, but to solve a high dimensional uh, problems in high dimensional space with particular uh, uh, things in mind. 
but here, just for you to understand, uh, we have a set of fish, we call them fish, which is processing units uh, that perform uh, in, uh, individually local search, while the, the school, I mean, the collection of the fish aggregates this social information and solves the, the global optimization problems. Uh, unique to FSS, different from all the other techniques uh, that we are used to, is there is an automatic control for exploration and exploitation, which is nice because uh, once the, you, you deploy FSS in a dynamic environment, it controls when it should uh, do a breadth first search or a depth first uh, search in an automatic fashion. And then the centerpiece of that is a concept that we use called the Barry Center. Yes, the fish, every fish here has a concept called the weight of the fish. And then you have a Barry Center, which is a global variable that uh, concentrates the, the weights of all the fish. Basically, uh, if a fish uh, uh, is moving towards a nice area of the search space, it puts on weight and therefore it uh, 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 drifts a little bit the Barry Center towards the goal. In, a, in this case, in a, 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 a single objective optimization fashion. So in short, FSS has uh, features such as it can follow, it, it, it reacts as a group, uh, it, it wanders around, so it's good for search, and it diverges. Uh, so for example, as I, I'm going to show, we can split the swarm automatically as well. So swimming here is a, is a connotation for a local uh, a search together with, with a, a global search. Uh, the success here is measured uh, in two ways. So if the fish is large, so this particular fish or solution for the problem is good. And if the radius of the swarm uh, is uh, small, it's better. It means that the whole swarm converged to a point which is interesting. And as I said, the Barry Center in that particular case would be closer to the Optima. I mean Optima because, I, as I mentioned, we can split the swarm. So, and then there are a few other details. We don't have time for this, so forgive me. I will, I will be very quick here because otherwise I would not, I would not reach the, the important part of the presentation. So, uh, this presentation will be shared so you can uh, read about the, the terms and the, 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 the other details. But basically, what I can tell you is that uh, together, uh, the, the swarm can really find solutions in very large uh, search space, okay? Uh, so we have basically two operators, the feeding operator and the swimming operator. The swimming operator is how the fish move, and the feeding operation is how the fish uh, individually, uh, they learn. This is the sequence we used in the vanilla version of the algorithm, and this is the semantics. So, for example, individual movement is the local search. Uh, then the fish learns if it, if it moves towards a nice area of the search space, so it puts on weight. If it doesn't, it reduces uh, the, the weight. Then we have the collective instinct uh, uh, movement, which is just a social glue. So the fish, they have to, to be somehow attached to other fish, otherwise it would be individual search. And then there is another concept, which is collective volative. Uh, and this particular one is responsible for that phenomenon I mentioned to you of expansion or, uh, or uh, reduction in radius of the search so that uh, we can have movements in the search space that are coherent with the, third, uh, the search objects. Uh, there are many stop uh, conditions possible. If you would like to see the formula of all that, you can go to this link. We don't have time for that. But here is an illustration of the three components. So imagine if you are looking for this red dot, and then you have uh, the fishes in the initial positions, like the green triangles. When we use the, the, the operator, the, the individual movement, the fish 
try to to search around the, the position and then as you can see there is no coherence here uh, then we we apply this collective instinct which is the glue uh, which is the average of the movements of the other the the, the pre previous uh, movement so that there is a, another uh, 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 vectorial component trying to put the fish coherently towards a, 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 an area, okay? And then the, th the third component uh, is that the one I mentioned to you that moves the fish inwards or outwards. Okay, so this is the illustration of the formulas I have not shown, but you can check. Uh, but let's see how this uh, works in a simple function, like the, the, the sphere function. From A to, to uh, B, C, D, and uh, up to uh, H, you can see how the swarm moves towards the, the objective, which in this case is in the center. So initially you see a radius, and then it slowly not only reduces the radius, but also moves towards the, the target. Let's see now a comparison between FSS and PSO specifically on that, that matter of uh, uh, not having the flocking behavior. What I'm going to show you is just the movement of the fish towards the areas, in this case red. As you can see, it's very good PSO, but if you do not restart it, it will be working as a pack when the, 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 the dynamic system happens. Let's see how FSS works because of that operator I mentioned to you. So it can converge, but after the, the, the back, uh, the, the, the search space moves, it spans very quickly and regroups in another point. So this is nice because it's automatic, okay? But then we have other families like the, the weight uh, version, which is another uh, family, uh, another uh, member of the family. Uh, here, the difference is that the, 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 the swarm can split based on the weight. So, for example, if the, the, the fish with, uh, which is leading the pack becomes uh, small, then the, there is a, a brokerage between the links and uh, they, they try to find better uh, uh, leaders. Uh, I will just show the, the illustration of that using the equal peaks function. That's the top view. With time, as you can see, the, the, the subswarms, they split and they move towards every peak. In this case, it's not multi-objective. Here is multi-model, which is a nice uh, 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 characteristics, by the way. Anyway, but let's see a, a comparison between uh, another earlier version of the uh, FSS, which uh, use that particular PSO fashion thing. So it was able to, to converge, but with time, it becomes a blob. So we dropped the D version, and then that's what I presented you. We have the uh, W version. When the background changes, the swarms, they regroup and re they split in a, in a, uh, a suitable manner. Well, this is the tools we are going to use. Okay, so there are lots of highlights. I'm concerned with the time. I will just skip all that. Uh, there is a, 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 a chapter in a book uh, covering the 10 first years of FSS. But basically, I presented you two versions of, uh, of that, the W, the, the vanilla, of course, the, da, the D. But today, I'm going to show you a very uh, wise uh, use of this mixed version. Uh, that's a joke. I mean, perhaps in the future, we'll have the receive version with sharks in it to, to just uh, uh, incorporate penalization function. Well, there is a website for that you can follow. But let's talk in the latter part of the presentation about PALAS, which is this approach for uh, the problem I mentioned in the beginning. So this is the base paper for the, that part of the, this part of the presentation. So PALAS means penalized maximum lack, likelihood and particle swarm uh, for inference of gene regulatory networks for time series data. So 
basically what you have here is you have a time series, okay, uh, express uh, uh, showing the expression of genes, and then uh, we will explore that for infer for inferring what could be the networks that would be generate that signal. It's a very complex problem because it's a combinatorial one. So the ideas behind PALAS are uh, that the ones I mentioned to you, it's, it's an inference method, okay? Uh, but it used uh, what, what we call POBDS, which is partially observable uh, uh, Boolean dynamic systems, which is the collaboration I have with Ulysses. You may, you may look at this particular paper where uh, you have the description of POBDS. And I will talk in the, in the next slide why POBDS was a, an improvement in the state of the art, but why it need help and why it need the help of FSS. So PALAS in, in all is something able to scale to networks of realistic size. This, so this is key. With POBDS, you can solve uh, reasonably well the, the inference of uh, small uh, gene regulatory networks, but it does not scale well. So basically the idea here is to take this uh, meteoristic and put this to work towards the, the a better uh, scalability of what we have. And for that, we have to create a variation of FSS, which is a very clever uh, concoction of a PhD student shared between myself and Ulysses that mixed continuous and discrete uh, 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 optimization. Perhaps Carlos could tell me if there are many other ones in this regard. So basically, uh, just to revisit very quickly, uh, uh, G GRN, uh, Gene Regulatory Networks. So it was modeled, it has been modeled mathematically by several means linear ones, Bayesian, neural nets, differential equation, information theory, uh, with different extent, uh, many, many uh, of those, uh, they, they have uh, some limitations. Scalability is the most important one. But uh, one particular one, uh, which is the Boolean network, has a, a very strong assumption, which is you assume you have to have uh, 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 prior knowledge. I mean, you have to uh, have complete observation of the gene activation and inactivation, which is not plausible. Then comes POBDS, which uh, is the work I mentioned by, by Ulysses. Uh, in this particular case, uh, you do not need to use complete observation, but, which is very nice, but it's not scalable. So that's the story. Okay, so then we comes then it comes uh, Palas in a lay people definition. Palas is a sophisticated state space method that can detect edge di directionality and activation in inhibition of genes, of course, without a prior knowledge. In addition of being capable of working directly with gene expression, without the need of, of course, the the binar binarization I mentioned to you. So uh, for that, uh, it, FSS, the mixed version, was instrumental. Uh, the first uh, uh, appearance of mixed FSS was in MLSP 2018. This is the paper. Uh, and the key, I think this is the most important line of the whole presentation, okay? It, it does efficient simultaneous maximization of a penalized likelihood over discrete space state, uh, discrete space, and uh, 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 maximization also of the the inference of the networks that uh, of the parameters uh, observed in continuous space. So it's a very, I, I think it's a very nice uh, way to put together uh, in the same optimization problem, discrete and continuous uh, space with all the the features I mentioned before. Uh, just for you, why this is matter? Why this matters? Because uh, th th this kind of problem scales up very quickly. 
So this is the way you can calculate the, the scalability of this. Is it scale with the number of genes. For example, if you have a network with four genes, you have almost 700 million combinations of networks. If this goes to 10 genes, which is very small uh, in, in, in uh, 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 biological processes, the number of combinations is 10 to the power of 50, which is completely unfeasible. By the way, this, this accounts for edge parameter, this accounts for regulation bias parameter, just for you to understand why this scales up. Now I have some examples to, to wrap it up. Uh, this, this experiment is in that paper I mentioned to you, is uh, based on synthetic data. So it's a network with 10 genes, but in a, in a very, uh, 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 and then you can see that there are inhibitions and then there are excitations, etc. And then you have palace compared with other uh, competitors. As you can see, uh, we are the best one in terms of sensitivity, in terms of the identification of the network. Okay, specificity, we are almost as good as the other two. We lose a lot for Banjo, but pay attention that Banjo does not have this, the sensitivity we do. So uh, we claim that we are now a very good contentant because uh, we can account for the three aspects in this uh, inference process. Now, two more uh, experiments very quickly. For example, the E. coli SOS DNA repair system. Uh, this is real data. And what you see uh, in the, the red uh, 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 links is inferred by PALAS. So we did not know that before. It, the, the, by the way, the data was uh, uh, retrieved from here and, and uh, uh, you can follow in the paper uh, uh, the details of the, the simulation. Here is another real data simulation. Again, red uh, arrows are linked to that. And what I can add to, to wrap it up is that uh, with this, we are able to really go up and try to map uh, networks that perhaps are linked to problems like cancer, as I, I mentioned in the beginning. So what is next? Um, as I mentioned, um, POBDS were able to, to solve small nets, but if you have large nets, the computation time was in the order of months. If you would like to, to, to do that, it's infeasible. So when we used uh, uh, our approach, we reduce from months to, to uh, uh, palace, I mean, to months from to hours, okay? But even so, uh, some networks, they will take weeks. Therefore, the next step, we are already working with that. So the first collaboration with, is with Texas A&M. So Ulysses, Yukun are there. But then we use the second uh, collaboration, which is with the University of Münster, uh, there is a, a, a collaborator there that worked with parallel computing. So we are parallelizing uh, PALAS, okay? So I'm very excited with that because we can now move from hours to minutes. Okay, so that's for me. Sorry, I tried to do my best. Oh, Seun. Oh, by the way, uh, Bolandi, there are lots of people around that can uh, uh, understand Yoruba. Here, yes, in yes, yes, you are right, Prof. Thank you for handing with that uh, thankful note, Oshe. <laughs> we are really grateful for that nice presentation, very exploratory and uh, comprehensive about uh, gene regulatory networks, how we can generate networks um, from genes and map them to problems. I know this will be very insightful for those who are carrying out research in this area. And uh, somebody had to, somebody wanted to ask a question. Are you here? Can you quickly ask your question in one minute? Oh, hello? Adebayo Adeboyega. Are you asking your question?
Hello, are you asking your question? Okay, maybe if you are not, maybe you will need to, you will need to send it privately to Prof or you on the Q Q and H. Oh, Hello? my my email is there. He can write to me. Uh, uh, okay, yes. Politely. All right, thank you. So you can send a mail to Prof and he will, he will readily answer you. Thank you very much. Thank we you. Thank you leave. a lot. <laughs> yes, you're welcome. N now we want to listen to Professor Hello? Ming. Hello. We want to listen to Professor M Ming Jiang from uh, the Department of Computer Science, Peking University, Beijing, China. Our, our professor, our Hebel, eminent professor, uh, is, is the head of the Digital Libraries Research Group in uh, Peking University. And uh, she, she is my mentor. She, she is here instrumental to my, my progress and development in, in the field of computing. She'll be speaking to us today on uh, graph representation learning for drug discovery. So, uh, Listen to her dear prof as she ex explains, uh, as, she, as she speaks to us. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Can I uh, share my, um, my screen? I yes, think that uh, somebody, yeah, yeah. Somebody is uh, sharing the screen. So, uh, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, close. Okay, uh, I'll try. Where's my... What's the problem? Let, let, me, let me try. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure, but uh, I'll try again. I'll try to open my files. Oh, no. Oh. Yes. Yeah. I think he's here. Okay. Can you? Uh, so, is this? Uh, can you yes, see my? Yeah, yeah. Yes, we can. Oh, you, we you can. No. You, okay, okay, yeah. okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bonani, for uh, the invitation, and uh, thank you all listeners and uh, and the colleagues. Uh, I would like uh, to. Uh, introduce um, our recent work, uh, research uh, on graph representation learning for drug discovery. Uh, actually, uh, I'll introduce uh, two papers. Um, one is a uh, clear paper uh, to 2020, and uh, uh, the other one is uh, ICML 2020 paper. Uh, so. Uh, we know that uh, uh, CNN is uh, typically um, for fixed size image grids, and the RNN or vector, uh, what vector uh, is for uh, text and uh, sequence, uh, uh, sequences, uh, sequential data. Um, but for graph, uh, uh, the graph uh, representation learning is very hard because it's uh, much more uh, complicated. And, and uh, you, you can see that uh, uh, the, the graphs uh, have a complex uh, topographical structure um, and uh, uh, no fixed node ordering or reference point. So, and also it's dynamic and uh, uh, it, uh, the graph data uh, um, they, uh, have some multi-model features. Um, uh, in my group, um, one of my former um, PhD student, uh, uh, Tang Jian, uh, Jian Tang, uh, he's now, uh, um, Professor um, at uh, Mila um, <coughs> um, Montreal University. Uh, he 
published two papers and proposed two models. One is line at uh, um, triple W 2015. Uh, this paper is uh, the most cited paper uh, in recent uh, five years for uh, triple W uh, conference. Uh, now we have uh, more than uh, 2,700 uh, um, citations. And uh, the other one is uh, a large waste. It's uh, uh, published uh, in um, Triple uh, W 2016. So we have very uh, efficient uh, uh, graph um, <coughs> representation learning model. So it's kind of uh, um, <coughs> Um, a large information network embedding. So it's kind of embedding. Um, and the, nowadays, uh, we know that uh, GPT-3 uh, is a, a very good uh, uh, generation model uh, for NLP. And uh, it can do a lot of amazing things uh, that's very uh, creative. Um, and uh, we know that uh, also uh, glow for image generation, uh, it become um, better and better. Nowadays it's uh, all, almost, uh, we, we cannot, uh, uh, this is uh, totally created by computer, but it's uh, really like a, a true a picture, true uh, human face. So, <clears throat> So uh, to the drug uh, discovery, um, we can we um, generate some uh, new drugs uh, automatically, and so we can um, save uh, time and also uh, save money. Uh, we know that uh, uh, typically uh, for a new drug uh, dis uh, <coughs> uh, discovery uh, or we uh, we typically we need uh, more than ten years. We know that uh, nowadays uh, uh, the whole world uh, is suffering um, from um, by the COVID nineteen and the vaccine. Um, yeah, you know the vac uh, vaccine is very important for us, and also some uh, cure uh, medicine uh, is the uh, uh, a very. Um, yeah, are very important for us. Uh, for uh, nowadays, uh, actually, we don't have uh, um, have cure for COVID nineteen. People uh, mostly they recover uh, by themselves. Uh, nowadays, um, many uh, machine learning um, models or uh, machine learning um, algorithms um, are uh, developed. Uh, uh, in this uh, area, in drug discovery area. Um, um, we, we can see from a uh, paper, uh, uh, this is uh, uh, chemi uh, chemical shifts uh, in uh, molecule, uh, molecular uh, solids by machine learning. Uh, this is uh, uh, published uh, in uh, nature communication, and uh, it an announced uh, that uh, the the AI um, the a AI model uh, is uh, um, ten thousand times faster than existing methods. How, uh, um, now um, I'll introduce um, two uh, papers uh, um, just uh, recently um, published uh, and uh, proposed uh, the models are proposed uh, by my, my uh, student. So, but uh, uh, we can see that uh, typically for the um, drug discovery, uh, the first one is. Uh, uh, molecular generation. So we need to generate uh, some uh, structure of a molecule. And then we, and, uh, if we, we announce that this is a new um, drug, but how can we 
um, composite uh, this drug. So, uh, so uh, how to uh, make this drug? So the uh, second uh, task is uh, uh, a ritual uh, synthesis uh, prediction. So we, we can uh, tell the uh, chemist, uh, chemists uh, how to produce uh, this kind of uh, uh, drug. Mm. And then also we have other uh, tasks uh, uh, such as uh, um, uh, uh, such as uh, 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 open, uh, optimization and uh, also uh, uh, side effect uh, test and uh, so on. Uh, but first of all, uh, my group. Um, uh, uh, working on task uh, one and uh, task two. Uh, for task one, uh, the uh, molecular generation, uh, we want to generate in, um, a realistic, uh, novel, and uh, unique uh, molecules and uh, uh, design uh, uh, with with uh, desired property. So. Uh, <coughs> We uh, need to, to test uh, some drug uh, like this uh, octanol water uh, partition uh, uh, called uh, efficient and so on. Um, there are uh, a lot of uh, uh, existing research uh, right now for uh, drug uh, discovery. Uh, because of uh, the uh, uh, the time limitation, I uh, won't uh, introduce them one by one. Uh, but uh, we can know uh, that um, some uh, of them, for example, VAE based uh, um, uh, models, uh, uh, they are with uh, uh, low band uh, evidence and. Uh, some uh, gain uh, plus uh, reinforcement learning uh, models uh, they are on um, stable uh, the, the the training uh, and, uh, the training parts are on stable um, and for flow based uh, uh, the flow based uh, uh, ones um, uh, most uh, recent uh, models um, but uh, the uh, the, this kind of models um, are um, uh, also uh, unstable. Uh, we need to so, uh, so we need uh, to uh, propose uh, new models and uh, to uh, to uh, conquer uh, this kind of weakness. So uh, this is the structure uh, of uh, the proposed model. Um, of uh, our ICLEA 2020 paper. Um, so the key idea is uh, to uh, uh, decompose, uh, uh, decompose the generation of uh, a molecule uh, into a, a sequence uh, under a specific uh, order. And then uh, we use an uh, auto regressive uh, regressive flow to model the sequence. So uh, this is the uh, structure of the um, uh, or the, the uh, illustration of the uh, model graph AF. Uh, actually, um, we uh, we train this model. Uh, with uh, uh, reinforcement learning. So um, you know that uh, for the um, uh, molecular um, structure, uh, we can see uh, these structures uh, as uh, uh, subgraphs. So we, we, can, um, we can use the reinforcement learning um, from, so the state uh, is the current subgraph and uh, the policy is uh, uh, auto regressive flow to generate uh, node age uh, based on uh, current uh, subgraphs. And uh, uh, we have the uh, reward 
uh, this is uh, intermediate reward and uh, uh, also we have some um, final reward. Um, so the the experiments uh, um, we can see from this uh, table uh, that uh, we can see that uh, uh, graph if archives uh, uh, competitive results on all uh, metrics on, on all the metrics. So that's for uh, validity, uh, un uniqueness, and uh, 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 novelty uh, mostly. And uh, also uh, we have some uh, restructuring on the, this metric. And, and this one uh, is, uh, um, we can show that uh, uh, the uh, uh, property uh, op uh, optimization, uh, we compare um, uh, of the top three uh, property scores of uh, generated uh, uh, molecules. Uh, we can see that uh, for both uh, personalized uh, log P and uh, QED, um, the uh, our proposed model uh, graph F uh, outperform uh, all the baselines. Um, also, uh, this one we can see that uh, uh, for the constrained property optimization, um, uh, the we we can see that. Uh, um, uh, comparing uh, with the baselines uh, graph AF uh, significantly outperforms uh, all pre uh, previous uh, approaches and uh, almost uh, always succeeds in um, improving the uh, target uh, um, property. Uh, we can see the visualization, uh, visualization um, we can see that uh, uh, the uh, structures uh, uh, produced uh, by graph AF our model uh, and uh, it is very similar uh, as uh, um, uh, just a very very like uh, two uh, drugs uh, the in the uh, part and uh, then uh, I in, I'll introduce uh, uh, the second uh, uh, task. Uh, which is a uh, uh, retro uh, uh, synthesis, uh, synthesis uh, prediction. Uh, actually, uh, this is the way uh, we uh, tell the chemists uh, how to produce uh, the uh, the drug we uh, we generated. Uh, so um, this is uh, the, the left side is the product, uh, given the product, uh, which is uh, generated uh, by our model uh, graph AF. And then we need to predict uh, um, <laughs> reactants. Uh, and uh, uh, we need to tell the, um, uh, the chemist uh, how to produce uh, uh, this kind of uh, product. Uh, there are some uh, related uh, work. Um, first of all, uh, of course, we have a uh, template-based uh, uh, research uh, or uh, template-based uh, method. Uh, we can see that uh, um, this kind of uh, um, uh, methods, they have some uh, limitations, um, mostly uh, the uh, the uh, the for the first of all uh, is that uh, uh, the poor general uh, general generalization on on same uh, structure, and uh, uh, so if we uh, don't know the structure, we don't have this uh, uh, kind of structure before, so we never uh, uh, we will never generate this kind of new structure. So only uh, the uh, because of the follow the um the existing uh, uh, temple uh, te uh, temp template, uh, 
so it's uh, not easy to uh, discover new structure. And then um, uh, it requires a subgraph for isomorphism. This is a very um, uh, <coughs> computationally expensive. So, um, and, and then uh, it requires uh, some domain knowledge to uh, extract uh, or uh, design templates. So we need a, a lot of uh, experts um, to extract uh, or design uh, templates for us. Uh, this is also very expensive. Uh, the uh, second kind of uh, related work um, is a sequence-to-sequence -sequence, uh, based uh, models or methods. Uh, we know that uh, there is a, a, a very famous uh, um, a format that is uh, called uh, uh, SMILE. Uh, so in uh, for the SMILE, it's kind of a uh, sequence, just uh, like uh, a sequence uh, uh, consists of uh, ASCII uh, text. Um, and uh, uh, for this kind of uh, method, uh, uh, they also have some uh, limitations. Um, because uh, smile it itself uh, only can represent a uh, sequen sequential order, but actually a molecule, uh, uh, this kind of a structure, um, the structures are um, graph-based uh, uh, or it's a kind of a more uh, complicated uh, structure. So uh, actually this kind of uh, method uh, cannot uh, um, represent uh, the complicated uh, graph uh, structure. And of course, uh, uh, smiles uh, cannot uh, if, uh, uh, effectively reflect the uh, complex uh, relationship uh, between uh, artens uh, of the drug uh, structure. And uh, mm, the, the overall performance is not uh, satisfactory. Uh, that is, uh, is not uh, uh, satisfied. Mm. So um, we can see that uh, um, only a small part of uh, functional groups uh, um, uh, are changed uh, in a chemical reaction. Uh, so uh, we can uh, localize uh, some uh, change uh, of the graph. And so we, uh, and uh, and the, the motivation, the second motivation is that um, the reaction mechanism are uh, often um, uh, de uh, deposited uh, using electron arrow um, passing uh, diagram. Uh, where uh, each arrow corresponds uh, to a uh, uh, to a bound uh, uh, to be generated or to move, so we can uh, re remove uh, a bond or we can add uh, a bond. Then we have a different uh, uh, structure, and uh, uh, we we can check if the this kind of action uh, is uh, is. Uh, uh, reasonable or not. So um, we propose a, a new model, um, which is called uh, uh, <clears throat> G2GS. Uh, this is a, um, a, a normal um, uh, template-free uh, method, and uh, it uh, represents uh, it's a uh, molecules uh, as a, a molecular graph and uh, uh, it uh, formulates uh, a ritual synthesis uh, prediction as a, a graph to graph translation so we can um, we, uh, we can uh, compose the a new drug structure from some uh, small uh, sub uh, uh, structures as which is uh, 
represented as a graph in our uh, paper or in our uh, research. Um, the whole framework is uh, composed of two uh, stages. Uh, one is a reaction center identification, and then the second one is a graph, uh, graph uh, translation. So first of all, uh, we need to at, um, uh, identify uh, the reaction center, uh, which is very important. So um, the um, overview uh, structure of a G2GS model is uh, in this way. So first of all, uh, we have a reaction center identification, and then uh, we uh, break the product um, uh, to symptoms uh, to uh, smaller parts. Uh, and then uh, we have some uh, var uh, variational graph uh, translation. So we uh, just uh, as a language translation, we, trans uh, we translate uh, from some uh, graph to um, other um, maybe smaller graphs uh, because this graph is uh, uh, the product of graph is uh, uh, a relatively larger one and then we we need some smaller one and we have a reaction among these uh, uh, smaller ones and then we can compose the, the product so uh, for the uh, reaction center identification, uh, we can see that uh, an autumn pair IJ is a reaction center. Uh, if uh, there is a bond between autumn I and the autumn J uh, in product, so uh, they have some uh, connection. Um, and uh, uh, there is no bond uh, between um, autumn I and the autumn J in uh, reactants. Um, for for this G two G reaction center uh, identification uh, to identify the bond between uh, with uh, with high reactivity, our model first uh, embed uh, embeds uh, the target uh, molecule. Uh, into a low dimension space. And especially we employ a graph a neural network to calculate uh, the node embedding and the uh, uh, graph embeddings of the target uh, molecules. Then we estimate uh, the reactivity of each bound based on its age embedding. Uh, the bond uh, with the highest uh, reactivity score uh, is selected as the uh, reaction center. Then we break the corresponding bond. In uh, this way, the target uh, molecule uh, is split into multiple uh, symptoms which can be later translated into final uh, reactants. Uh, through um, reaction center identification model, um, well, module, uh, we uh, reduce a one to many graph translation task into multiple one-to-one -one graph translation tasks. Uh, that's uh, simplify the problem. Then uh, we have the uh, graph uh, translation. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, the goal of a graph uh, translation is to uh, translate its uh, incomplete uh, uh, things on uh, uh, to uh, the final uh, reactant, and the the method uh, uh, is a conditional graph uh, generation. Um, it's uh, uh, treated as a, a mark for uh, decision um, process. 
and uh, also we consider the diversity. Uh, we uh, incorporate a latent code Z to uh, capture uncertainty. So, uh, and we can see that, um, how uh, graph translation is done uh, in following um, illustration. Uh, our graph translation um, uh, module has four actions. Uh, this, um, given the current uh, symptom, it, uh, it first uh, select a node to focus on. Uh, see, we select uh, a carbon uh, atom here. First, we select a uh, 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 carbon. Uh, this one. And uh, then uh, we uh, uh, select a second node to focus on. Um, and then uh, we select the um, an AG uh, type. Um, the after two nodes uh, are selected, um, the model uh, select the age uh, type for age uh, between these two uh, nodes. And note that uh, if the second node is an isolated node, uh, it uh, uh, corresponds to adding a new node to uh, current uh, symptom. And uh, uh, finally, uh, it's uh, uh, ter uh, terminate uh, termination uh, prediction. Um, our module predicts uh, whether the graph translation is done or uh, or not. Uh, if it uh, need to be terminated, the uh, current uh, symptom is. Uh, uh, regarded as the final uh, reactant. Uh, if it does not, uh, the module will select another node and uh, repeat this uh, uh, procedure. Uh, the experiments uh, results uh, shows uh, the results show that. Uh, G2G uh, uh, archives uh, uh, state of the art results uh, comparing um, to um, the baselines. And then also, we have uh, some uh, visualization. Uh, to show uh, how to uh, do uh, this, uh, um, uh, how how uh, uh, how does the um, G two G S model works? Uh, to give a, a deeper insight into our model, uh, we also uh, 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 we we show this uh, visualization part, and the, the figure in the left uh, shows some uh, successful prediction uh, made by uh, G2GS. And uh, uh, the uh, template uh, entailed uh, by these uh, reactions are uh, uh, summarized uh, below. So this uh, the bottom one. Uh, the figure in the right uh, represents a case uh, where none of the predictions uh, uh, match the ground truth. However, this uh, does not mean our model uh, fails to predict a uh, uh, synthesis a uh, route for the target uh, molecule. Uh, as a, a molecule uh, can be uh, synthesized uh, in multiple ways. Uh, to further illustrate uh, this point, 
uh, we employ a reaction um, prediction model to predict the, uh, the pr product uh, based on the reaction generated by, by our model. Uh, which is uh, uh, shown in the bottom of the uh, right figure. We uh, we also um, found uh, two uh, similar papers re uh, published uh, also in uh, two thousand and twenty. Uh, the first one. Um, is uh, um uh is done um uh it is published in uh, ICML um graph uh, representative learning uh, workshop and uh, the uh, the second one is uh, accepted by neural uh, IPS and um, um, one is uh, um, Fin, uh, is uh, uh, done by uh, MIT, and the other one uh, is done uh, by um, uh, uh, that's a uh, Tencent uh, group uh, in China. Uh, and we can see that uh, uh, both uh, uh, papers uh, um, uh, 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 but, uh, the, 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 uh, they have fewer uh, citations uh, um, compared with uh, our two papers. Uh, the uh, first uh, paper, uh, we, uh, the graph AF model, um, <coughs> published in ICLEA 2020, we have uh, 19 citations uh, right now. And uh, uh, the second one in ICML, we have uh, uh, six citations, uh, and uh, also, uh, yeah, and also I list uh, uh, the two um, fundamental models, uh, um, uh, which is proposed, uh, which, which are proposed by our group. Uh, the first one is line um, published uh, at uh, uh, triple W. 2015, and the, the second one is large uh, which is uh, uh, which was uh, published uh, in uh, W 2016. And uh, uh, that's all for today. Uh, thank you. And uh, any questions? Thank you, Prof. Mm -hmm. Somebody you. asked a question. Mm -hmm. Hi, Bolani. I, I do have a question. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, Professor, Professor uh, mm -hmm. uh, Ming, so yeah. thank you for your nice presentation. Um, I don't know if you, if you heard what I presented before you, but uh, my question is, do you have in your problem uh, different nature of, of, of data in your search space? For example, you, do you have one dimension which is discrete and another dimension in the search project which is continuous? Uh, sorry, I, I cannot uh, uh, understand uh, quite. Because you are, you are, you are doing uh, drug discovery, so you are yeah. trying to, to find uh, mm -hmm. aspects or, on a, a large search space. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. My question deals with the nature of your search space. Do you have oh. uh, variables that are continuous and others that are discrete, or you just work with discrete variables? Oh yes. Um, uh, actually, we uh, we we um, treat the, this as a graph for data, so it's discrete uh, variables. We compose. This uh, one by one. Yeah, no, I understood so, that. Yeah. But uh, mm -hmm. my question is just because if you do have this uh, mixed uh, set mm -hmm. of variables, uh, mm -hmm. the, the, the presentation I, I had on, on a particular swarm intelligence could be very handy. But thank you again for your presentation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
Thank you, Prof. Somebody asked the question if, if AI can be used for drug discovery without domain knowledge. Maybe, maybe you will respond to the person in a private chat. Mm -hmm. Or do you want to? Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Prof, for that insightful lecture. And uh, you can see um, from the presentation that there are a lot, a lot of citations on many of the research uh, outputs from professors' group. And uh, in one way or the other, you would have also uh, gained some, some knowledge on graph representation learning and how it can be applied for drug discovery. So I want to appreciate uh, our professors, our eminent professors who have spoken widely in this uh, plenary session on theoretical concepts of data science and other applications. Thank you very much. We, uh, we, we would uh, do well to share your slides that you've shared with us, with all the participants in this uh, symposium. We want to appreciate you once again for coming. Thank you all. Okay, thank you. So we will be, we are supposed to move to the break session now and, and the exhibition, but because of our time, we would uh, have to go directly to the next session. Uh, and the, the exhibition, we will take that after this session. We want to um, plead with the, the speakers who will be coming up now to please try to keep to time so that we can um, be timely with our presentations. Many of our speakers, uh, are, they, they want to keep with time because they are also busy. People who have one uh, thing or the other that, might, that might, they may want to do afterwards. So I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, we would hand over to Dr. Frederick Agzite who will be moderating the next session. Uh, thank you very much, Doc. And greetings to everybody all over the world. I think it's afternoon here, some may be in the morning, others in the evening. I also want to thank previous speakers, moderators, and reporters for the good work done and to welcome you to the second session, that is the team two, on data science and sustainable issues. Because we are far behind time, I will try and use less words. So we'll move on straight to the keynote speaker in the person of Professor Mawala, who is a professor in artificial intelligence and the vice chancellor and principal of University of Johannesburg, South Africa. He'll be talking to us on closing the gap the fourth industrial resolution in Africa. Prof. Mawala, please, the floor is yours. Hello. Uh, I hope you can all hear me. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the invitation, uh, Professor Ojoko. Uh, I also would like to acknowledge the presence of uh, Many other distinguished uh, speakers, uh, Professor Ming Zhang, uh, as well as my very great friend, uh, Professor Fernando Buahi. Uh, we have been working together for a very, very long time, uh, over 20 years now, ever since I was um, a postdoc at Imperial College. So I am going to just um, um, beam my uh, 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 my uh, uh, presentation. Just one second. Um, how do I do this? Uh, can you see my presentation? Yes, we can. Thank you very much. Just trying to. Uh, 
uh, Felix, it looks like my presentation is stuck. I don't know why. If you could just bear with me, I might have to just uh, okay. Then I will open it again. Yeah. So, if I can just um, yeah. So, thank you very much. I really wanted to talk about um, uh, the fourth industrial revolution: artificial intelligence, data finance, and other applications. Um, of course, uh, uh, part of the reason why I've been quite interested in the fourth industrial revolution is because um, uh, 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 I think as the African continent, uh, we have missed out on the first industrial revolution, uh, where uh, using the principles of uh, uh, physics and other sciences, uh, the, uh, England industrialized. I also think that in the second industrial revolution that gave us electricity and mass production of goods and services, it was also a missed opportunity. We have not been able to uh, industrialize much of the African continent, with few exceptions in South Africa. I think Rwanda now is, uh, is doing quite well. And now we are in the, in, the industri in the third industrial age, the electronic age. In the entire continent, we still do not have a single large scale semiconductor company. And as a result, we have not been able to build any form of, 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 of an electronic uh, industry. It's a little bit in South Africa, but uh, it is not uh, where it is supposed to, to be. Um, now we are living in the fourth industrial revolution where uh, production is going to be automated by uh, artificial intelligence. I'm actually quite uh, excited about the topic of artificial intelligence. Now in the fourth industrial revolution is really about the confluence of uh, uh, several uh, developments, AI, blockchain, quantum computing, internet of things, 3D printing, robotics, uh, uh, bi bi biotech, and, and, and the confluence of these technologies working together is what actually gives us the fourth industrial revolution. Now, one of the big technologies that is driving the fourth industrial revolution is really artificial intelligence. And I must confess, uh, there's been quite a great deal of uh, developments and confusions around artificial intelligence. Basically, artificial intelligence is uh, the use of uh, of, of science to build machines that are intelligent. And there are many approaches that uh, can be pursued. Uh, one approach is computational intelligence. Uh, Professor Fernando Buarque, uh, I'm, I'm quite sure he would have talk, spoken about uh, computational intelligence. Uh, for example, in computational intelligence, you can use um, swarming of birds to be able to build an optimization uh, method that can be able to solve not very well defined uh, optimization problems. Even problems where you, uh, your fitness function is not, uh, is not um, smooth. It might even include, um, and that is the question that Professor uh, Fernando uh, asked, uh, uh, mathemat in mathematics, they call it integer programming, where you are dealing with uh, whole numbers rather than um, rather than uh, irrational numbers. Uh, in, in other words, um, uh, uh, if you are uh, designing a shape of something, you want to find an optimal shape of uh, I don't know, maybe a car. That optimization is not going to be gradient based because your your fitness function, uh, especially if it involves a concept such as a shape, 
uh, would not necessarily be a continuous variable. It includes these continuous variables. So computational intelligence, you have many other techniques that can be used in this regard. Genetic algorithm, fish school uh, is another one. Um, and then you have uh, soft computing, uh, fuzzy logic. This is the case when you do not have enough data to form probability distributions. Now, if you have enough data, you can be able to form probability distributions and you can be able to do a Bayesian analysis and so on and so forth. But if you do not have enough information, which is actually quite a, a big issue in the African continent, then you can use techniques such as fuzzy logic. Then you have machine learning, which is the use of data and statistics to build intelligent machines. And uh, uh, within the school of uh, practice, uh, these schools, uh, whether it is machine learning, whether it's soft computing or computational intelligence, they don't quite get along, you know. For example, if you go to NIPS or NURIPS or ICML, uh, they won't be talking about genetic algorithm or fish school or fuzzy logic. And, uh, and part of the reason is because uh, they think the mathematics uh, of soft computing is too soft for them. And uh, when it comes to computational intelligence, they think these optimization techniques cannot, you cannot be able to mathematically prove uh, convergence. And within machine learning, uh, you will have uh, a deep learning, which is a, a very popular contemporarily popular algorithm that has been developed uh, over the last uh, uh, few, used over the last few years. It has been around for, 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 for a long time. It has just been used uh, over the, the last few years. Now, this is how deep learning looks like. You will have a set of input, you will have a set of, uh, of output. Uh, and and it, it becomes deep learning because it has many, many layers. When I was a PhD student uh, many, many years ago, we were told that the idea of having multiple layers uh, is, not, uh, is not useful. I actually even still remember a statement that was uh, uh, uttered by Professor Buake, where he was saying that one of the, uh, the, the, the incidences uh, that misled him was to believe uh, that uh, the universal theory of uh, approximation assertion that you can build a network with just one layer. And of course, if it is only one layer in between, it is not deep learning. We have found that uh, having multiple layers actually give, um, uh, uh, give you uh, uh, advantages that, uh, uh, that, that, that you wouldn't uh, get if you have a single layer. So one of the problems that I have encountered, especially um, given the fact that I have worked almost all my professional life in the African continent, is that the African database is never really complete. And the data is never as reliable. And if you look at what is happening at the, at, at the other end of the world, you will realize that uh, all these algorithms that have been developed are developed under the assumption that data is complete. How do you build a system like this so that it can actually work even in the presence of incomplete information? I don't want to sound like a salesman, uh, but uh, me and uh, a student of mine, Collins Leke from um, from Cameroon, uh, we wrote a, a, a book on deep learning with missing information. Uh, how can you still make decisions even when the information is missing? Now, this is an example of how we deal with issues of, uh, of missing information. You create what is called an auto-associative auto network. 
uh, this is almost like, a, sometimes it is called an auto encoder. You basically train a network to remember what it has seen. Once you have trained this network, if you give it incomplete information, um, you know, you can treat the, 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 the incomplete part of the, in, of, 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 of the data vector as XU and the complete part uh, as XK because you already have an autoencoder. Uh, you are supposed to, the error between uh, the output and the input is supposed to be as close to zero as possible. Um, then you can you can actually create a, a fitness function where uh, the missing information here is actually a, 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 a design variable and you can use any 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 optimization you can even use gradient based optimization conjugate gradient uh, stochastic gradient methods uh, to be able to solve for unknown variable but of course uh, if it is an autoencoder, it will mean that um, you already have estimated your unknown variables. You can actually combine all this without even training it upfront, where you can use EM algorithm to be able to, to estimate the missing value as well as the network weight in order to impute in missing information. And we have applied this. Uh, uh, to the HIV database in South Africa, the antenatal B database. Um, of course, uh, on the optimization side, uh, here uh, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about uh, particle sum optimization. Or you can use, uh, this is the work that I did with Adam Pantomo, Pantanovitz, um, one of my students, where we were using um, a, a random forest. Uh, to be able to do that optimization uh, problem. Uh, um, random forest is basically uh, a, an ensemble of, uh, of decision trees. Uh, and then here, uh, uh, we were uh, uh, using hybrid positive selection algorithm in order to do uh, the same problem. Now, I also wanted to talk about finance. Because one area that is uh, actually quite... Uh, being impacted by artificial intelligence is the issue of finance. How much more time do, do I still have? Uh, please, uh, I don't want to run over. How many more minutes? Colleagues, are you there? Yeah, please continue. Uh, how, how many more minutes do I still have? Uh, you have about 10 minutes more. Okay, thank you very much. So, so you can be able to use AI for credit risk, uh, portfolio optimization, financial forecasting, uh, the issue of information asymmetry, market design, insurance risk. So basically this um, uh, technique of for machine learning and any other form of AI are now being used um, in, in the financial sector. Uh, this is an example of the work that we did with my student, um, Evan Hewitt, uh, the role of artificial intelligence in, in reducing information asymmetry. Uh, Stiglitz won a Nobel Prize for, 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 for coming up with the theory of information asymmetry. Basically, information asymmetry is a situation where you have two agents. One knows more information than another, information asymmetry. Now with AI, and this is the conclusion that we reached, uh, you can actually be able to reduce the level of information asymmetry in your agents. And if these are trading agents, uh, uh, you can enhance uh, the efficiency of that trade uh, and, you know, and, and, and ultimately um, you will decrease the volume of, of, of trades, which is the negative aspect of this. This is a, another example of uh, uh, the work that we did on on uh, market efficiency and artificial intelligence, where we concluded that uh, the more artificial intelligence you put into the markets, uh, the more efficient your market become. Uh, this is an example of the work that we did with uh, on interstate conflict. Can you be able to build a machine learning system that would be able to tell if two 
countries are going to go to war or not. And it turns out that uh, we could be able to predict uh, wars between two countries to the accuracy of over 80%, which is better than what political scientists are able to do. And we wrote a book, Militarized Conflict Modeling Using Computational Intelligence. Uh, the Chinese uh, defense press uh, translated it into Mandarin. So, uh, so as you can see, uh, uh, especially in the African continent where conflicts are still something that we should be worried about, uh, uh, we should start using technology to try to solve these problems. This is an example of uh, an application in uh, detection of epilepsy from EEG signal. Uh, uh, I mean, if you are using deep learning, you don't even need to do segmentation and feature extraction. You can be able to use raw data as it is, especially if you have millions of this. Uh, but if you have limited amount of data, then you have to go back to the issue of uh, data analysis, time frequency analysis, uh, wavelengths, and so on and so forth. Something that uh, people in machine learning now are, are forgetting about the concept of uh, of uh, signal processing, uh, simply because uh, uh, deep learning uh, are able to handle this through their convolution uh, uh, characteristics. Uh, this is another example, pulmonary embolism detection. Uh, here we're using support vector machines. Uh, people have forgotten about support vector machines. Uh, they are very good at classification, especially single two class uh, classification. And we're able to detect pulmonary embolism uh, to the accuracy of almost 98%. Uh, um, uh, 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 this, uh, this is another example of the work that we did here is somebody who, who lost their voice box uh, and, 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 but they, are they can still uh, move their tongue. Uh, normally you lose because of cancer. So you put this device that we design inside the mouth and then uh, once somebody is speaking, um, um, uh, uh, the, the movement of the tongue is translated into data. The data is put into a deep learning neural network and uh, you are able to synthesize uh, the speech. Um, and you can even use uh, GANs here in order to synthesize the speech, the lost speech in the exact voice of the person that uh, you are trying to, to help. We have a US patent on this uh, and this work was uh, was actually featured uh, at MIT Technology Review uh, many, many years ago. Uh, this is another example of the work that we did here. We're using neural networks. Um, uh, we designed it to play poker game. Of course, now, you know, I mean, uh, AlphaGo is able to play uh, uh, a much more complicated version of chess, uh, Chinese chess called uh, Go. But here we, we're just, uh, designing it to play poker and uh, it will play until it is very, very well. What we, we observed uh, out of this is that it actually learns how to bluff on its own. Bluffing is very, very important uh, in the playing of, uh, of, of, of poker. And this work was featured in the New Scientist. Um, uh, was going back. And, and, and then this is uh, another work that we did. Here we were designing a system that to arrange patients when they come to uh, casualty wards and, uh, and, 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 and user input, uh, patient data, uh, queue, reinforcement learning, genetic algorithm, ultimately um, uh, 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 you, you, are, you, you actually get uh, who should be helped first, second, third, and fourth, uh, depending on, on the conditions. Without actually the much human uh, interaction is basically a genetic algorithm and reinforcement learning uh, and the data um, that is input uh, that will allow you to cue who is going to be helped when, you know. Um, so um, uh, finally, uh, closing the gap, I think as Africans, we need to invest in human capacity development. I think we need to, uh, to be teaching people in the African continent on uh, technologies of the fourth industrial revolution, blockchain. Uh, I'm glad that one of my students, uh, uh, Shakir Mohammed, uh, has uh, this, uh, uh, established the deep learning in Daba uh, that is uh, teaching machine learning throughout uh, the 33 
uh, African countries, very, very important that we need to, to build capacity. You know, we, we need to have, have more people uh, moving within our universities here at the University of Johannesburg. I would like to host some of you to come and spend some time. I've hosted Professor Fernando. Uh, yes, come and spend some time here. I would like to also welcome some of you to come and spend some time so that we can work together. Uh, I think we need to invest in artificial intelligence. Uh, the African Union uh, uh, is investing into uh, AI for them. Uh, we need to be involved. I think we need to do to, to deal with issues of data, data protection. Uh, how do we protect African data? How do we collect it? How does the African Union comes into the picture? Uh, where should we establish our own data uh, centers or should we buy clouds? How about uh, cloud computing? Uh, all those issues are very, very important. Uh, we need to incentivize our people to be able to invest in these technologies. Uh, we need to look at our laws so that they facilitate the adoption of these technologies. So thank you very much. I hope I did not take more time than and you have assigned to me. I thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much, Professor, for your insightful and very educative presentation. Professor Bawala is a professor in artificial intelligence and also the vice chancellor and principal of the University of Johannesburg. Prof, we are very grateful to you. But please do stand by after the next two presentations, we'll have some question times. Our next speaker is an invited speaker uh, in the person of Dr. Decker from the Faculty of uh, Computing, Engineering and Media of the University D. Montfort in the UK. She will make a presentation on the topic, Data Science for Sustainable Agricultural practices. Doctor, please, the floor is yours. Please, you can play a video. Sorry, please. Are you hearing? Yes, please, you can hear. Yes, Polanyi. And the voice is not coming. Uh, would you like Would you like me to present it if you are doing it now? I'm here. I'm just going yes, for a lecture. Yes, please. Yes, okay. please. Go ahead. Okay. That would be nice. Okay. So. I will just share my screen then. All right. Thank you, Doctor Ladimpu. Can you? I've stopped sharing, so you can go ahead. All right. So we will jump to the next presenter. And Let's then have. Let us speak. Ready? Uh, she'll be presenting on the topic developing a sustainable approach and strategy. No, for... Dr. Lipika, sorry, Dr. Lipika is here herself now. Okay, Let's listen. Okay. To her. Yes. Oh, Dr. Then, sorry. So please, the floor is yours. Dr. Lipika. Uh, sorry, I, I will just start. I'll just okay. share my screen. Are you able to see my screen? Yes, we can. Uh, let me just switch on my video as well. Uh, 
I'm extremely sorry for this uh, little uh, little difficulty. And uh, thank you, Bolanle, for fitting me in a little bit early. I have a lecture in around uh, 20 minutes time. So I'll, I'll just get started. Uh, so thank you for inviting me for the talk. And uh, today uh, I'll, I'll be speaking a little bit on agricultural cyber physical system, uh, primarily because the topic of the workshop is around sustainability. And I thought to fit in with that uh, since I'm working on agriculture and machine learning approaches in this area. So uh, this sort of fitted in very well. Myself, uh, Lipika, a senior lecturer, and my main uh, research interest is around the area of concurrency control techniques in, uh, say, for example, software updates or uh, file system backup. But I have been very actively working in the area of applied machine learning, especially in the area of intelligent transport systems and agriculture. And uh, let us just uh, go through this, and I'll try and keep to time as much as possible. So uh, we, the main topic that we have been discussing in this workshop or the topic is around sustainability and sustainability uh, to a lot of extent is about continuity. And within the rims of agriculture, it falls under these uh, three different pillars, society, economy, and environmental um, uh, sort of uh, uh, perspective. Within the society, it means uh, about uh, meeting today's needs uh, in a way that uh, we do not compromise the ability of future generations to meet their needs. Within economy, again, it's about uh, uh, profitability, it's about efficiency and productivity of agriculture uh, in a way that, uh, that is profitable, not only to the farmers or the, you know, the middleman, but to the entire, all the stakeholders in the entire supply chain. And then again, from the environment perspective, uh, it is about producing what we need, but in a way that that does not compromise the air quality, the soil health and ergonomics and water quality, as well as biodiversity. Now, having sort of set the scene of sustainability in the area of agriculture, uh, we cannot but uh, sort of, you know, uh, associate sustainability agriculture with the climate change both as a way of agriculture affecting climate change, as well as climate change affecting agriculture. Uh, that sort of leads me to my next uh, thing here. So agriculture can be seen both as a victim uh, of climate change. Uh, so because as climate is changing, uh, the temperature is rising, there is water logging um, and other things. That, so agriculture is getting affected. And due to the conditions that are being sort of prevailed because of uh, you know, um, um, erratic rainfall, then again, uh, due to a drought or temperature rise, uh, insects which were not uh, native to a particular area that did not affect plantations earlier, start now affecting plants. And if you see these pictures down here, I work, I have been working around tea uh, uh, for the last couple of years and hence the pictures here are on tea. So because of climate change, um, the ideal, ideal sort of the temperature, the ideal environment of tea plantations um, is sort of losing and hence there is mite infestation and other, in, uh, other diseases like the uh, leaf rust. So this is agriculture as a victim. And then again, agriculture itself is being like the culprit or the cause of climate change. Say, because uh, people want to produce more to be able to meet the needs, they're using blanket uh, use of climate uh, of uh, chemical fertilizers without really sort of checking whether the chemicals are required or not in that particular area. The natural vegetation is getting destruct, uh, destroyed uh, again because to make up land for plantations then water is being rampantly used, whether you need it or not, and that is also causing overproduction. Now, all this is sort of uh, telling us that there is a need to know where chemicals are required. There is a need to know where water is required so as to intelligently inform any farmer uh, then who can then uh, sustainably produce, and then we, cannot, uh, we don't compromise what uh, uh, what we have for the future generations. And this leads us to uh, this topic of agricultural cyber physical system. Now, uh, most of our previous speakers, and I have really enjoyed um, uh, 
you know, attending the talks, but they have gone very details into the, into the techniques um, whether it's uh, artificial neural networks or search techniques or deep learning techniques. I have sort of alluding to those here, but I will give a sort of an overall picture rather than going into um, every little uh, technical details here. So uh, what we see here to be able to sort of go towards sustainable uh, agriculture, what we have been working with, and it is getting more and more common all over the developing countries and also in the, um, uh, of course, it has been used in the developed countries from a long time, and we are now also being starting to use in the developing countries. Is this, uh, is this sort of an, uh, developing an ecosystem where, uh, where we have got sensors that senses the physical space? That means it senses the plant health, um, the soil health, the water quality, the air quality, and then the sensing the data that's being sent is then sent into the cyberspace, which is basically the space where the algorithms work, our deep learning techniques, our computer vision techniques, uh, our um, you know, big data analytics technique work there. And once this, uh, we have got this data analysis happening there, we then feed back the intelligence back to the field and say that, yes, uh, this part of the farm uh, lacks in this particular nutrient, whether it's potassium, whether it's nitrogen or, uh, you know, carbon dioxide, and hence feed it with this, uh, this variable for this amount of quantity. So we, we sort of give back the, an exact intelligence to the farmer, and then uh, they are able to uh, give more targeted uh, action. Now, I'll just go through each of these different parts and give, uh, you know, certain uh, things that are available in each of the different, that means the sensing, the cyberspace, and the actuating. Now, the entire cyber-physical system, the, uh, the, um, the physical and the cyberspace is then connected by the network in between. Now, with regards to soil sensors, there is a number of soil sensors, both in situ, as well as, you know, the ones that you test in the lab, you take a sample of the soil, and also there is a lot now available uh, via, um, you know, the uh, wireless ones, which is connected by the IoT. And so, and these, um, these sensors primarily work using the time domain reflectometry and time domain reflectometry can, uh, can check uh, soil moisture, uh, pH, as well as carbon dioxide, as well as some of the uh, essential nutrients such as nitrogen, phosphorus and potash. There is also the necessity of another important variable that is uh, uh, supercritical uh, carbon dioxide, which is measured via membrane-based sensors. So there are different types of sensors that can be placed in the soil to be able to uh, detect the different things. So data is collected in different ways. So we have got data coming from the soil sensors. The other part of data which I have been working on uh, uh, recently is the remote sensing data. So remote sensing data is basically sensing um, uh, sensing something, whether it's soil, whether it's plant, without really touching that object. So and uh, so it could be remote sensing by drones. It could be remote sensing from by sensors that are placed on tractors, or more often than not, it is remote sensing through uh, you know via the satellites. And the remote sensing uh, technology basically works by, uh, by uh, measuring the reflectance from the surface. So whether it's the soil surface or the water surface or the plant, so there's a reflectance along the entire uh, um, you know, the spectral domain uh, that's been uh, measured and then uh, that's been used to find, uh, to do uh, more intelligent uh, techniques. So through this remote sensing, we can measure soil moisture, we can do weed density, we can do crop height, uh, the phenological stages of crops as well as the nutrient level levels of the crop and like we see in this little diagram and below um, uh, depending upon the phenological stage of wheat or maize uh, there is different heights and different uh, growth rates now this then tells us here uh, it gives you the range in which uh, the reflectance is been measured or the entire spectral now uh, remote sensing is not a new thing. It's something that started around way back in the 1970s or like late 1960s. But what has changed along the years is that before uh, the measurement was only done in the visible light and a part of the um, uh, near infrared. But now we have got the entire spectrum and also very, very narrow bands we are able to measure. And because we are able to measure in narrow bands, we are able to detect 
uh, separate variables of the soil and water properly. Say, for example, potassium, uh, nitrogen, and everything because of these narrow band, um, you know, sort of um, measurements that is able to do. We are also able to, uh, you know, measure the interaction between various molecules. So we have got this entire range between thermal, the ultraviolet, and so on and so forth. Now, for example, in the, by, by measuring in the thermal infrared, uh, you know, the spectrum, we are able to measure uh, whether a plant is having stress because there is too much of evaporation. Uh, so we are being able to see whether it's been water stressed. We are able to see whether the soil has got moisture and it's primarily from this, uh, you know, the uh, thermal infrared, uh, that particular uh, part of the spectrum. Now, how do we do it? We do it by getting uh, from the different, you know, uh, uh, places, whether it's NASA, ESA, ISRO in India, and so on, who has got the satellites. Data is mainly provided by indices, like the ones that I have uh, in here. The one that is commonly used is the NDVI, or the Normalized Difference um, uh, uh, Variable Index, where we basically look at the, uh, the reflectance in the near-infrared minus the reflectance in the uh, in the visible spectrum divided by NI, NIR, the near infrared, uh, in, and the visible plus the visible spectrum. Now, what happens is that if a crop is very healthy, it's had got very high amount of chlorophyll, the, the reflectance, so most of the visible light is absorbed and the reflectance is lesser. Now, if the reflectance is lesser, the numerator in NDVI is a bigger value. So a bigger value NDVI would mean either the plant is very healthy, or in some cases, it could also mean that the plant is now uh, matured. Say, for example, when the wheat is ready to be uh, plucked, so it's more matured, So um, and then it can uh, it's ready to be harvested. So every plant, which is very, very interesting, is that when we do data science, we, we sort of try and understand that every plant, say, for example, wheat, maize, rice, they all have a very unique NDVI signature. And by detecting this NDVI signature, we are able to then differentiate, yes, this particular field has got wheat and the other particular field has got, you know, some other crops in it, or it has got buildings. Now, moving on from here, uh, again, like I said, the sensors could be anywhere because what we have realized in the projects that we have done is that one particular, uh, you know, sort of domain of sensors is not enough. Satellite on its own is not enough because it's cloud coverage. Uh, the satellite does not cover all the time. It has to go around the earth. Again, with sensors on the ground, there are other factors. Say, for example, we had a project where we fitted uh, sensors on a pole in rapeseed fields. And then, uh, you know, uh, there were some shadows and then uh, the crop grew and then the data was not very accurate. So what we need to do is then uh, take data from different sensors and then uh, fuse them to then find out more uh, intelligence there. This is basically tells us uh, how the state of the art, like I said before, using satellite data for, um, you know, for anything. For me, I'm sort of concentrating on agriculture here, but we are also using in other, other places like such as looking at air quality, uh, such as looking at water quality using sensor data. So this data was available from way back. The difference is that we have got higher resolution now. Landsat in 1972 had an 80 meter, uh, Sentinel-2 at the moment we have got 10 meters. There is higher temporal frequency before Landsat has got 18 days. Now the Sentinel comes back in five days or sometimes at different angles, they can get even lesser than five days. There are multi-purpose sensors and also hyperspectral uh, hyper uh, remote sensors as well. Now, as I was saying that we have got the, uh, you know, the physical space, we have got the sensors and then the detection. Now the data then that's collected is passed on to the cyberspace of the uh, agricultural cyber physical system via the network. Now it could be a different kinds of network. I've just given some examples where Jigbee is used, every, you know, IoT is the Wi-Fi, the Bluetooth as well. But there are different number of challenges here, research challenges that cybersecurity, there's also the physical security, the actual devices are getting stolen in many of the developing countries. And we are finding that a problem. Then, of course, the latency and then the scalability and the reliability is also an issue. 
Now in the data analysis and the decision making, so the data now has gone through the network, reached the cyberspace. Here we then now need to extract the data, clean the data, fuse the data, and then apply different kinds of techniques to the data to then be able to do uh, you know, uh, different, uh, uh, different analysis. Now the data that then goes in is uh, meteorological data, you, the soil quality data from the different sensors, the plant health, whether it's infections, whether it's stress. So another uh, kind of project that we're doing in India is with pomegranates, uh, which uh, uh, because of climate change, again, there is a lot of infection having uh, that's happening in the pomegranate, um, uh, in the leaves and the fruits. So what the farmers are doing is that they take a photo of the leaf and then send it to the database the database where um, uh, we then do the pattern, uh, the image processing, and then match it to what kind of disease that particular leaf might be having, and then send the advisory back to the farmers. So that is where uh, we have got the infections here. And then of course, uh, you know, you can test the different phenological stages, uh, and then the altitude as well as the cultivar type goes in as the input. I'll just give two examples of some projects that we have just completed. Uh, so the first one here, uh, uh, knowledge transfer um, partnership project that uh, was funded by Innovate UK and NERC, which we just completed, which we were looking at um, uh, data from the uh, MODIS satellite. Um, and then we were trying to first find out uh, fields in the United States which grew wheat. Now, to find out the fields that grew wheat, we basically had to concentrate on the NDVI signature that I just explained earlier. And then uh, we and then we use the long short term memory um, uh, network to then be able to you know, detect that these are the fields that have got wheat. We use some of the uh, manually tagged data to then train these, uh, train these networks. Once we identified that these are the fields that are wheat, we then went on to see what the monitor the crop health and also predict, um, uh, predict the value of the crop and uh, when it would be ready to harvest. The other thing that we uh, did was, uh, uh, this was a project in the, in the United Kingdom and its main purpose was to um, fuse data in the soil and the data of the satellite where you, we use Prova-V uh, satellite data at the time again it's a free a free source of data to then be able to predict the harvest uh, for a rapeseed the uh, ground sensors that we use were mainly mainly inbuilt in the university itself and then uh, we use the satellite data with it uh, to then uh, you know predict the harvest for the rapeseeds when it was ready to harvest now, all these things that I have been talking about that we have been working on, it's primarily at the adaptations to climate change. However, there's another way that we could tackle with climate change and that is through mitigation. This is not our project, it's Rainforest Alliance's project that I thought I would just give an example because this is very much very, um, uh, I think it would be very applicable to Africa and the African scenario. It's, um, it's a community-based project. It's, a, it's called the Carbon, uh, Carbon Coffee Project. It's available online. There is uh, the uh, you know, information about it. And it's in, uh, it's in the coastal areas of Mexico. So what, what has been happening there is that uh, the, the farmers um, uh, have been uh, given incentives uh, to, uh, to preserve their native forest uh, by planting trees, by um, sort of, you know, uh, providing them incentives to not cut down the trees to have their um, uh, coffee filters. Now, when they do this, and then they can now earn carbon credits in the carbon market, and the credits that they I earn know. in the carbon market then goes back into the coffee farms. I've just finished this last slide. Thank you. So, and then, uh, thank you. So that is uh, sort of very uh, briefly what I wanted to speak about, and I'm, uh, thank you so much. I just have one last slide, which gives a, a sort of uh, the, uh, the uh, satellite data that can be used in some of the different parts. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. L. Decker, for your detailed and wonderful presentation on sustainable agricultural practices as far as data science is concerned. And especially, I want to thank you for the time you've made to be with us. I know you have another program. Thank you very much. We appreciate it.
we will go on to the next speaker after which we'll enter into a session of uh, questions and answers this time will permit us so our next speaker is in the person of dr k ladipo who is of the nigerian academy of science and the presentation topic will be on developing a sustainable approach and strategies for embedding technology and innovation in science education in Nigeria's tertiary institution. Doctor, please, the floor is yours. Hello. Yeah. Yeah, please, we can hear you. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm on right now. Okay, okay. I, I nearly lost all of you there. I nearly lost all of you there. I'd like to share my screen. And uh, please, uh, uh, I need to... Uh, now, uh, yes, uh, can you see? Uh, uh, yeah, with you. Can you, can you see my screen? Yeah, yes, please. We are, but we can see you, but not your screen. Oh. Uh, I'm just wondering what I should do now. My, can I yes, yeah, just give me a minute? Yeah, open yes, your I'm presentation yes. and then uh, make sure you have a full screen. You will see share screen. Okay, what, what do I do next? Can you open your presentation, please? Yes, my presentation is open. Can you see share screen and uh, maybe enlarge your, your Zoom if it is? Not in full mood or full screen. Should I put it in full screen? Yeah. Yeah. yeah can you oh. see share screen under? Uh, let's see. Uh, oh. My my apologies. Okay. okay. Let me take this out. This is my, can you see it, please? No, please. Yeah, not seeing it. Um, please let me get some, okay, I can see share screen. Yeah, so please click on it. Can you see your approach? Is it okay now? Yes, it is. Yes, you're okay. It. I'm okay. All right. Um, thank you very much for the uh, invitation to the Nigerian Academy of Science. My name is Ken de Ladipo. Um, uh, I'm a fellow of the Nigerian Academy of Science, uh, but my original specialization is uh, uh, geology. However, I've spent, in my 45 years and more of career, I've spent nearly half of it in the industry and half in academia. As a matter of fact, I'm talking to you from um, one of the um, universities in Nigeria, University of Benin, uh, where I've come to assist them on something, uh, a process uh, for today and tomorrow. One of the things I find extremely uh, important, which we need to pay attention to as academics, uh, is how to take our research findings from the desk uh, to society in order to create more value. Um, I worked in um, I worked in uh, uh, Shell for 22 years, and I've worked in other oil and gas companies where technology. Uh, both in Nigeria and outside has played a major, major, major role. And there's a big gulf 
between what we teach and how we teach uh, as academicians and what the industry requires. Just listening to a brief part of um, uh, what the last speaker uh, presented, my, my, my worry about that, and pardon me if I'm a little bit uh, over presumptuous, is how much of this has actually gone from the desk uh, to the table, and particularly uh, how adequately prepared our young um, uh, extensional agricultural uh, professionals that we train, how much of capability do they have so that these applications can become relevant? And I'm using Nigeria as a case study or presenting the critical situations in Nigeria because that's what I'm most familiar with. But I guess say that it's probably uh, common to many other developing countries. Uh, we have a group of highly trained uh, professional um, academicians and thinkers. We need to do a little bit more, if, if not a lot more, of how to get these uh, knowledge uh, into more applied form. Especially in uh, medical sciences, they call it translational research. But I'd like to dwell a little bit more on how we can engineer that as well. Like I said, if I take Nigeria as an example, what I find here in Nigeria is that, uh, excuse me, I'll just give a bit of background. Nigeria's population is about uh, 190 million and about 66 below uh, 35 years the 170 universities that we have to accommodate uh, a group of uh, young people between the ages of uh, 16, 18, and 25, which constitutes about the one point, almost 2 million um, people that apply for university education as of 2019. And you can see from that table that it is growing and it is expected to grow as nearly uh, 50 million Nigerians progress into that age group. So that puts a lot of pressure uh, on the educational system because every young person in the world now wants to have a university degree. The same thing in the United States, for example, if you look at the statistics. And if you look at our population in Nigeria, the unemployment is really rising and it's, it's going to set to rise even more. The United, the uh, African Development Bank data suggests that the population is even going to grow to about uh, 250 million in the next uh, 30 to 40 years. And my view uh, from my thinking uh, over the last 40, 45 years, is that we not only need to bring back technological education and skills, but we also need to look at how we can infuse emerging, emerging technologies into how we train and what we train the young graduates about. Because that has a very, very major impact on developing entrepreneurship and self-employment. The statistics that the pie diagram on the left shows that uh, science uh, and technical services constitutes only about 4% to the nation's GDP. If you can expand the influence of that, just imagine what it is going to mean for agriculture, for trade, for example. Information and communication is expanding uh, over the years, but certainly that is more for social rather than technological applications uh, impact. So there is a potential uh, for that uh, as a, to in order to be able to grow our GDP. And we can see there that uh, we really need to develop a strategy. Higher education is in the heart of the UNESCO uh, uh, SDG4 goal. Um, different countries have different ways of, um, have the way of, of uh, assessing their progress. 
but you will see how relevant that is going to be. But essentially what we need to do in my own view, even my experience uh, is how do we grow science directly infused into what we teach and how we teach. These two pictures show what I call our current realities. Things are still written on the blackboard. Uh, and on the right is a picture of an anat anatomy of science an anatomy of medicine class from a university uh, recently. It's very, very alarming. How are these, how are these uh, undergraduates going to appreciate or acquire any knowledge? The challenges of uh, teaching is, are many. Funding infrastructure, opposite manpower, to even the basics of uh, uh, emerging technologies is not there. Uh, if you compare this to the uh, Western world, we are miles and miles and miles away. Data and information access is a major problem, but that is surmountable. Internet bandwidth and penetration, we've seen the impact of that, especially during the last uh, 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 lockdown. Uh, it affected a lot of developing countries and uh, the underdeveloped world, the underdeveloped world severely. I happen to have personal experience about that because my wife runs a primary school here in Nigeria. It's even difficult to get all the pupils, the parents of all the pupils, to get their children connected. Uh, for the, and they've lost about seven nine months. The impact of that, if you look at what the global assessment is, is going to take a couple of years to recover from and widening uh, and the widening gap between the West, the Western world, and the developing world. Coupled with the overwhelming demand for university education rather than uh, technical education, which in itself is lacking, um, in my own view. So therefore, we need a very, very coordinated, well-coordinated policy and implementation strategy. And we need to change the mindsets of people without forgetting information or without forgetting the uh, impact of uh, new technologies. But more importantly is that we need to look at the content. Just to show a few more examples, I've picked this from a recent workshop that uh, a Nigerian Academy uh, um, held in December 2019. And we had contributors from all over the world. So to many of you in this audience, uh, application of AI and other emerging technologies is not new. But these are just a few basic examples, uh, augmented reality, uh, Internet of Things using the smart umbrella, for example, which we need obviously in the, uh, the equatorial world, for example, where you can, you, sometimes rain can start almost immediately. Uh, the last speaker has talked about some of the new applications using satellite data uh, uh, for monitoring agricultural development. My question here will be, how do we extend all this knowledge directly? The beauty about science is that it's the outliers that should have the greater interest of academicians. And that outli those outliers, both as a geologist, you need to be able to have the basic knowledge of these emerging technologies in order for you to be able to address them and improve the algorithms of these emerging technologies and have greater application to society where it is needed. The SDG goals, I'm sure that many of you are familiar with this, but it emphasizes uh, one point, the ability to capture data, to manipulate it, and uh, therefore, you know, um, we need to have to, 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 to put in a lot of effort in order to be able to create a clearer and shared value added services 
for everybody from the student, business sector, government, partners, etc., and so on. And I think the academia, uh, and especially our young uh, scientists, need to play a When you talk about uh, a policy guided approach, the fourth generation technologies, um, artificial intelligence, uh, um, deep learning, uh, language translation, et cetera, and so on. For us to be able to do that, we need to start early to infuse this so that we can, from the basic level, we can engender awareness and create interest in the young. Where do you want to go? That picture on the right side is an example. I'll show you an expanded picture of this. This is actually from the lab where I'm located now from the University of Benin in Nigeria. And I dare say that when this was created about 10 years ago, when I was the director of the center, it was the first, let me say the second of such centers where technology rules the day. Um, in Nigeria, and I'll tell you why. So it's not just about embedding uh, the skills of uh, emerging technologies. It also has to do with our curriculum. I dare say that uh, if you look at the curriculum of science and engineering uh, in uh, institutions, my first question will be by the the time you get a graduate into the level, say third or fourth year level, how much in today's world in the industry, we need to optimize our workflows. We need to integrate our workflows. And that demands the ability to manage and manipulate data, large volumes of data, so that uh, our workflows can become better our results can become more holistic in approach. So, uh, and we need people to be able to help train uh, our graduates in doing that. Oh, I'm gonna... Excuse me, I'm sorry. Uh, don't mind me, my brain always has difficulties in the afternoon. Um, when you, I don't have to say this uh, again uh, to such experts group as this, but it's, it all has to do with developing uh, predictive scenarios and models based on rule-based inferences and systems into uh, 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 our, our methodology of capacity acquisition. There are so many types of categorizations of knowledge base, uh, knowledge types now. Uh, and you guys are perhaps the experts on that. Well, how, I think the challenge here really is changing the reasoning from, uh, to a more deductive one in how we teach uh, our uh, fundamental subjects, physics, mathematics, geosciences, et cetera, and so on perhaps far less in uh, those uh, mathematical sciences. But even agriculture, as we have seen, you need to be able to develop coding skills early. You need to be able to develop AI skills so that you can integrate, you can, you can quickly adapt a technology to fit the local setting. Rainfall patterns across Nigeria varies from south to north not to talk of across the regions. Um, I, for example, uh, sun, sunlight terms vary tremendously, but the extensional uh, uh, agricultural experts need to be able to go into the systems that he's using for his predictive model and change a few variables and adapt it to exactly the local setting. Let me give you, uh, 
an example from the oil and gas industry. When you talk about big data, you cannot have anyone more than greater in terms of data volume that is required than the oil and gas industry. In my last walk where I retired about uh, just early in quarter one this year, we deal with trillion uh, gigabyte data set just to be able to define and manage one field where we produce oil and gas. I remember going to a walk to a review and the data we got back, we had to buy two terabytes of external drive to be able to move the data. A lot of this now you can do um, virtually online, which is that figure on the extreme top extreme right. All this information needs to be archived and accessed on a regular basis. That shows you the magnitude of what we mean by big data, particularly in an example of science and engineer, engineering profession. You also need diverse skills from uh, engineers, geoscientists, uh, petroleum oil and gas uh, experts that have to work together and have to integrate their different workflows. I'm not going to bother you to go for that. But industry is always in the forefront. Uh, the likes of Baker Hughes, the likes of Schlumberger, uh, for example, and so on and so forth. And many other independents, they do a lot of background work to create uh, workflows, automated workflows for the oil and gas industry. Billions of dollars are invested in this. But one of the things that's, a, that's a, a very important about it is that they make it so adaptable for, for companies to utilize it easily uh, in their workflows. What we need to do is to follow the example of how these industries are automating their workflows. In Nigeria, for example, Shlombaji started a program which they call uh, Ocean View Competition, where they, they ask university uh, undergraduates and perhaps uh, master students to take part in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a competition where they create um, very easy to use workflows. They provide data. They provide the technology. As you see on that picture on the right, on the right, that's a class going on right here in University of Benin. That's where we want to be. We have technology that is provided and data by a company like Schlumberger, by Shell, by uh, and, and other companies are easily manipulated. They also provide the hardware and they send their uh, qualified skilled people to come and teach here. That's a very essential strategic step that we all need to adopt. I think in my view that uh, our university systems particularly need to embrace the oil and gas industry to be able to advance technological awareness skills uh, into the people that we train. And I dare say that that model is something that must work and can work across all the spheres of science and engineering. To be able to achieve that, we need a national and a global uh, policy on education. The SDG4 um, uh, policy framework needs to be driven down from government, not just at the government level, but also at the very, very lowest level of our educational institutions. That requires a lot of thinking and a lot of work. The, cor the uh, coronavirus uh, lockdown has exposed our bellies, if I may use that word, and apologies if for those who may be offended by that phrase, because a lot of us, even in tertiary institutions, could not deliver because of lack of access. A colleague of mine, for example, even said that in the UK, some of the universities provided laptops, had to provide laptops for some of their graduates, uh, some of their undergraduates, 
so that they could follow online uh, lectures. I've uh, talked about the emphasis and the need for digital knowledge so that we can automate more and more the simplest work, uh, workflows that we, workflow routines that we, we utilize and ultimately <laughs> reduce uh, the uh, delivery time for projects. If you are able to do that, you are going to lower the cost of uh, business decisions. That's very important. A lot of countries have to deal with uh, infrastructure issues, power, uh, not to talk of internet provision, etc. So, which is still a, an issue. Just uh, about 30 minutes, about an hour ago, we were carrying out some interviews online. And uh, for a few of us that were on, on that uh, interview, we had some hitches because it's located, people were located in about 10 different locations across the country. So, um, I've talked about making hardware available. It's part of that deliberate strategy that countries need to, uh, and institutions need to, fo to, to, to follow. I'm sure that this should not be a problem if universities embrace industry more uh, uh, deeply. Skills within the faculty, IT skills, uh, emerging technology, which is growing at a fantastic rate, needs to be, um, the university, the universities cannot do it alone. Because let's face it, funding that is required will come from the industry that are um, spending billions of dollars on research and technology. In the past, when I was in the oil and gas industry, we used to have this um, restriction that when you do a project, the company keeps it under wraps for a couple of years. By the time I was retiring 10 years ago, my first retirement, it had shortened to six months. Now, even industry is collaborating amongst themselves because they realize that knowledge is now ubiquitous. But the advantages of uh, uh, drawing closer to the industry is to fund our research, make it very relevant. Translation of that research to value creation becomes you know, an automatic thing. Um, you don't have to worry about patents. I know many of my colleagues who have patents, but they're just sitting down there in the library. So, um, uh, in Nigeria, government has recently created an initiative by TED Fund, uh, which is one of those agencies to drive the uh, development of the oil and gas industry. I, I hope it's going on well. But someone has, a group of people have suggested that uh, governments should uh, think about creating a digital form. Maybe that's local to Nigeria. My penultimate slide, again on the enablers, will include the policies of uh, different nations. Uh, there's no doubt about it that digital knowledge is key. We need to upscale our uh, internet systems and infrastructure. We need to move towards providing unlimited access, or at least at a very, very low stage. Cloud computing is now very, very cheap, but you need a very strong internet network to be able to move your data up into the cloud. Uh, improve our infrastructure, making hardware available, uh, and collaboration with the industry. Maybe this is more or less like a repeat slide. My apologies for that. So I may be talking to the converted in this uh, conference. However, I think we should take into serious consideration how we move uh, our research findings very, very fast and very, very collaboratively uh, into, uh, into society so that one of our major stakeholders uh, and ourselves can start to create value and provide more data, more real data, so that we can develop better models uh, that will uh, improve our efforts. 
Lastly, I'd like to thank uh, um, the Federal University of Technology at Akure. The invitation was short, but I hope, I hope that uh, I've been able to express my uh, uh, views in a nice way, not, not tending to be uh, uh, rude, if I may use that word, uh, but uh, in a nice way. Um, a lot of the information I've used here came from uh, the Academy workshop uh, that was held in December 2019. And of course, the Nigerian Academy of Science uh, for uh, uh, asking me to do this on their behalf. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Appreciate it. All right, thank you very much for your great presentation. Obviously, you've been able to do that is to your presentation. According to our program, this session was supposed to end at 12.30, but my time tells me that it's 1.33, which means we are far behind time. So we will skip the questions and answers. However, I encourage you to drop your questions at the chat box. And I'm sure when we are done with the presentations and there is time, we will have some questions and answer a session. So we'll move on to the next presenter in the person of uh, Dr. Saruni uh, from the Department of Computer Science, Sidra University of Technology, Akure, Nigeria. Uh, his presentation will be on contact tracing technologies as a viable approach for alleviating the spread of COVID-19. Dr. Saruni, please are you with me? Dr. Saruni? Yes, uh, Dr. Uh, Adizi, thanks for being there again. It's nice having you, I hope. Can you all hear me very well? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, oh, we can. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to just share my screen now as I go on with this uh, presentation. And please be reminded you have 10 minutes. Yes, I'll be very brief. Can you see my screen? We can only see your name. Okay. Not yet. Okay. Um, Okay. Please, can you see my screen now? Yes, we can. Okay. So I will be uh, speaking on this topic, contact tracing technologies as a viable approach for alleviating the spread of COVID-19. Actually, this is an ongoing research uh, led by the uh, Professor Bolanli Ojoko and then the other team members. And uh, uh, we made some progress. So I will just share this and then we look at uh, some of our output, expected outputs and then what the contribution should be. Uh, recently, we know the challenges that we've had with uh, the advent of COVID-19. And um, several technologies have been coming up to see the way of as a non-therapeutic alternative to uh, the fight of COVID-19. And, and currently, one of such is contact tracing technology because uh, most uh, countries are, are going about their contract tracing using manual method. This looking for who uh, has been infected and trying to trace the people that have you know, had contact with the person within a period of time. And uh, this has you know, a lot of limitation and has uh, uh, a lot of problem. And then also because of that, uh, a lot of other technology using contact tracing people have come up with it. And a lot of them have some issues 
uh, which we've been able to identify in the literature. So uh, because of that, uh, we are proposing a technology uh, using uh, internet of things and cloud computing technology, which is going to uh, help to solve the problem and limitation of the manual contact tracing method and also the, uh, some of the contract tracing method that are currently available. Some of them have a limited uh, range of uh, uh, usage. Uh, so we will be doing that and uh, we propose this architecture. Uh, in this architecture, there are key things I will just mention the key thing there. We'll be using a mobile device, uh, which uh, are PDAs, phones, uh, which everybody have access to. This is going to be embedded with uh, a technology that can read some vital uh, data you know, from the users, like temperature and some other key information that we able to help uh, us identify somebody that is liable to have uh, contacted COVID-19. And we'll be uh, sending this to a data repository, which we are going to be using an assemble machine learning approach to mine at a real time uh, interval. So that people that have been contacted based on the uh, data, the repository data, we can generate knowledge about who could have been contacted and who could have been infected based on the number of people that the person have, uh, have interaction with. Uh, this will help us to overcome the issue of the I mean, problem with the manner process, uh, which we have a, you know, limited uh, resources, limited personnel, and they, even the personnel are even uh, susceptible to even contact in the process of tracing who has been contacted. But this is fully technological driven, which is going to help overcome the challenges of uh, the existing system. And then we, we are looking at having uh, some of these as our outputs uh, in the near future, in the nearest future. The contrast tracing system, we, the extended capability compared to the traditional contact tracing, we reduce the number of human to uh, human contract tracer required in the epidemic. So this is a major contribution that we are looking to. You know, the number of human contract tracer will be reduced, hence making the system more efficient. Then we are looking at forecasting the spread of COVID-19 in a real-time manner. Uh, this is what I've not been able to be, I mean, achieve in any environment because uh, most time, in fact, when we even go for tests, your tests will come out maybe in a few days and things like that. But with this, the people that have such, uh, um, that are susceptible to have been affected could be traced in a real-time manner which will help in reducing the spread of the deadly disease called COVID-19. And also the data repository of, that will be generated will be uh, useful uh, through the variable devices for further research and analysis for epidemic and human mobility research. Uh, so this is just uh, the, uh, the ongoing research that we are currently on. And we believe that in the very near future, we have good results to present along with this uh, proposal. Thank you for listening. I want to, if I have any question now, I would like to entertain the questions now. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Saromi, for your short, thought-provoking presentation. And thank you for also helping us to save time. We may take questions at the end of our presentation, so please uh, do stand by. We will go on to our next presenter, uh, the person of Mr. Ugu Yai. Uh, his presentation will be on the fight against COVID-19 pandemic in Nigeria, a situational analysis of the most affected tools. Mr. Timothy, if you are there, can you please take the floor? Mr. Timothy, are you there, please? Hello? Mr. Timothy, are you there, please? Yes, I'm here. Hello? Yes. 
Okay. Hello? Yeah, we can hear you now. Okay. Yeah, we can hear you now. Good afternoon to you, sir. Good afternoon. Hello, can you, Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hello, good afternoon. Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me share my screen. Um, okay, now you can hear my screen. Okay, so can you open your presentation? Uh, Is your presentation open, please? Can you open your presentation? Yes, let me share my screen. Is your presentation open, please? Yes. I want to share my screen. How you are with me, please? Yes, we are. Sorry? I guess you know how to do that. Yes, we are. Okay. I guess you know how to do that. Yes, I'm trying to, to do it. I think it's collecting. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Yes. Uh, can you see that? It's still collecting. Yes, it has connected. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Yes, it's it has connected. Okay. Yes, we can. 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 Yes, my name is Timothy. I'm here to talk on the topic. Uh, excuse me, please. I have a little difficulty here. Yeah? Not, that has not been loaded. Okay. Yeah, it's loading here, please. Sorry. Yes, the next person can start, please. Okay. All right. Thank you. Let me do it, do it, please. Hello? Yeah. Hello, please. please. I'm with you now, please. Yes, you can. You can. Uh, Hello? Don't put on your video. Don't put on your video. Just present, please. Okay. 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 Yeah, we can. All right. You. So I'm presenting on. Yeah. Okay. The fight against COVID-19 pandemic in Nigeria. A analysis of the most affected zone. 
My name is Timothy Ogoleye. So I'm presenting from Nigeria. Hello, can you can you see my screen? No, you talk, we can hear you. Talk, talk, just talk. Okay. Okay. Wow. Please, let's allow the next speaker, please. Okay, so we'll, we'll go on to the next uh, presentation. Mr. Baba Lula. Okay. Me, please. Uh, <laughs> Hello, sorry, my baby. Nigerian government has been... <laughs> Hello? <laughs> yeah, please, please you continue. Uh, hello. Mr. Sola Babalola, can you hear me? Hello. Can anyone hear me, please? Yes, Sola is not here. Olatunji Omishore is next. Okay, so we'll move on to Olatunji. Oh, I think this time I got my Nigerian pronunciation well because I just followed you. <laughs> so uh, the presentation is on the topic uh, flexible snake-like uh, robotics control, uh, motion and tangentry planning. So Omisoro, please can you take the floor for us? Dr. Missouri. Uh, please, can you hear me? Dr. Mr. please, are you there? Do we have uh, Mr. Victor Johnson? Uh, online, uh, so let's go to the next. Yeah, Mr. Johnson, please, are you there? The next, the next, please. Maybe uh, I want to. Yeah, maybe I want to, Jacob. Please, are you there? Dr. Jacob, Bawadu. Yes, I'm there. Uh, please, uh, can we take your presentation 
okay. on modern of uh, Nigerian service providers. Okay. Low quality of service using supervised machine learning. So please, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. This one. Please, do you see my share, please? Yes, please. Okay, a very good afternoon to you all. And thank you for the opportunity to, to be here and present this uh, paper tied to Delhi of Nigerian service provider. and conclusions and introductions. You just to see the, the gains of communications, especially the telecommunication in this uh, era. I've seen the in different, how you know, employment, how education benefits. And despite the, uh, the benefit, you could have its challenges as an uh, itemized because of the technology, uh, the lapses we have. Now, back to the, our area of interest is actually the quality of service, which is not, which is about our all user satisfaction relation to the telecommunications as related to the goal, uh, to the goal and team of this topic. And what do you use to measure the quality of service in the key performance indicator? I metric we use to measure it. We have our two, uh, two broadly two, uh, two area, the voice quality of service and the uh, uh, broadband. Our interest in this presentation is that of uh, voice band or audio uh, based quality of uh, audio and technical uh, quality of service. Our interest is user based quality of service because we we'll have some uh, data to give to us. Is the quality of service actually still I mean, acceptable to the users? That's our interest. And and listen to this topic, it produces our uh, COVID-19 or the, or the pollen world. You find that we, we need uh, the, the telephone in passing information that uh, the disease. I'm probably focusing, as last uh, speaker has said, for generally even the head education. And without a, a, a good uh, telecom, even this our own visual quadrant. Find that the subscribers of the user uh, challenges challenge this uh, COVID 19 era. In this country, we have about four major uh, operators. For this research, we, we actually uh, put it as a uh, Mnet 1 to Mnet 4 there about. And we have uh, the, from the history of the view to the subscribers. Are on the increase and uh, also uh, sub services and as a complaint by the user, hence they need to evaluate the quality of service. And for the authors, as I say, some of them complain about high congestion rates. And so I think some auto may auto have worked on this area, but I don't one operator or one or two key perform uh, perform indicator. And to justify the machine learning, we will look here some of our authors like uh, Joko et al. Justified a survey on her survey about the usage of machine, uh, deep learning, uh, machine learning for deep learning data. So, generally, our aim is to, to monitor the, uh, uh, the, the provider's uh, quality of service based on global uh, metrics. The methodology, is, uh, the, uh, the, the framework is as we see in the framework in the uh, figure one. We get uh, through this uh, cross sourcing, we get our data through the cloud. However, they, and then we have to process. And we are currently using the uh, supervised, uh, main, uh, main, uh, supervised data mining to get a predictive model. Now, data collection tool, I say we use uh, I mean, cross source data. So that's original data from the, from the, from the client themselves, not secondary data. And the four key parameters we, I mean, we use are the cost of the call drop rate, congestion rate, and six, 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 six signal. About 492. 1,522 costs were made across the country for what, covering about 21 states, including the FCT. These data are processed to have about 5,157 records. 
the, the, the data, we use Baker's uh, software tool for as a data analysis tool. We use it for us learning as a SVM and uh, machine learning algorithm to me. But uh, to SVM, MLP to, to do our, for our modeling. So because of time, we just go to me. Where we, we, we jump this area and go into um and go into the uh, the result uh, uh, result. Now the result we have from our simulations for the support vector machine in terms of we have that I mean we actually we developed the model and they uh, don't want to see the performance evaluation of it. We find the accuracy of it generally 99.825 for support vector machine is so 0.9947. The data of uh, uh, MLP for Madrid and uh, excellent as we, as we classify our result. For the sake of the, for the MLP, we have the TP rate as I stated here and the precisions for the poor is one, the 100%. That model is about 0.951. And the excellence is uh, 0 0.999. Now, for the same of for SSBM classifier, classifier we do, we divide it to poor category, moderate category, excellent category, and the average as stated there in the table four, the table four. That will average for uh, precision is 0 0.9947. Now there's the summary of uh, of the of uh, of our I mean, of the model developed for each of the parameters, that is signal, congestion rate, and the processor rate and core drop rate. We now see the trend is that for me, majority fall under poor and, and uh, poor and fear the uh, categories, meaning that the result, I mean, the, the quality of, of the voice, of, of voice is not uh, that encouraging. And say, for instance, in the case of uh, receive signals, we have 24.65 as poor, 53.54 as a uh, fear. That is adding to become 27. Uh, almost 78%. That means that only 21.8% is actually a good uh, result there. Now let's go now into uh, the summary of each of these operators as we see here. The, the SVM algorithm, MLP algorithm are stated for each of these for MLP, accuracy, tip rate, and petition. From there, we're able to rank each of these uh, operators as like four second for on precision criteria uh, parameters or metrics. Now, the summary of it is that the model for service provider or audio quality of service actually using supervised learning, as I said, developed. That we could be a good platform for the supervised uh, provider, uh, which could be a good platform for determining the quality of service uh, for the service provider. Two uh, modeling that uh, I got to be used, as I said, is SVM and MP. And currently, comparative analysis of the two, you find that you find that SVM uh, proves more superior in determining uh, the quality of service better than MLP. Now, in this study, we only major on the voice quality of service. But in where the, the story we're about going into now embraces both the voice call and the brand, I mean, and the broadband uh, uh, data. And in this, uh, in this case, we go beyond just using the uh, uh, supervised, we may supervise uh, learning. We, go, we hope to use deep learning in doing, I mean, in analyzing that. So that with good quality of service, it's only when uh, the case come, uh, pandemic came like that, in communication between the world horizontal communications, and better communication it can be effective. And both the policy maker and the, uh, what, what I call the uh, users, they can easily communicate themselves. And of course, maybe with, uh, uh, with the broadband, it won't help us in our feature, um, uh, uh, feature uh, uh, visual, visual uh, um, uh, conference. Uh, uh, this is uh, the summation we have. I think we have our references and thank you for listening. All right, thank you very much for your presentation. I'm aware some of the speakers are back. So without wasting much time, we would want to go back to Mr. Timothy. Mr. Timothy, please, can you hear me? Mr. Timothy, please, can you hear me?
Mr. Timothy, please, can you hear me? Dr. Omisoro, please, are you ready? Okay, so we, we have Timothy. Timothy, please, can you hear me? Good afternoon, sir. Yeah, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yeah, I think we have yes. Okay. Now. yes. Yeah, so we are listening to your presentation on the fight against COVID-19 pandemic in Nigeria, the situational analysis of the most affected zones. Please, the floor is yours. Yes, um, uh, my screen is loading here, please. I don't know, I, I did not see it clearly. I did not see it here. Can you see it in your place there? Uh, not really. It's can you see there. my screen? Uh, not really. Uh -huh. We can see the screen, but that is showing. Yes, yes, I can, I can see it now. I am presenting on the fight against COVID-19 pandemic in Nigeria. As Yalia said, my name is Timothy Obraye. So, hello. It's not yet, yeah, it's not yeah, yet yeah, shown. Yeah. Only one, one slide is shown. Only one slide is shown here. So please, let me give it some seconds so that I can have the, the whole slides loaded. Uh -huh. It's loading, please. It's loading, please. Uh -huh. It's loading, please. OK. So you, you can yeah. begin as you close. Just a, just a minute, it's loading. Uh, yeah, it's loading, yes. Abstract. Since the appearance of the new coronavirus in Nigeria, dated 27th February 2020, Nigerian government has been collaborating with other national and national agencies to fight the medical battle created by the pandemic. Can you hear me, please? Yes, we can hear you. OK, thank you. It is. See on, on record that about 6,439 Nigerian citizens have been confirmed positive of COVID 19 as of 23 November 2020. Though many people, including the medical personnel, consider it as incurable, governments of many developed and underdeveloped nations of the world, including the international communities, are hopeful of its, of its passing someday. However, while investigating which geopolitical zone in Nigeria is most affected by the, is most affected, uh, excuse me, let me see this uh, here, sorry, yes, thank you, is most affected. The data set were sourced from NCDC webpage. NCDC means Nigerian Center for Disease and Control. This were classified according to zone. One way unbalanced analysis of variance was applied as a statistical tool to investigate whether or not the occurrence of this pandemic across the zones was equal. All calculations and graphics were performed by software engine, by hard software engines, sorry. Meanwhile, Normality and homogeneity assumption have been tested on your data set. Results shows that it's also that uh, occurrence of COVID 19 pandemic in southwestern part of Nigeria is different from other zones. With these results, governments are advised to increase the level of partnership with states in, some, in, in the southwestern part of Nigeria, as this has been empirically established. So, introduction. So, introduction. Please, it's loading. My, my internet is uh, extremely poor. Sorry about that. 
So I'm clicking the next slides, but uh, it has not yet loaded. So I tender my apology about that. So um sorry about that. So that you can by the time I talk, you can see the what I'm saying because I have a lot of graphic on my my slides. Maybe that is why it's very slow to load. I have uh, almost seven graphics. So maybe that is why it's very heavy. Please continue, continue so with please. the presentation. Continue, we can't be waiting, please. All right. However, uh, the research shows that we were able to uh, we are able to classify our data according to geopolitical zones. We had almost uh, we have uh, almost several almost at least five states in need geopolitical zones. So uh, from this, we had uh, from Niger states we have about two ninety six confirmed cases. Benue, Nazarawa, Plateau, Kogi, Kwara, and FCT, all these form uh, North Central, where well, we have six geopolitical zones in Nigeria. So uh, we try to present the graphic of uh, these data sets. We have about 296 confirmed cases from Niger as at 23rd of November 2020. We have about uh, 493 from Rivers. We have about 485. From a plateau, from Nasarawa, sorry, about 3,805 uh, from plateau. We have only five from Kogi State. That Kogi State happens to be the least throughout the whole federation, throughout the whole Nigeria. Kogi State happens to be the least affected state uh, of, of COVID 19 pandemic in Nigeria. It has only five confirmed cases. So we have about 1,093 from Kwara. And we have about uh, 6,000, probably around five from uh, FCT. From the Northeast, that is the uh, other geopolitical zone in Nigeria. Uh, Northeast comprises uh, Gombe, Bauchi, Yobe, Bono, Adamawa, and Taraba. So we have about 938 from Gombe, 753 from uh, Bauchi, uh, 94 from, uh, uh, from Yobe, 745 from Bono. 261 from Adamawa, and uh, we have 557 from uh, Taraba. So, uh, yes, I think my this thing is loading. So, I would have loved to discuss a little about uh, the introduction, but uh, the time for introduction has gone. So, uh, already I'm in uh, the result. I go so that I can, from the result, I can have. Uh, uh, so you can see my graphics. So you can see what I'm saying from uh, the graphics. So you can see the percentage. Uh, that is total graph. I mean total percentage from each zone. In North Central, we have about twelve thousand six hundred ninety-two confirmed cases, with uh, nineteen point one percent. From the Northeast, we have about two thousand and forty-eight. That is about four point four uh, percentage. From Northwest, we have about 6,361. That amounted to 9.57%. Uh, From Southeast, we have about 4,260. That amounted to 6.41. And you can see the pie chart drawn. Uh, we are from the South South. We have about 8,328. That amounted to about 12.5%. From the Southwest, uh, we have about 31,850. That amounted to about 47.9. Most, uh, the most affected uh, uh, state in Southwest uh, is Lagos State. So you can see the result is a result of uh, region by region as displayed uh, from the table and uh, the graphics, I mean the pie charts. So the results show that, uh, so that uh, the most affected uh, uh, city or state 
in uh, North Central is uh, Kogi, I mean, is uh, FCT, Federal Capital Territory Abuja, where Kogi happened to be the least affected. So you can see our results from uh, Northeast region. Uh, so Bauchi happened to be the most affected in the North region, while Yobe happened to be the uh, least affected. So you can see our result again from another region that is uh, uh, Northwest. The Northwest, uh, Karuna happened to be the most affected with about 45.8%. Why Sanfara is the least 1.46%? Uh, you can see another result, result, result from another region that is a that should be uh, southeast from another region that would be southeast. Yes, southeast. Uh, Enugu happened to be the most affected with a 31.3%, while Anambra is the least. So these were these were displayed on uh, uh, tabular form and also graphic. Uh, you can see another under under result from uh, another region that is a uh, south 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 region has about six six states. So uh, from the south south from the uh, from the south south region. We have uh, the uh, rivers, river states happen to be the most affected states, while Cross River has the least percentage. And uh, from Southwest, where that is the most affected region in Nigeria, uh, Lagos has the highest uh, number of uh, confirmed cases, with equity states uh, as the least, the least uh, number. So now, <laughs> Uh, we apply one way analysis of variance that is uh, unbalanced. And we have, we, we tested our, uh, the two basic assumptions for ANOVA uh, with Shapiro, Shapiro Wiki, our results uh, from Shapiro and also Backlet. Backlet test was used to confirm homogeneity of uh, uh, variance. Uh, and uh, the result shows that none of the assumptions was uh, violated. So, um, so we can see under the under slides. So we have under slides here, ANOVA results. The results shows that uh, zones uh, are not equally affected since the non-apothesis of equal, equality has been rejected because of the p-value that is less than uh, 0.05. And then let me really go to my conclusion. Uh, yes, the study is geared towards determining which part of Nigeria is greatly affected by the new pandemic disease. A number of data on this have been provided by NCDC on both daily and weekly basis in respect of uh, confirmed cases, death, the charge, and even uh, active cases in each state. However, through thorough statistical investigation, we are able to deduce that apart from the graphical display, Nigerian citizens in the South, most especially in Lagos, are severely affected as compared with uh, Northern region. This, this suggestion completely suggests that uh, governments at the national level, as well as other non-governmental agencies, uh, are, are strongly advised to pay more attention to this particular region in fighting COVID-19. Uh, so that is the best, that is the, uh, our conclusion in summary. And we have our references. And uh, after displaying references, that is, uh, we have uh, that is a thank you for listening to this uh, presentation. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you once again for not giving up and giving us an insightful presentation on the fight against COVID-19 pandemic in Nigeria. Thank you very much. We will move on to thank you. the next thank you. Uh, In the person of uh, Dr. Misoro, um, this presentation is on the topic a flexible snake like robotics control, motion, and planetary planning. Dr. Wisteru, please, the floor is yours.
Dr. Missouri, please, can you hear me? Please, can you hear me? 